Section 56 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. All About Coffee by William Eukers. History of Coffee and Literature, Part 5. Coffee Quips and Anecdotes. Coffee literature is full of quips and anecdotes. Probably the most famous coffee quip is that of Madame de Sevigny, who, as already told in Chapter 11, was wrongfully credited with saying, Racine and coffee will pass. It was Voltaire in his preface to Irene who thus accused the amiable letter-writer, and she, being dead, could not deny it. That Madame de Sevigny was at one time a coffee drinker is apparent from this quotation from one of her letters. The cavalier believes that coffee gives him warmth, and I, at the same time, foolish as you know me, do not take it any longer. La Roque called the beverage the king of perfumes, whose charm was enriched when vanilla was added. Emile Souvest, 1806-1854, said, Coffee keeps, so to say, the balance between bodily and spiritual nourishment. Isid Bourdon said, The discovery of coffee has enlarged the realm of illusion, and given more promise to hope. An old Bourbon proverb says, To an old man a cup of coffee is like the doorpost of an old house. It sustains and strengthens him. Jardin says that in the Antilles, instead of orange blossoms, the brides carry a spray of coffee blossoms, and when a woman remains unmarried, they say she has lost her coffee branch. We say in France that she has coiffé Sainte Catherine. Fontenelle and Voltaire have both been quoted as authors of the famous reply to the remark that coffee was a slow poison. I think it must be, for I've been drinking it for eighty-five years, and am not dead yet. In Medinger's German grammar, the slow poison bon mot is attributed to Fontenelle. It seems reasonable to give Fontenelle credit for this bon mot. Voltaire died at eighty-four. Fontenelle lived to be nearly a hundred years. Of his cheerfulness at an advanced age, an anecdote is related. In conversation one day, a lady a few years younger than Fontenelle playfully remarked, Monsieur, you and I stay here so long, methinks death has forgotten us. Hush, speak in a whisper, madame, replied Fontenelle, tant mieux. So much the better. Don't remind him of us. Flaubert, Hugo, Baudelaire, Paul de Kock, Théophile Gautier, Alfred de Musset, Zola, Coppé, Georges Sand, Guy de Maupassant, and Sarah Bernhardt all have been credited with many clever or witty sallies about coffee. Prince Talleyrand, 1754-1839, the French diplomat and wit, has given us the cleverest summing up of the ideal cup of coffee. He said it should be noir comme le diable, chaud comme l'enfer, pure comme un ange, doux comme la mort, or in English, black as the devil, hot as hell, pure as an angel, sweet as love. This quip has been wrongfully attributed to Briand Severin, Talleyrand said also, A cup of coffee lightly tempered with good milk detracts nothing from your intellect. On the contrary, your stomach is freed by it, and no longer distresses your brain. It will not hamper your mind with troubles, but give freedom to its working. Suave molecules of mocha stir up your blood without causing excessive heat. The organ of thought receives from it a feeling of sympathy. Work becomes easier, and you will sit down without distress to your principal repast, which will restore your body and afford you a calm, delicious night. Among coffee drinkers, a high place must be given to Prince Bismarck, 1815 to 1898. 
he liked coffee unadulterated while with the prussian army in france he one day entered a country inn and asked the host if he had any chicory in the house he had bismarck said well bring it to me all you have the man obeyed and handed bismarck a canister full of chicory are you sure this is all you have demanded the chancellor yes my lord every grain then said bismarck keeping the canister by him go now and make me a pot of coffee this same story has been related of francois paul jules grevy eighteen o seven to eighteen ninety one president of france eighteen seventy nine to eighteen eighty seven according to the french story grevy never took wine even at dinner he was however passionately fond of coffee to be certain of having his favorite beverage of the best quality he always when he could prepared it himself once he was invited with a friend m bethmont to a hunting party by m meunier the celebrated manufacturer of chocolate at noisiel it happened that m grevy and m bethmont lost themselves in the forest trying to find their way out they stumbled upon a little wine-house and stopped for a rest they asked for something to drink m bethmont found his wine excellent but as usual grevy would not drink he wanted coffee but he was afraid of the decoction which would be brought him he got a good cup however and this is how he managed it have you any chicory he said to the man yes sir bring me some soon the proprietor returned with a small can of chicory is that all you have asked grevy we have a little more bring me the rest when he came again with another can of chicory grevy said you have no more no sir very well now go and make me a cup of coffee as already told, Louis the Fifteenth had a great passion for coffee, which he made himself. Lenormand, the head gardener at Versailles, raised six pounds of coffee a year, which was for the exclusive use of the king. The king's fondness for coffee and for Madame du Barry gave rise to a celebrated anecdote of Louvisienne, which was accepted as true by many serious writers it is told in this fashion by merobert in a pamphlet scandalizing du barry in seventeen seventy six his majesty loves to make his own coffee and to forsake the cares of the government one day the coffee-pot was on the fire and his majesty being occupied with something else the coffee boiled over oh france take care your coffee eft le camp cried the beautiful favorite charles vatel has denied this story it is related of jean-jacques rousseau that once when he was walking in the tuileries he caught the aroma of roasting coffee turning to his companion bernardino de saint pierre he said ah that is a perfume in which i delight when they roast coffee near my house, I hasten to open the door to take in all the aroma. And such was the passion for coffee of this philosopher of Geneva, that when he died, he just missed doing it with a cup of coffee in his hand. Barthes, confidential physician of Napoleon I, drank a great deal of it freely, calling it the intellectual drink. Bonaparte himself said, strong coffee and plenty awakens me it gives me a warmth an unusual force a pain that is not without pleasure i would rather suffer than be senseless edward r emerson tells the following story of the cafe procope one day while m saint foix was seated at his usual table in this cafe an officer of the king's bodyguard entered sat down and ordered a cup of coffee with milk and a roll adding it will serve me for a dinner at this saint foix remarked aloud that a cup of coffee with milk and a roll was a confoundedly poor dinner the officer remonstrated 
St. Foy reiterated his remark, adding that nothing he could say to the contrary would convince him that it was not a confoundedly poor dinner. Thereupon a challenge was given and accepted, and the whole company present adjourned as spectators to a duel, which ended by St. Foy receiving a wound in the arm. "'That is all very well,' said the wounded combatant, "'but I call you to witness, gentlemen, "'that I am still profoundly convinced "'that a cup of coffee with milk and a roll "'is a confoundedly poor dinner.' "'At this moment the principals were arrested "'and carried before the Duc de Noailles, "'in whose presence saint Foy, "'without waiting to be questioned, said, monseigneur i had not the slightest intention of offending this gallant officer who i doubt not is an honourable man but your excellency can never prevent my asserting that a cup of coffee with milk and a roll is a confoundedly poor dinner why so it is said the duke then i am not in the wrong persisted st foin and a cup of coffee at these words magistrates, delinquents, and auditory burst into a roar of laughter, and the antagonists forthwith became warm friends. Boswell, in his Life of Johnson, tells a story of an old chevalier de Motte, of ancienne noblesse, but in low circumstances, who was in a coffee-house in Paris, where was also julien the great manufacturer at gobelin of fine tapestry so much distinguished for the figures and the colours the chevalier's carriage was very old says julien with a plebeian insolence i think sir you had better have your carriage new painted the chevalier looked at him with indignant contempt and answered well sir you may take it home and dye it all the coffee-house rejoiced at Julien's confusion. Sidney Smith, 1771-1845, to the English clergyman and humorist, once said, If you want to improve your understanding, drink coffee. It is the intellectual beverage. Our own William Dean Howells pays the beverage this tribute, this coffee intoxicates without exciting soothes you softly out of dull sobriety makes you think and talk of all the pleasant things that ever happened to you the wife of the president of the united states prefers coffee to tea afternoon guests at the white house may be refreshed if they choose by a sip of tea but while tea is on tap for callers mrs harding always has coffee for those who like herself prefer it old london coffee-house anecdotes a good-sized volume might be compiled of the many anecdotes that have been written about habitue of the london coffee-houses of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries dr samuel johnson seventeen o nine to seventeen eighty four the lexicographer was one of the most constant frequenters of the coffee-houses of his day his big awkward figure was a familiar sight as he went about attended by his satellite young james boswell who was to write about him for the delight of future generations in his marvellous life of johnson the intellectual and moral peculiarities of the man found a natural expression in the coffee-house johnson was fifty-four and boswell only twenty-three when the two first met in tom davies bookshop in covent garden the story is told by boswell with great particularity and characteristic naivete mr davies mentioned my name and respectfully introduced me to him i was much agitated and recollecting his prejudice against the scotch of which i had heard so much i said to davies don't tell him where i come from from scotland cried davies roguishly mr johnson said i i do indeed come from scotland but i cannot help it i am willing to flatter myself that i meant this as a light pleasantry to soothe and conciliate him 
and not as a humiliating abasement, at the expense of my country. But, however that might be, this speech was somewhat unlucky, for with that quickness of wit for which he was so remarkable, he seized the expression, come from Scotland, which I used, in the sense of being of that country, and if I had come away from it, or left it, he retorted, that, sir, I find is what a great many of your countrymen cannot help. Nothing daunted, however, Boswell within a week called upon Johnson in his chambers. This time the doctor urged him to tarry. Three weeks later he said to him, Come to me as often as you can. Within a fortnight thereafter Boswell was giving the great man a sketch of his own life, and Johnson was exclaiming, Give me your hand, I have taken a liking to you. When people began to ask, Who is this Scotch cur at Johnson's heels? Goldsmith replied, He is not a cur, he is only a burr. Tom Davies flung him at Johnson in sport, and he has the faculty of sticking. Thus began one of the strangest friendships, out of which developed the most delightful biography in all literature. Boswell's taste for literary adventures and Johnson's literary vagrancy met in a companionship that found much satisfaction in the bohemianism of the inns and coffee-houses of old London. Boswell thus describes the eccentric doctor's outlook on this mode of living— we dined to-day at an excellent inn at chapel house where mr johnson commented on english coffee-houses and inns remarking that the english triumphed over the french in one respect in that the french had no perfection of tavern life there is no private house said he in which people can enjoy themselves so well as at a capital tavern let there be ever so great plenty of good things, ever so much grandeur, ever so much elegance, ever so much desire, that everybody should be easy. In the nature of things it cannot be. There must always be some degree of care and anxiety. The master of the house is anxious to entertain his guests. The guests are anxious to be agreeable to him and no man but a very impudent dog indeed can as freely command what is in another man's house as if it were his own whereas at a tavern there is a general freedom from anxiety you are sure you are welcome and the more noise you make the more trouble you give the more good things you call for the welcomer you are no servants will attend you with the alacrity which waiters do, who are incited by the prospect of an immediate reward in proportion as they please. No, sir, there is nothing which has yet been contrived by men by which so much happiness is produced as by a good tavern or inn. He then repeated with great emotion Shenstone's lines, Whoe'er has travelled life's dull round, where'er his stages may have been, may sigh to think he still has found his warmest welcome at an inn. Patient delving into Johnsoniana is rewarded with many anecdotes about the mad doctor philosopher and his faithful reporter, who delighted in translating his genius to the world. Boswell was a wine-bibber, but Johnson confessed to being a hardened and shameless tea-drinker. When Boswell twigged him for abstaining from the stronger drink, the doctor replied, "'Sir, I have no objection to a man's drinking wine, if he can do it in moderation. I find myself apt to go to excess in it, and therefore, after having been for some time without it on account of illness, I thought it better not to return to it.' Another time he said of tea, What a delightful beverage must that be that pleases all palates at a time when they can take nothing else at breakfast. In his early days Johnson had David Garrick as an unwilling pupil. After the actor had become famous and his prosperity had turned his head, 
He was wont to "put the table in a roar" by mimicking the doctor's grimaces. There is a story that, on the occasion of a certain dinner party, where both were guests, Garrick indulged in a coarse jest on the great man's table manners. After the merriment had subsided, Dr. Johnson arose solemnly and said, "'Gentlemen, you must doubtless suppose from the extreme familiarity with which Mr. Garrick has thought fit to treat me that I am an acquaintance of his. But I can assure you that until I met him here I never saw him but once before, and then I paid five shillings for the sight.' A certain sycophant, thinking to curry favor with Johnson, took to laughing loud and long at everything he said. Johnson's patience at last became exhausted, and after a particularly objectionable outburst, he turned upon the boor with, "'Pray, sir, what is the matter? I hope I have not said anything which you can comprehend.' Because of his physical and mental disabilities, Dr. Johnson was not a good social animal. Nevertheless, when it pleased his humor, he could be the cavalier, for his mind overcame every impediment. It is related of him that once, when a lady who was showing him around her garden expressed her regret at being unable to bring a particular flower to perfection, he arose gallantly to the occasion by taking her hand and remarking, "'Then, madam, permit me to bring perfection to the flower.' Again, when Mrs. Siddons, the great English tragedienne, called upon him in his chambers, and the servant did not promptly bring her a chair, his quick wit made capital of the incident by the remark, "'You see, madam, wherever you go there are no seats to be had.' John Thomas Smith, in his Antiquarian Rambles in the Streets of London, 1846, tells an amusing incident in the life of Sir George Etheridge, the playwright, who, having run up a bill at Lockett's Ordinary, a coffee-house much frequented by dramatists of the period, and finding himself unable to pay, began to absent himself from the place. Mrs. Lockett thereupon sent a man to Dunn, and to threaten him with prosecution if he did not pay. Sir George sent back word that if she stirred a step in the matter, he would kiss her. On receiving this answer, the good lady, much exasperated, called for her hood and scarf, and told her husband, who interposed, that— she would see if there was any fellow alive who would have the impudence— "'Prithee, my dear, don't be so rash,' said her husband. "'There is no telling what a man may do in his passion.'" Richard Savage, the English poet and friend of Johnson, who included him in his famous Lives of the Poets, was arrested for the murder of James Sinclair, after a drunken brawl in Robinson's Coffee House in 1727. He was found guilty, but narrowly escaped the death penalty by the intercession of the Countess of Hertford. A feature of his trial was the extraordinary charge to the jury of Judge Page, who, for his hard words and his love of hanging, is damned to everlasting fame in the verse of Pope. The charge was— "'Gentlemen of the jury, you are to consider that Mr. Savage is a very great man, a much greater man than you or I, gentlemen of the jury, that he wears very fine clothes, much finer than you or I, gentlemen of the jury, that he has an abundance of money in his pocket, much more money than you or I, gentlemen of the jury. But, gentlemen of the jury, is it not a very hard case, gentlemen of the jury, that Mr. Savage should therefore kill you or me, gentlemen of the jury? Albert V. Lally has made a collection of old coffee-house anecdotes. Among them are the following. The story is told of how Sir Richard Steele, in Button's coffee-house, was once made the umpire in an amusing difference between two unnamed disputants. These two were arguing about religion, when one of them said, 
I wonder, sir, you should talk of religion, when I'll hold you five guineas you can't say the Lord's Prayer. Done, said the other, and Sir Richard Steele shall hold the stakes. The money being deposited, the gentleman began with, I believe in God, and so went right through the creed. Well, said the other, when he had finished, I didn't think he could have done it. There is another story of a famous judge, Sir Nicholas Bacon, who was importuned by a criminal to spare his life on account of kinship. How so? demanded the judge. Because my name is Hogg, and yours is Bacon, and Hogg and Bacon are so near akin that they cannot be separated. I responded the judge dryly, but you and I cannot yet be kindred, for Hogg is not bacon until it is well hanged. On another occasion a nervous barrister, pleading before this same judge, began with repeated references to his unfortunate client. Go on, sir, said the judge, so far the court is with you. Of Jonathan Swift it is related that a gentleman who had sought to persuade him to accept an invitation to dinner said, in way of special inducement, I'll send you my bill of fare. Send me rather your bill of company, retorted Swift, showing his appreciation of the truth that not that which is eaten, but those who eat, form the more important part of a good dinner. On the occasion when the dreadful Judge Jeffreys was trying Compton, Bishop of London, before the Court of High Commission, that prelate, as Campbell relates in his Lives of the Lord Chancellors, complained of having no copy of the indictment. Jeffreys replied to this excuse that all the coffee-houses had it for a penny— the case being resumed after the lapse of a week the bishop again protested that he was unprepared owing to his continued difficulty in obtaining a copy of the necessary document jeffreys was obliged once more to adjourn the case and in so doing offered this bantering apology my lord said he in telling you our commission was to be seen in every coffee-house I did not speak with any design to reflect on your lordship, as if you were a haunter of coffee-houses. I abhor the thoughts of it. As the judge had once been distinctly opposed to the party and principles which he went to such a length in supporting, so had he formerly owed something to the very institution against which his last blow was directed. Roger North relates, and Campbell repeats the story, that— after he was called to the bar he used to sit in coffee-houses and order his man to come and tell him that company attended him at his chamber at which he would huff and say let them stay a little i will come presently and thus made a show of business john timms in his clubs and club life in london has a host of anecdotes and stories of the old london coffee-houses among them the following garraway's noted coffee-house situated in change alley cornhill had a threefold celebrity tea was first sold in england here it was a place of great resort in the time of the south sea bubble and was later a place of great mercantile transactions the original proprietor was thomas garway tobacconist and coffee-man the first who retailed tea recommending it as a cure of all disorders ogilby the compiler of the britannia had his standing lottery of books at mr garway's coffee-house from April 7, 1673, till wholly drawn off, and in the Journey Through England, 1722, Garraway's, Robins, and Joe's are described as the three celebrated coffee-houses, in the first the people of quality who have business in the city, and the most considerable and wealthy citizens frequent in the second the foreign bankiers and often even foreign ministers and in the third the buyers and sellers of stock 
wines were sold at garraway's in sixteen seventy three by the candle that is by auction while an inch of candle burns in the tatler number one forty seven we read upon my coming home last night i found the very handsome present of french wine left for me as a taste of two hundred and sixteen hogshead which are to be put on sale at twenty pounds a hogshead at garraway's coffee-house in exchange alley etc the sale by candle is not however by candle light but during the day at the commencement of the sale when the auctioneer has read a description of the property and the conditions on which it is to be disposed of a piece of candle usually an inch long is lighted and he who is the last bidder at the time the light goes out is declared the purchaser swift in his ballad on the south sea scheme seventeen twenty one did not forget garraway's there is a gulf where thousands fell here all the bold adventurers came a narrow sound though deep as hell change alley is the dreadful name subscribers here by thousands float and jostle one another down each paddling in his leaky boat and here they fish for gold and drown now buried in the depths below now mounted up to heaven again they reel and stagger to and fro at their wits end like drunken men meantime secure on garway cliffs a savage race by shipwrecks fed lie waiting for the foundered skiffs and strip the bodies of the dead dr jano radcliffe who was a rash speculator in the south sea scheme was usually planted at a table at garraway's about exchange time to watch the turn of the market and here he was seated when the footman of his powerful rival dr edward hans came into garraway's and inquired by way of a puff if dr h was there dr radcliffe who was surrounded with several apothecaries and chirurgians that flocked about him cried out dr hans is not here and desired to know who wants him the fellow's reply was such a lord and such a lord but he was taken up with the dry rebuke no no friend you are mistaken the doctor wants those lords one of radcliffe's ventures was five thousand guineas upon one south sea project when he was told at garraway's that twas all lost why said he tis but going up five thousand pair of stairs more this answer says tom brown deserved a statue jonathan's coffee-house was another change alley coffee-house which is described in the tatler number thirty eight as the general mart of stock jobbers and the spectator number one tells us that he sometimes passes for a jew in the assembly of stock jobbers at jonathan's this was their rendezvous where gambling of all sorts was carried on notwithstanding a former prohibition against the assemblage of the jobbers issued by the city of london which prohibition continued unrepealed until eighteen twenty five the spectator number sixteen notices some gay frequenters of the rainbow coffee-house in fleet street i have received a letter desiring me to be very satirical upon the little muff that is now in fashion another informs me of a pair of silver garters buckled below the knee that have been lately seen at the rainbow coffee-house in fleet street mr moncrieff the dramatist used to tell that about seventeen eighty this house was kept by his grandfather alexander moncrieff when it retained its original title of the rainbow coffee-house nando's coffee-house at the east corner of inner temple lane number seventeen fleet street by some confused with groom's house number sixteen was the favourite haunt of lord thurlow before he dashed into law practice 
at this coffee-house a large attendance of professional loungers was attracted by the fame of the punch and the charms of the landlady which with the small wits were duly admired by and at the bar one evening the famous cause of douglas versus the duke of hamilton was the topic of discussion when thurlow being present it was suggested half in earnest to appoint him junior counsel which was done this employment brought him acquaintance with the duchess of queensberry who saw at once the value of a man like thurlow and recommended lord bute to secure him by a silk gown dick's coffee-house at number eight fleet street south side near temple bar was originally richard's named from richard torner or turner to whom the house was let in sixteen eighty richard's was frequented by cowper when he lived in the temple in his own account of his insanity cowper tells us at breakfast i read the newspaper and in it a letter which the further i perused it the more closely engaged my attention i cannot now recollect the purport of it but before i had finished it it appeared demonstratively true to me that it was a libel or satire upon me the author appeared to be acquainted with my purpose of self-destruction and to have written that letter on purpose to secure and hasten the execution of it my mind probably at this time began to be disordered however it was i was certainly given to a strong delusion i said within myself your cruelty shall be gratified you shall have your revenge and flinging down the paper in a fit of strong passion i rushed hastily out of the room directing my way towards the fields where i intended to find some house to die in or if not determined to poison myself in a ditch where i could meet with one sufficiently retired lloyd's coffee-house was one of the earliest establishments of its kind it is referred to in a poem printed in the year seventeen hundred called the wealthy shopkeeper or charitable christian now to lloyd's coffee-house he never fails to read the letters and attend the sales in seventeen ten steele tatler number two forty six dates from lloyd's his petition on coffee-house orators and news vendors and addison in spectator april twenty third seventeen eleven relates this droll incident about a week since there happened to me a very odd accident by reason of one of these my papers of minutes which i had accidentally dropped at lloyd's coffee house where the auctions are usually kept before i missed it there were a cluster of people who had found it and were diverting themselves with it at one end of the coffee-house it had raised so much laughter among them before i observed what they were about that i had not the courage to own it the boy of the coffee-house when they had done with it carried it about in his hand asking everybody if they had dropped a written paper but nobody challenging it he was ordered by those merry gentlemen who had before perused it to get up into the auction pulpit and read it to the whole room that if anybody would own it they might the boy accordingly mounted the pulpit and with a very audible voice read what proved to be minutes which made the whole coffee-house very merry some of them concluded it was written by a madman and others by somebody that had been taking notes out of the spectator after it was read and the boy was coming out of the pulpit the spectator reached his arm out and desired the boy to give it him which was done according this drew the whole eyes of the company upon the spectator but after casting a cursory glance over it he shook his head twice or thrice at the reading of it twisted it into a kind of match and lighted his pipe with it my profound silence says the spectator together with the steadiness of my countenance 
and the gravity of my behaviour during the whole transaction, raised a very loud laugh on all sides of me. But as I had escaped all suspicion of being the author, I was very well satisfied, and, applying myself to my pipe and the postman, took no further notice of anything that passed about me. The Smyrna coffee-house in Pall Mall was, in the reign of Queen Anne, famous for that cluster of wise heads, found sitting every evening from the left side of the fire to the door. The following announcement in the Tatler, number 78, is amusing. This is to give notice to all ingenious gentlemen in and about the cities of London and Westminster, who have a mind to be instructed in the noble sciences of music, poetry, and politics, that they repair to the Smyrna Coffee House in Pall Mall, betwixt the hours of eight and ten at night, where they may be instructed gratis, with elaborate essays, by word of mouth, on all or any of the above-mentioned arts. St. James's Coffee House was the famous Whig Coffee House from the time of Queen Anne till late in the reign of George the Third. It was the last house but one on the southwest corner of St. James Street, and is thus mentioned in Number One of the Tatler. Foreign and domestic news you will have from St. James Coffee House. It occurs also in the passage quoted previously from the Spectator. The St. James's was much frequented by Swift. Letters for him were left here. In his journal to Stella he says, I met Mr. Harley, and he asked me how long I had learnt the trick of writing to myself. He had seen your letter through the glass case at the coffee-house, and would swear it was my hand. Elliot, who kept the coffee-house, was, on occasions, placed on a friendly footing with his guests. Swift, in his journal to Stella, November 19, 1710, records an odd instance of this familiarity. This evening I christened our coffee-man Elliot's child, when the rogue had a most noble supper, and Steele and I sat amongst some scurvy company over a bowl of punch. In the first advertisement of Lady Mary Wortley Montague's town eclogues, they are stated to have been read over at the St. James's Coffee House, when they were considered by the general voice to be productions of a lady of quality. From the proximity of the house to St. James's Palace, it was much frequented by the guards, and we read of its being no uncommon circumstance to see Dr. Joseph Wharton at breakfast in the St. James Coffee House, surrounded by officers of the guards, who listened with the utmost attention and pleasure to his remarks. To show the order and regularity observed at the St. James, we may quote the following advertisement appended to the Tatler number twenty five to prevent all mistakes that may happen among gentlemen of the other end of the town who come but once a week to st james coffee-house either by miscalling the servants or requiring such things from them as are not properly within their respective provinces this is to give notice that kidney keeper of the book debts of the outlying customers and observer of those who go off without paying having resigned that employment is succeeded by john soton to whose place of enterer of messages and first coffee grinder william bird is promoted and samuel burdock comes as shoe cleaner in the room of the said bird but the St. James is more memorable as the house where originated Goldsmith's celebrated poem, Retaliation. The poet belonged to a temporary association of men of talent, some of them members of the club, who dined together occasionally here. At these dinners he was generally the last to arrive. On one occasion, when he was later than usual, a whim seized the company to write epitaphs on him as the late Dr. Goldsmith, and several were thrown off in a playful vein. 
the only one extant was written by garrick and has been preserved very probably by its pungency here lies poet goldsmith for shortness called knoll he wrote like an angel but talked like poor pole goldsmith did not relish the sarcasm especially coming from such a quarter and by way of retaliation he produced the famous poem of which cumberland has left a very interesting account but which mr foster in his life of goldsmith states to be pure romance the poem itself however with what was prefixed to it when published sufficiently explains its own origin what had formerly been abrupt and strange in goldsmith's manners had now so visibly increased as to become matter of increased sport to such as were ignorant of its cause and a proposition made at one of the dinners when he was absent to write a series of epitaphs upon him his country dialect and his awkward person was agreed to and put in practice by several of the guests the active aggressors appear to have been garrick dr bernard richard burke and caleb whiteford cumberland says he too wrote an epitaph but it was complimentary and grave and hence the grateful return he received mr forster considers garrick's epitaph to indicate the tone of all this with the rest was read to goldsmith when he next appeared at the st james coffee-house where cumberland however says he never again met his friends but the doctor was called on for retaliation says the friend who published the poem with that name and at their next meeting produced the following which i think adds one leaf to his immortal wreath retaliation says sir walter scott had the effect of placing the author on a more equal footing with his society than he had ever before assumed cumberland's account differs from the version formerly received which intimates that the epitaphs were written before goldsmith arrived whereas the pun the late dr goldsmith appears to have suggested the writing of the epitaphs in the retaliation goldsmith has not spared the characters and failings of his associates but has drawn them with satire at once pungent and good-humoured garrick is smartly chastised burke the dinner-bell of the house of commons is not let off and of all the more distinguished names of the club thompson cumberland and reynolds alone escape the lash of the satirist the former is not mentioned and the two latter are even dismissed with unqualified and affectionate applause still we quote cumberland's account of the retaliation which is very amusing from the closely circumstantial manner in which the incidents are narrated although they have so little relationship to truth it was upon a proposal started by edmund burke that a party of friends who had dined together at sir joshua reynolds and my house should meet at the st james's coffee house which accordingly took place and was repeated occasionally with much festivity and good fellowship dr bernard dean of derry a very amiable and old friend of mine dr douglas since bishop of salisbury johnson david garrick sir joshua reynolds oliver goldsmith edmund and richard burke hickey with two or three others constituted our party at one of these meetings an idea was suggested of extemporary epitaphs upon the parties present pen and ink were called for and garrick off-hand wrote an epitaph with a good deal of humour upon poor goldsmith who was the first in jest as he proved to be in reality that we committed to the grave the dean also gave him an epitaph and sir joshua illuminated the dean's verses with a sketch of his bust in pen and ink inimitably caricatured 
neither johnson nor burke wrote anything and when i perceived that oliver was rather sore and seemed to watch me with that kind of attention which indicated his expectation of something in the same kind of burlesque with theirs i thought it time to press the joke no further and wrote a few couplets at a side table which when i had finished and was called upon by the company to exhibit goldsmith with much agitation besought me to spare him and i was about to tear them when johnson wrested them out of my hand and in a loud voice read them at the table i have now lost recollection of them and in fact they were little worth remembering but as they were serious and complimentary the effect upon goldsmith was the more pleasing for being so entirely unexpected the concluding line which was the only one i can call to mind was all mourn the poet i lament the man this i recollect because he repeated it several times and seemed much gratified by it at our next meeting he produced his epitaphs and this was the last time he ever enjoyed the company of his friends Section 57 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. All About Coffee by William Eukers. The History of Coffee in Literature. Part 6 will's coffee house the predecessor of buttons and even more celebrated than that coffee house was kept by william irwin it first had the title of the red cow then of the rose and we believe is the same house alluded to in the pleasant story in the second number of the tatler supper and friends expect we at the rose dean lacaire has left this lifelike picture of his interview with the presiding genius dryden at wills i was about seventeen when i first came up to town says the dean an odd-looking boy with short rough hair and that sort of awkwardness which one always brings up at first out of the country with one however in spite of my bashfulness and appearance i used now and then to thrust myself into wills to have the pleasure of seeing the most celebrated wits of that time who then resorted thither the second time that ever i was there mr dryden was speaking of his own things as he frequently did especially of such as had been lately published if anything of mine is good says he tis macflecno and i value myself the more upon it because it is the first piece of ridicule written in heroics on hearing this i plucked up my spirits so far as to say in a voice but just loud enough to be heard that macflecno was a very fine poem but that i had not imagined it to be the first that was ever writ that way on this dryden turned short upon me as surprised at my interposing asked me how long i had been a dealer in poetry and added with a smile pray sir what is it that you did imagine to have been writ so before i named boileau's lutrin and tassoni's secchia repita which i had read and knew dryden had borrowed some strokes from each tis true said dryden i had forgot them a little after dryden went out and in going spoke to me again and desired me to come and see him the next day i was highly delighted with the invitation went to see him accordingly and was well acquainted with him after as long as he lived will's coffee-house was the open market for libels and lampoons the latter named from the established burden formerly sung to them lampone lampone camarada lampone there was a drunken fellow named julian who was a characterless frequenter of wills and sir walter scott has given this account of him and his vocation 
upon the general practice of writing lampoons and the necessity of finding some mode of dispersing them which should diffuse the scandal widely while the authors remained concealed was founded the self-erected office of julian secretary as he called himself to the muses this person attended wills the wits coffee-house as it was called and dispersed among the crowds who frequented that place of gay resort copies of the lampoons which had been privately communicated to him by their authors he is described says mr malone as a very drunken fellow and at one time was confined for a libel tom brown describes a wit and a bow set up with little or no expense a pair of red stockings and a sword knot set up one and peeping once a day in at wills and two or three second-hand sayings the other Pepys, one night, going to fetch home his wife, stopped in Covent Garden, at the great coffee-house there, as he called Wills, where he never was before. Where, he adds, Dryden, the poet, I knew at Cambridge, and all the wits of the town, and Harris, the player, and Mr. Houle of our college, and had i had time then or could at other times it will be good coming thither for there i perceive is very witty and pleasant discourse but i could not tarry and as it was late they were all ready to go away addison passed each day alike and much in the manner that dryden did dryden employed his mornings in writing dined en famille and then went to wills only he came home earlier o' nights. Pope, when very young, was impressed with such veneration for Dryden that he persuaded some friends to take him to Will's Coffee House, and was delighted that he could say that he had seen Dryden. Sir Charles Wogan, too, brought up Pope from the forest of Windsor to dress a la mode and introduce at Will's Coffee House pope afterwards described dryden as a plump man with a down look and not very conversable and sibber could tell no more but that he remembered him a decent old man arbiter of critical disputes at wills prior sings of the younger styles whom dryden pedagogues at wills most of the hostile criticism on his plays, which Dryden has noticed in his various prefaces, appear to have been made at his favorite haunt, Will's Coffee House. Dryden is generally said to have been returning from Will's to his house in Gerard Street, when he was cudgelled in Rose Street by three persons, hired for the purpose by Wilmot, Earl of Rochester, in the winter of 1679 the assault or the rose alley ambuscade certainly took place but it is not so certain that dryden was on his way from wills and he then lived in long acre not gerard street it is worthy of remark that swift was accustomed to speak disparagingly of wills as in his rhapsody on poetry be sure at wills the following day lie snug and hear what critics say and if you find the general vogue pronounces you a stupid rogue damns all your thoughts as low and little sit still and swallow down your spittle swift thought little of the frequenters of wills he used to say the worst conversation he ever heard in his life was at will's coffee-house where the wits as they were called used formally to assemble that is to say five or six men who had writ plays or at least prologues or had a share in a miscellany came thither and entertained one another with their trifling composures in so important an air as if they had been the noblest efforts of human nature or that the fate of kingdoms depended on them in the first number of the tatler poetry is promised under the article of will's coffee house the place however changed after dryden's time you used to see songs epigrams and satires in the hands of every man you met you have now only a pack of cards 
and instead of the cavils about the turn of the expression the elegance of the style and the like the learned now dispute only about the truth of the game in old times we used to sit upon a play here after it was acted but now the entertainments turned another way the spectator is sometimes seen thrusting his head into a round of politicians at wills and listening with great attention to the narratives that are made in these little circular audiences then we have as an instance of no one member of human society but that would have some little pretension for some degree in it like him who came to will's coffee-house upon the merit of having writ a posy of a ring and robin the porter who waits at will's is the best man in town for carrying a billet the fellow has a thin body swift step demure looks sufficient sense and knows the town after dryden's death in seventeen o one wills continued for about ten years to be still the wits coffee-house as we see by ned ward's account and by the journey through england in seventeen twenty two pope entered with keen relish into society and courted the correspondence of the town wits and coffee-house critics among his early friends was mr henry cromwell one of the cousinry of the protector's family he was a bachelor and spent most of his time in london he had some pretensions to scholarship and literature having translated several of ovid's elegies for tonson's miscellany with Wycherley, Gay, Dennis, the popular actors and actresses of the day, and with all the frequenters of Wills, Cromwell was familiar. He had done more than take a pinch out of Dryden's snuff-box, which was a point of high ambition and honour at Wills. He had quarrelled with him about a frail poetess, Mrs. Elizabeth Thomas, whom Dryden had christened Corina, and who was also known as Sappho gay characterized this literary and eccentric beau as honest hatless cromwell with red breeches it being his custom to carry his hat in his hand when walking with ladies what with ladies and literature rehearsals and reviews and critical attention to the quality of his coffee and brazil snuff henry cromwell's time was fully occupied in town cromwell was a dangerous acquaintance for pope at the age of sixteen or seventeen but he was a very agreeable one most of pope's letters to his friends are addressed to him at the blue hall in great wild street near drury lane and others to widow hambledon's coffee-house at the end of prince's street near drury lane london cromwell made one visit to binfield on his return to london pope wrote to him referring to the ladies in particular and to his favourite coffee wills was the great resort for the wits of dryden's time after whose death it was transferred to buttons pope describes the houses as opposite each other in russell street covent garden where addison established daniel button in a new house about seventeen twelve and his fame after the production of cato drew many of the whigs thither button had been servant to the countess of warwick the house is more correctly described as over against tom's near the middle of the south side of the street addison was the great patron of buttons but it is said that when he suffered any vexation from his countess he withdrew from button's house his chief companions before he married lady warwick were steele budgel phillips carey davenant and colonel brett he used to breakfast with one or other of them in st james place dine at taverns with them then to buttons and then to some tavern again for supper in the evening and this was the usual round of his life as pope tells us in spenser's anecdotes where pope also says 
Addison usually studied all the morning, then met his party at Buttons, dined there, and stayed five or six hours, and sometimes far into the night. I was of the company for about a year, but found it too much for me. It hurt my health, and so I quitted it. Again, there had been a coldness between me and Mr. Addison for some time, and we had not been in company together for a good while, anywhere but at Button's Coffee House, where I used to see him almost every day. Here Pope is reported to have said of Patrick the lexicographer that a dictionary-maker might know the meaning of one word, but not of two put together. Buttons was the receiving house for contributions to the Guardian, for which purpose was put up a lion's head letter-box, in imitation of the celebrated lion at Venice, as humorously announced. Thus, N.B., Mr. Ironside has, within five weeks last past, muzzled three lions, gorged five, and killed one. On Monday, next, the skin of the dead one will be hung up in terrorum at Button's Coffee House. I intend to publish once every week the roarings of the lion, and hope to make him roar so loud as to be heard over all the British nation. I have, I know not how, been drawn into tattle of myself, more majorum, almost the length of a whole guardian. I shall therefore fill up the remaining part of it with what still relates to my own person and my correspondence. Now I would have them all know that on the twentieth instant it is my intention to erect a lion's head, in imitation of those I have described in Venice, through which all the private commonwealth is said to pass. This head is to open a most wide and voracious mouth, which shall take in such letters and papers as are conveyed to me by my correspondence, it being my resolution to have a particular regard to all such matters as come to my hands through the mouth of the lion. There will be under it a box, of which the key will be in my own custody, to receive such papers as are dropped into it. Whatever the lion swallows, I shall digest for the use of the public. This head requires some time to finish, the workmen being resolved to give it several masterly touches, and to represent it as ravenous as possible. It will be set up in Button's Coffee House in Covent Garden, who is directed to show the way to the lion's head, and to instruct any young author how to convey his works into the mouth of it with safety and secrecy. I think myself obliged to acquaint the public that the lion's head, of which I advertised them about a fortnight ago, is now erected at Button's Coffee House, in Russell Street, Covent Garden, where it opens its mouth at all hours for the reception of such intelligence as shall be thrown into it. It is reckoned an excellent piece of workmanship, and was designed by a great hand, in imitation of the antique Egyptian lion, the face of it being compounded out of that of a lion and a wizard. The features are strong and well furrowed. The whiskers are admired by all that have seen them. It is planted on the western side of the coffee-house, holding its paws under the chin, upon a box, which contains everything that he swallows. He is indeed a proper emblem of knowledge and action, being all head and paws. Being obliged at present to attend a particular affair of my own, I do empower my printer, to look into the arcana of the lion, and select out of them such as may be of public utility, and Mr. Button is hereby authorized and commanded to give my said printer free ingress and egress to the lion without any hindrance, let or molestation whatsoever, until such time as he shall receive orders to the contrary and for so doing this shall be his warrant 
my lion whose jaws are at all times open to intelligence informs me that there are a few enormous weapons still in being but that they are to be met with only in gaming-houses and some of the obscure retreats of lovers in and about drury lane and covent garden this memorable lion's head was tolerably well carved through the mouth the letters were dropped into a till at buttons and beneath were inscribed these two lines from marshall servantur magnus isti cervicibus unguis non nisi delecta pescator il ferra the head was designed by hogarth and is etched in ireland's illustrations lord chesterfield is said to have once offered for the head fifty guineas from buttons it was removed to the shakespeare's head tavern under the piazza kept by a person named tomkins and in seventeen fifty one was for a short time placed in the bedford coffee-house immediately adjoining the shakespeare and there employed as a letter-box by dr john hill for his inspector in seventeen sixty nine tomkins was succeeded by his waiter campbell as proprietor of the tavern and lion's head and by him the latter was retained until november eighth eighteen o four when it was purchased by mr charles richardson of richardson's hotel for seventeen pounds ten shillings who also possessed the original sign of the shakespeare's head after mr richardson's death in eighteen twenty seven the lion's head devolved to his son of whom it was bought by the duke of bedford and deposited at woburn abbey where it still remains pope was subjected to much annoyance and insult at buttons sir samuel garth wrote to gay that everybody was pleased with pope's translation but a few at buttons to which gay adds to pope i am confirmed that at buttons your character is made very free with as to morals etc cibber in a letter to pope says when you used to pass your hours at buttons you were even there remarkable for your satirical itch of provocation scarce was there a gentleman of any pretension to wit whom your unguarded temper had not fallen upon in some biting epigram among which you once caught a pastoral tartar whose resentment that your punishment might be proportionate to the smart of your poetry had stuck up a birchen rod in the room to be ready whenever you might come within reach of it and at this rate you writ and rallied and writ on till you rhymed yourself quite out of the coffee-house the pastoral tartar was ambrose phillips who says johnson hung up a rod at buttons with which he threatened to chastise pope pope in a letter to craggs thus explains the affair mr phillips did express himself with much indignation against me one evening at buttons coffee-house as i was told saying that i was entered into a cabal with dean swift and others to write against the whig interest and in particular to undermine his own reputation and that of his friends steele and addison but mr phillips never opened his lips to my face on this or any like occasion though i was almost every night in the same room with him nor ever offered me any indecorum mr addison came to me a night or two after phillips had talked in this idle manner and assured me of his disbelief of what had been said of the friendship we should always maintain and desired i would say nothing further of it my lord halifax did me the honour to stir in this matter by speaking to several people to obviate a false aspersion which might have done me no small prejudice with one party however phillips did all he could secretly to continue to report with the hanover club and kept in his hands the subscriptions paid for me to him as secretary to that club 
the heads of it have since given him to understand that they take it ill but upon the terms i ought to be with such a man i would not ask him for this money but commissioned one of the players his equals to receive it this is the whole matter but as to the secret grounds of this malignity they will make a very pleasant history when we meet another account says that the rod was hung up at the bar of buttons and that pope avoided it by remaining at home his usual custom phillips was known for his courage and superior dexterity with the sword he afterwards became justice of the peace and used to mention pope whenever he could get a man in authority to listen to him as an enemy to the government at buttons the leading company particularly addison and steele met in large flowing flaxen wigs sir godfrey kneller too was a frequenter the master died in seventeen thirty one when in the daily advertiser october fifth appeared the following on sunday morning died after three days illness mr button who formerly kept button's coffee-house in russell street covent garden a very noted house for wits being the place where the lion produced the famous tatlers and spectators written by the late mr secretary addison and sir richard steele knight which works will transmit their names with honour to posterity among other wits who frequented buttons were swift arbuthnot savage budgel martin folks and doctors garth and armstrong in seventeen twenty hogarth mentions four drawings in indian ink of the characters at buttons coffee-house in these were sketches of arbuthnot addison pope as it is conjectured and a certain count viviani identified years afterwards by horace walpole when the drawings came under his notice they subsequently came into ireland's possession jemmy maclean or maclean the fashionable highwayman was a frequent visitor at buttons mr john taylor of the sun newspaper describes maclean as a tall showy good-looking man a mr donaldson told taylor that observing maclean paid particular attention to the barmaid of the coffee-house the daughter of the landlord he gave a hint to the father of maclean's dubious character the father cautioned the daughter against the highwayman's addresses and imprudently told her by whose advice he put her on her guard she as imprudently told maclean the next time donaldson visited the coffee-room and sitting in one of the boxes maclean entered and in a loud tone said mr donaldson i wish to spake to you in a private room mr d being unarmed and naturally afraid of being alone with such a man said in answer that as nothing could pass between them that he did not wish the whole world to know he begged leave to decline the invitation very well said maclean as he left the room we shall meet again a day or two after as mr donaldson was walking near richmond in the evening he saw maclean on horseback but fortunately at that moment a gentleman's carriage appeared in view when maclean immediately turned his horse towards the carriage and donaldson hurried into the protection of richmond as fast as he could but for the appearance of the carriage which presented better prey it is possible that maclean would have shot mr donaldson immediately maclean's father was an irish dean his brother was a calvinist minister in great esteem at the hague maclean himself had been a grocer in welbeck street but losing a wife that he loved extremely and by whom he had one little girl he quitted his business with two hundred pounds in his pockets which he soon spent and then took to the road with only one companion plunkett a journeyman apothecary 
Maclean was taken in the autumn of 1750 by selling a laced waistcoat to a pawnbroker in Monmouth Street, who happened to carry it to the very man who had just sold the lace. Maclean impeached his companion Plunkett, but was not taken. The former got into verse gray in his long story sings a sudden fit of ague shook him he stood as mute as poor mclean buttons subsequently became a private house and here mrs inchbald lodged probably after the death of her sister for whose support she practised such noble and generous self-denial mrs inchbald's income was now a hundred and seventy-two pounds a year and we are told that she now went to reside in a boarding-house where she enjoyed more of the comforts of life phillips the publisher offered her a thousand pounds for her memoirs which she declined she died in a boarding-house at kensington on the first of august eighteen twenty one leaving about six thousand pounds judiciously divided amongst her relatives her simple and parsimonious habits were very strange. Last Thursday, she writes, I finished scouring my bedroom, while a coach with a coronet and two footmen waited at my door to take me an airing. One of the most agreeable memories connected with buttons, says Lee Hunt, is that of Garth, a man whom, for the sprightliness and generosity of his nature, it is a pleasure to name he was one of the most amiable and intelligent of a most amiable and intelligent class of men the physicians it was just after queen anne's accession that swift made acquaintance with the leaders of the wits at buttons ambrose phillips refers to him as the strange clergyman whom the frequenters of the coffee-house had observed for some days he knew no one no one knew him he would lay his hat down on a table and walk up and down at a brisk pace for half an hour without speaking to any one or seeming to pay attention to anything that was going forward then he would snatch up his hat pay his money at the bar and walk off without having opened his lips the frequenters of the room had christened him the mad parson one evening as mr addison and the rest were observing him they saw him cast his eyes several times upon a gentleman in boots who seemed to be just come out of the country at last swift advanced towards this bucolic gentleman as if intending to address him they were all eager to hear what the dumb parson had to say and immediately quitted their seats to get near him swift went up to the country gentleman and in a very abrupt manner without any previous salute asked him pray sir do you know any good weather in the world after staring a little at the singularity of swift's manner and the oddity of the question the gentleman answered yes sir i thank god i remember a great deal of good weather in my time that is more, replied Swift, than I can say. I never remember any weather that was not too hot or too cold, too wet or too dry. But, however God Almighty contrives it, at the end of the year tis all very well. Sir Walter Scott gives, upon the authority of Dr. Wall of Worcester, who had it from Dr. Arbuthnot himself, the following anecdote less coarse than the version generally told swift was seated by the fire at buttons there was sand on the floor of the coffee-room and arbuthnot with a design to play upon this original figure offered him a letter which he had just been addressing saying at the same time there sand that i have got no sand answered swift but i can help you to a little gravel this he said so significantly that Arbuthnot hastily snatched back his letter to save it from the fate of the capital of Lilliput. Tom's coffee-house in Birchin Lane, Cornhill, though in the main a mercantile resort, 
acquired some celebrity from its having been frequented by Garrick, who, to keep up an interest in the city, appeared here about twice in a winter at change time, when it was the rendezvous of young merchants. Hawkins says, after all that has been said of Mr. Garrick, Envy must own that he owed his celebrity to his merit, and yet of that himself so diffident, that he practised sundry little but innocent arts to ensure the favour of the public. Yet he did more. When a rising actor complained to Mrs. Garrick that the newspapers abused him, the widow replied, you should write your own criticisms. David always did. One evening Murphy was at Tom's, when Collie Sibber was playing at whist, with an old general for his partner. As the cards were dealt to him, he took up every one in turn, and expressed his disappointment at each indifferent one. In the progress of the game he did not follow suit, and his partner said, "'What, have you not a spade, Mr. Sibber?' The latter, looking at his cards, answered, "'Oh, yes, a thousand, which drew a very peevish comment from the general. On which Sibber, who was shockingly addicted to swearing, replied, "'Don't be angry, for I can play ten times worse if I like.' Section 58 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. All About Coffee by William Eukers. The History of Coffee in Literature. Part 7. The celebrated Bedford Coffee House in Covent Garden once attracted so much attention as to have published Memoirs of the Bedford Coffee House, two editions, 1751 and 1763. It stood under the piazza in Covent Garden, in the northwest corner near the entrance to the theatre, and has long ceased to exist. In the Connoisseur, number 1, 1754, we are assured that this coffee-house is every night crowded with men of parts. Almost every one you meet is a polite scholar and a wit. Jokes and bon mot are echoed from box to box. Every branch of literature is critically examined, and the merit of every production of the press or performance of the theatres weighed and determined. And in the above-named memoirs we read that this spot has been signalized for many years as the emporium of wit, the seat of criticism, and the standard of taste. Names of those who frequented the house, Foote, Mr. Fielding, Mr. Woodward, Mr. Leone, Mr. Murphy, Mopsy, Dr. Arne, Dr. Arne was the only man in a suit of velvet in the dog days. Stacy kept the Bedford when John and Henry Fielding, Hogarth, Churchill, Woodward, Lloyd, Dr. Goldsmith, and many others met there, and held a gossiping shilling rubber club. Henry Fielding was a very smart fellow. The inspector appears to have given rise to this reign of the Bedford when there was placed here the lion from buttons which proved so serviceable to steel and once more fixed the dominion of wit in Covent Garden. The reign of wit and pleasantry did not, however, cease at the Bedford at the demise of the inspector. A race of punsters next succeeded. A particular box was allotted to this occasion, out of hearing of the lady of the bar, that the double entendres, which were sometimes very indelicate, might not offend her. The Bedford was beset with scandalous nuisances, of which the following letter, from Arthur Murphy to Garrick, April tenth, 1768, presents a pretty picture. Tiger Roach, who used to bully at the Bedford Coffee House because his name was Roach, is set up by Wilkie's friends to burlesque Luttrell and his pretensions. I own I do not know a more ridiculous circumstance. 
than to be a joint candidate with the tiger. O'Brien used to take him off very pleasantly, and perhaps you may, from his representation, have some idea of this important white. He used to sit with a half-starved look, a black patch upon his cheek, pale with the idea of murder, or with rank cowardice, a quivering lip, and a downcast eye. In that manner he used to sit at a table all alone, and his soliloquy, interrupted now and then with faint attempts to throw off a little saliva, was to the following effect. Hut! Hut! A mercer's prentice with a bagwick. Damn my soul, if I would not skiver a dozen of them like larks. Hut! Hut! I don't understand such airs. I'd cudgel em back, breast and belly, for three skips of a louse. How do you do, Pat? Hut! Hut! God's blood, Larry, I'm glad to see you. Prentices, a fine thing indeed. Hut, hut. How do you do, Dominic? Damn my soul, what's here to do? These were the meditations of this agreeable youth. From one of these reveries he started up one night when I was there, called a Mr. Bagnell out of the room, and most heroically stabbed him in the dark, the other having no weapon to defend himself with. In this career the tiger persisted, till at length a Mr. Lenard brandished a whip over his head, and stood in a menacing attitude, commanding him to ask pardon directly. The tiger shrank from the danger, and with a faint voice pronounced, "'Hut! What signifies it between you and me? Well, well, I ask your pardon. Speak louder, sir, I don't hear a word you say.' and indeed he was so very tall that it seemed as if the sound sent feebly from below could not ascend to such a height this is the hero who is to figure at brentford foote's favourite coffee-house was the bedford he was also a constant frequenter of tom's and took a lead in the club held there and already described Dr. Barrowby, the well-known newsmonger of the Bedford, and the satirical critic of the day, has left this whole-length sketch of foot. One evening, he says, he saw a young man extravagantly dressed out in a frock-suit of green and silver lace, bagwig, sword, bouquet, and point ruffles enter the room at the Bedford, and immediately join the critical circle at the upper end. Nobody recognized him, but such was the ease of his bearing, and the point of humour and remark with which he at once took up the conversation, that his presence seemed to disconcert no one, and a sort of pleased buzz of, who is he, was still going round the room unanswered, when a handsome carriage stopped at the door. He rose and quitted the room and the servants announced that his name was Foote, and that he was a young gentleman of family and fortune, a student of the inner temple, and that the carriage had called for him on its way to the assembly of a lady of fashion. Dr. Barrowby once turned the laugh against Foote at the Bedford, when he was ostentatiously showing his gold repeater, with the remark, "'Why, my watch does not go!' It soon will go, quietly remarked the doctor. Young Collins, the poet, who came to town in 1744 to seek his fortune, made his way to the Bedford, where Foote was supreme among the wits and critics. Like Foote, Collins was fond of fine clothes, and walked about with a feather in his hat, very unlike a young man who had not a single guinea he could call his own. A letter of the time tells us that Collins was an acceptable companion everywhere, and among the gentlemen who loved him for a genius may be reckoned the doctors Armstrong, Barrowby, Hill, Messrs. Quinn, Garrick, and Foote, who frequently took his opinions upon their pieces before they were seen by the public. He was particularly noticed by the geniuses who frequented the Bedford and Slaughter's coffee-houses. Ten years later, 1754, we find Foote again supreme in his critical corner at the Bedford. 
the regular frequenters of the room strove to get admitted to his party at supper and others got as near as they could to the table as the only humour flowed from foot's tongue the bedford was now in its highest repute foot and garrick often met at the bedford and many and sharp were their encounters they were the two great rivals of the day foot usually attacked and garrick who had many weak points was mostly the sufferer garrick in early life had been in the wine trade and had supplied the bedford with wine he was thus described by foot as living in durham yard with three quarts of vinegar in the cellar calling himself a wine merchant how foot must have abused the bedford wine of this period one night foot came into the bedford where garrick was seated and there gave him an account of a most wonderful actor he had just seen garrick was on the tenters of suspense and there foot kept him a full hour foot brought the attack to a close by asking garrick what he thought of mr pitt's histrionic talents when garrick glad of the release declared that if pitt had chosen the stage he might have been the first actor upon it another night garrick and foot were about to leave the bedford together when the latter in paying the bill dropped a guinea and not finding it at once said where on earth can it be gone to gone to the devil i think replied garrick who had assisted in the search well said david was foot's reply let you alone for making a guinea go further than anybody else churchill's quarrel with hogarth began at the shilling rubber club in the parlour of the bedford when hogarth used some very insulting language towards churchill who resented it in the epistle this quarrel showed more venom than wit never says walpole did two angry men of their abilities throw mud with less dexterity woodward the comedian mostly lived at the bedford was intimate with stacy the landlord and gave him his w s portrait with a mask in his hand one of the early pictures by sir joshua reynolds stacy played an excellent game at whist one morning about two o'clock one of the waiters awoke him to tell him that a nobleman had knocked him up and had desired him to call his master to play a rubber with him for one hundred guineas stacy got up dressed himself won the money and was in bed and asleep all within an hour after macklin had retired from the stage in seventeen fifty four he opened that portion of the piazza houses in covent garden afterwards known as the tavistock hotel here he fitted up a large coffee-room a theatre for oratory and other apartments to a three shilling ordinary he added a shilling lecture or school of oratory and criticism he presided at the dinner-table and carved for the company after which he played a sort of oracle of eloquence fielding has happily sketched him in his voyage to lisbon unfortunately for the fishmongers of london the dory only resides in the devonshire seas for could any of this company only convey one to the temple of luxury under the piazza where macklin the high priest daily serves up his rich offerings great would be the reward of that fishmonger in the lecture macklin undertook to make each of his audience an orator by teaching him how to speak he invited hints and discussions the novelty of the scheme attracted the curiosity of numbers and this curiosity he still further excited by a very uncommon controversy which now subsisted either in imagination or reality between him and foot who abused one another very openly squire sammy having for his purpose engaged the little theatre in the haymarket 
Besides this personal attack, various subjects were debated here in the manner of the Robin Hood Society, which filled the orator's pocket and proved his rhetoric of some value. Here is one of his combats with foot. The subject was dueling in Ireland, which Macklin had illustrated as far as the reign of Elizabeth. Foot cried, Order! He had a question to put. Well, sir, said Macklin, what have you to say on this subject? I think, sir, said Foot, this matter might be settled in a few words. What o'clock is it, sir? Macklin could not possibly see what the clock had to do with a dissertation upon dueling, but gruffly reported the hour to be half past nine. Very well, said Foot about this time of the night every gentleman in ireland that can possibly afford it is in his third bottle of claret and therefore in a fair way of getting drunk and from drunkenness proceeds quarrelling and from quarrelling dueling and so there's an end of the chapter the company were much obliged to foot for his interference the hour being considered though macklin did not relish this abridgment the success of Foote's fun upon Macklin's lectures led him to establish a summer entertainment of his own at the Haymarket. He took up Macklin's notion of applying Greek tragedy to modern subjects, and the squib was so successful that Foote cleared by it five hundred pounds in five nights, while the great Piazza coffee-room in Covent Garden was shut up, and Macklin in the Gazette as a bankrupt but when the great plan of mr macklin proved abortive when as he said in a former prologue upon a nearly similar occasion from scheming fretting famine and despair we saw to grace restored an exiled player when the town was sated with the seemingly concocted quarrel between the two theatrical geniuses macklin locked his doors all animosity was laid aside, and they came and shook hands at the Bedford. The group resumed their appearance, and with a new master, a new set of customers was seen. Tom King's Coffee House was one of the old night houses of Covent Garden Market. It was a rude shed immediately beneath the portico of St. Paul's Church, and was one well known to all gentlemen to whom beds are unknown. Fielding in one of his prologues says, What rake is ignorant of King's Coffee House? It is in the background of Hogarth's print of Morning, where the prim maiden lady walking to church is soured with seeing two fuddled beaux from King's Coffee House caressing two frail women. At the door there is a drunken row, in which swords and cudgels are the weapons. Harwood's Alumni Etonense, page 239, in the account of the boys elected from Eton to King's College, contains this entry, A.D. 1713. Thomas King, born at West Ashton in Wiltshire, went away scholar in apprehension that his fellowship would be denied him, and afterwards kept that coffee-house in covent garden which was called by his own name moll king was landlady after tom's death she was witty and her house was much frequented though it was little better than a shed nobleman and the first beau said stacy after leaving court would go to her house in full dress with swords and bags and in rich brocaded silk coats and walked and conversed with persons of every description she would serve chimney-sweepers gardeners and the market-people in common with her lords of the highest rank mr apreece a tall thin man in rich dress was her constant customer he was called cadwallader by the frequenters of malls it is not surprising that Moll was often fined for keeping a disorderly house. At length she retired from business and the pillory to Hempstead, where she lived on her ill-earned gains, but paid for a pew in church, 
and was charitable at appointed seasons, and died in peace in 1747. The Piazza Coffee House at the northeastern angle of Covent Garden Piazza appears to have originated with Macklin's, for we read in an advertisement in the Public Advisor, March 5, 1756, the great Piazza Coffee Room in Covent Garden. The piazza was much frequented by Sheridan, and here is located the well-known anecdote told of his coolness during the burning of Drury Lane Theatre in 1809. It is said that as he sat at the piazza during the fire, taking some refreshment, a friend of his, having remarked on the philosophical calmness with which he bore his misfortune, Sheridan replied, a man may surely be allowed to take a glass of wine by his own fireside. Sheridan and John Kemble often dined together at the piazza, to be handy to the theatre. During Kemble's management, Sheridan had occasion to make a complaint, which brought a nervous letter from Kemble, to which Sheridan's reply is amusing enough. Thus, he writes, that the management of a theatre is a situation capable of becoming troublesome, is information which I do not want, and a discovery which I thought you made long ago. Sheridan then treats Kemble's letter as a nervous flight, not to be noticed seriously, adding his anxiety for the interest of the theatre, and alluding to Kemble's touchiness and reserve, and thus concludes, if there is anything amiss in your mind not arising from the troublesomeness of your situation, it is childish and unmanly not to disclose it. The frankness with which I have dealt towards you entitles me to expect that you should have done so. But I have no reason to believe this to be the case, and attributing your letter to a disorder which I know ought not to be indulged, I prescribe that thou shalt keep thine appointment at the Piazza Coffee-House to-morrow at five, and, taking four bottles of claret instead of three, to which in sound health you might stint yourself, forget that you ever wrote the letter, as I shall that I ever received it. R. B. Sheridan The Piazza façade and interior were of Gothic design, when the house was demolished, in its place was built the floral hall, after the Crystal Palace model. The Chapter Coffee House was a literary place of resort in Paternoster Row, especially in connection with the Wittenagement of the last century. A very interesting account of the chapter, at a later period, 1848, is given by Mrs. Gaskell. Goldsmith frequented the chapter, and always occupied one place, which for many years after was the seat of literary honor there. There are leather tokens of the chapter coffee-house in existence. Child's Coffee House in St. Paul's Churchyard was one of the spectator's houses. Sometimes, he says, I smoke a pipe at Child's, and whilst I seem attentive to nothing but the postman, overhear the conversation of every table in the room. It was much frequented by the clergy, for the spectator, number 609, notices the mistake of a country gentleman in taking all persons in scarves for doctors of divinity, since only a scarf of the first magnitude entitles him to the appellation of doctor from his landlady and the boy at child's. Child's was the resort of Dr. Mead and other professional men of eminence. The fellows of the Royal Society came here. Whiston relates that Sir Hans Sloane, Dr. Haley, and he were once at Child's when Dr. H. asked him, W., why he was not a member of the Royal Society. Whiston answered, because they durst not choose a heretic. Upon which Dr. H. said, if Sir Hans Sloane would propose him, W., he, Dr. H., would second it, which was done accordingly. 
the propiniquity of childs to the cathedral and doctors commons made it the resort of the clergy and ecclesiastical loungers in that respect childs was superseded by the chapter in paternoster row the london coffee-house was established previous to the year seventeen thirty one for we find of it the following advertisement may seventeen thirty one whereas it is customary for coffee-houses and other public-houses to take eight shillings for a quart of arrack and six shillings for a quart of brandy or rum made into punch this is to give notice that james ashley has opened on ludgate hill the london coffee-house punch-house dorchester beer and welsh ale warehouse where the finest and best old arrack rum and french brandy is made into punch with the other of the finest ingredients viz a quart of arrack made into punch for six shillings and so in proportion to the smallest quantity which is half a quartern for fourpence half penny a quart of rum or brandy made into punch for four shillings and so in proportion to the smallest quantity which is half a quartern for fourpence half penny and gentlemen may have it as soon made as a gill of wine can be drawn the premises occupied a roman site for in eighteen hundred in the rear of the house in a bastion of the city wall was found a sepulchral monument dedicated to claudina martina by her husband a provincial roman soldier here also were found a fragment of a statue of hercules and a female head in front of the coffee-house immediately west of st martin's church stood ludgate the london coffee-house was noted for its publishers sales of stock and copyrights it was within the rules of the fleet prison and in the coffee-house were locked up for the night such juries from the old bailey sessions as could not agree upon verdicts the house was long kept by the grandfather and father of mr john leach the celebrated artist a singular incident occurred at the london coffee-house many years since mr brayley the topographer was present at a party here when mr broadhurst the famous tenor by singing a high note caused a wine-glass on the table to break the bowl being separated from the stem from the kingdom's intelligencer a weekly paper published by authority in sixteen sixty two we learn that there had just been opened a new coffee-house with the sign of the turk's head where was sold by retail the right coffee powder from four shillings to six shillings eight pence per pound that pounded in a mortar two shillings east indian berry one shilling sixpence and the right turkey berry well garbled at three shillings the ungarbled for less with directions how to use the same also chocolate at two shillings sixpence per pound the perfumed from four shillings to ten shillings also sherbets made in turkey of lemons roses and violets perfumed and tea or cha according to its goodness the house seal is morat the great gentlemen customers and acquaintances are the next new year's day invited to the sign of the great turk at this new coffee-house where coffee will be on free cost morat figures as a tyrant in dryden's aurangzebe there is a token of this house with the sultan's head in the beaufoy collection another token in the same collection is of unusual excellence probably by john reutier it has on the obverse morat ye great men did me call sultan's head reverse where e'er i came i conquered all in the field coffee tobacco sherbet tea chocolate retail in exchange ali 
the word tea says mr Byrne, occurs on no other tokens than those issued from the great turk coffee-house in exchange alley in one of its advertisements sixteen sixty two tea is from six shillings to sixty shillings a pound competition arose one constantine jennings in threadneedle street over against st christopher's church advertised that coffee chocolate sherbet and tea the right turkey berry may be had as cheap and as good of him as is anywhere to be had for money and that people may there be taught to prepare the said liquors gratis pepys in his diary tells september twenty fifth sixteen sixty nine of his sending for a cup of tea a china drink he had not before tasted henry bennett earl of arlington about sixteen sixty six introduced tea at court and in his sir charles sedley's mulberry garden we are told that he who wished to be considered a man of fashion always drank wine and water at dinner and a dish of tea afterwards these details are condensed from mr burns excellent beaufoy catalogue second edition eighteen fifty five in gerard street soho also was another turk's head coffee-house where was held a turk's head society in seventeen seventy seven we find gibbon writing to garrick at this time of year august fourteenth the society of the turk's head can no longer be addressed as a corporate body and most of the individual members are probably dispersed adam smith in scotland burke in the shades of beaconsfield fox the lord or the devil knows where the place was a kind of headquarters for the loyal association during the rebellion of seventeen forty five here was founded the literary club and a select body for the protection and encouragement of art another society of artists met in peter's court st martin's lane from the year seventeen thirty nine to seventeen sixty nine after continued squabbles which lasted for many years the principal artists met together at the turk's head where many others having joined them they petitioned the king george the third to become patron of a royal academy of art his majesty consented and the new society took a room in pall mall opposite to market lane where they remained until the king in the year seventeen seventy one granted them apartments in old somerset house the turk's head coffee-house number one forty two in the strand was a favourite supping-house with dr johnson and boswell in whose life of johnson are several entries commencing with seventeen sixty three at night mr johnson and i supped in a private room at the turk's head coffee-house in the strand i encourage this house said he for the mistress of it is a good civil woman and has not much business another entry is we concluded the day at the turk's head coffee-house very socially and august third sixteen seventy three we had our last social meeting at the turk's head coffee-house before my setting out for foreign parts the name was afterwards changed to the turk's head canada and bath coffee-house and was a well-frequented tavern and hotel at the turk's head or miles coffee-house new palace yard westminster the noted rota club met founded by harrington in sixteen fifty nine where was a large oval table with a passage in the middle for miles to deliver his coffee for many years previous to the streets of london being completely paved slaughter's coffee-house was called the coffee-house on the pavement besides being the resort of artists old slaughter's was the house of call for frenchmen st martin's lane was long one of the headquarters of the artists of the last century in the time of benjamin west says j t smith
and before the formation of the royal academy greek street st martin's lane and gerard street was their only colony old slaughter's coffee-house in st martin's lane was their grand resort in the evenings and hogarth was a constant visitor he lived at the golden head on the eastern side of leicester fields in the northern half of the sablonniere hotel the head he cut out himself from pieces of cork glued and bound together it was placed over the street door at this time young benjamin west was living in chambers in bedford street covent garden and had there set up his easel he was married in seventeen sixty five at st martin's church robiliac was often to be found at slaughter's in early life probably before he gained the patronage of sir edward walpole through finding and returning to the baronet the pocket-book of bank-notes which the young maker of monuments had picked up in vauxhall gardens sir edward to remunerate his integrity and his skill of which he showed specimens promised to patronize rubiliac through life and he faithfully performed this promise young gainsborough who spent three years amid the works of the painters in st martin's lane hayman and cipriani who were all eminently convivial were in all probability frequenters of slaughters smith tells us that quinn and hayman were inseparable friends and so convivial that they seldom parted till daylight mr cunningham relates that here in early life wilkie would enjoy a small dinner at a small cost i have been told by an old frequenter of the house that wilkie was always the last dropper in for dinner and that he was never seen to dine in the house by daylight the truth is he slaved at his art at home till the last glimpse of daylight had disappeared Hayden was accustomed, in the early days of his fitful career, to dine here with Wilkie. In his autobiography, in the year 1808, Hayden writes, This period of our lives was one of great happiness, painting all day, then dining at the old slaughter chop-house, then going to the academy until eight to fill up the evening, then going home to tea, that blessing of a studious man, talking over respective exploits what he, Wilkie, had been doing, and what I had been doing, and then frequently to relieve our minds fatigued by their eight and twelve hours' work, giving vent to the most extraordinary absurdities. Often have we made rhymes on odd names, and shouted with laughter at each new line that was added. Sometimes lazily inclined after a good dinner, we have lounged about near Drury Lane or Covent Garden, hesitating whether to go in, and often have I, knowing first that there was nothing I wished to see, assumed a virtue I did not possess and pretending moral superiority preach to wilkie on the weakness of not resisting such temptations for the sake of our art and our duty and marched him off to his studies when he was longing to see mother goose j t smith refers to old slaughters as formerly the rendezvous of pope dryden and other wits and much frequented by several eminently clever men of his day. Thither came Ware, the architect, who, when a little sickly boy, was apprenticed to a chimney-sweeper, and was seen chalking the street front of Whitehall by a gentleman who purchased the remainder of the boy's time, gave him an excellent education, then sent him to Italy, and upon his return employed him and introduced him to his friends as an architect ware was heard to tell this story while he was sitting to robiliac for his bust ware built chesterfield house and several other noble mansions and compiled a palladio in folio 
He retained the soot in his skin to the day of his death. He was very intimate with Rubiliac, who was an opposite eastern neighbor of Old Slaughter's. Another architect, Gwyn, who competed with Milne for designing and building Blackfriars Bridge, was also a frequent visitor at Old Slaughter's, as was Gravelot, who kept a drawing-school in the Strand, nearly opposite to Southampton Street. Hudson, who painted the dilettante portraits, Maardo, the mezzo-tinto scraper, and Luke Sullivan, the engraver of Hogarth's March to Finchley, also frequented Old Slaughter's. Likewise, Theodore Gardell, the portrait painter, who was executed for the murder of his landlady, and old Moser, keeper of the drawing academy in Peter's court. Parry, the Welsh harper, though totally blind, was one of the first draught players in England, and occasionally played with the frequenters of old slaughters, and here, in consequence of a bet, Rubiliac introduced Nathaniel Smith, father of John Thomas, to play at draughts with Parry. The game lasted about half an hour. Parry was much agitated, and Smith proposed to give in. But as there were bets depending, it was played out, and Smith won. This victory brought Smith numerous challenges and the dons of the barn a public-house in st martin's lane nearly opposite the church invited him to become a member but smith declined the barn for many years was frequented by all the noted players of chess and draughts and it was there that they often decided games of the first importance played between persons of the highest rank the Grecian coffee-house, Deverou Court, Strand, closed in 1843, was named from Constantine, of Threadneedle Street, the Grecian who kept it. In the Tatler announcement, all accounts of learning are to be under the title of the Grecian, and in the Tatler number 6, while other parts of the town are amused with the present actions, Marlboroughs, we generally spend the evening at this table at the grecian in inquiries into antiquity and think anything new which gives us new knowledge thus we are making a very pleasant entertainment to ourselves in putting the actions of homer's iliad into an exact journal the spectator's face was very well known at the grecian a coffee-house adjacent to the law occasionally it was the scene of learned discussion thus dr king relates that one evening two gentlemen who were constant companions were disputing here concerning the accent of a greek word this dispute was carried to such a length that the two friends thought proper to determine it with their swords for this purpose they stepped into deverou court where one of them dr king thinks his name was fitzgerald was run through the body and died on the spot the grecian was foot's morning lounge it was handy too for the young templar goldsmith and often did it echo with oliver's boisterous mirth for it had become the favorite resort of the irish and lancashire templars whom he delighted in collecting around him in entertaining with a cordial and unostentatious hospitality and in occasionally amusing with his flute or with whist neither of which he played very well here goldsmith occasionally wound up his shoemaker's holiday with supper it was at the grecian that fleetwood shepherd told this memorable story to dr tancred robinson who gave richardson permission to repeat it the earl of dorset was in little britain beating about for books to his taste there was paradise lost he was surprised with some passages he struck upon dipping here and there and bought it the bookseller begged him to speak in his favour if he liked it for they lay on his hands as waste paper 
Shepherd was present. My lord took it home, read it, and sent it to Dryden, who in a short time returned it. This man, says Dryden, cuts us all out, and the ancients too. George's Coffee House, number 213, Strand, near Temple Bar, was a noted resort in the 18th and 19th centuries. When it was a coffee house, one day there came in Sir James Lowther, who, after changing a piece of silver with the coffee woman, and paying two pence for his dish of coffee, was helped into his chariot, for he was very lame and infirm, and went home. Some little time afterwards he returned to the same coffee house on purpose to acquaint the woman who kept it that she had given him a bad half penny and demanded another in exchange for it. Sir James had about forty thousand pounds per annum. Shenstone, who found the warmest welcome at an inn, found George's to be economical what do you think he writes must be my expense who love to pry into everything of the kind why truly one shilling my company goes to george's coffee-house where for that small subscription i read all pamphlets under a three shillings dimension and indeed any larger would not be fit for coffee-house perusal shenstone relates that lord oxford was at george's when the mob that were carrying his lordship in effigy came into the box where he was to beg money of him amongst others this story horace walpole contradicts adding that he supposes shenstone thought that after lord oxford quitted his place he went to the coffee-house to learn news Arthur Murphy frequented George's, where the town wits met every evening. Lloyd, the law student, sings, By law let others toil to gain renown. Florio's a gentleman, a man of the town. He, nor court's clients, or the law regarding, hurries from Nando's down to Covent Garden. Yet he's a scholar, mark him in the pit, with critic catcall sounds the stops of wit supreme at george's he harangues the throng censor of style from tragedy to song the percy coffee house rathbone place oxford street no longer exists but it will be kept in recollection for its having given name to one of the most popular publications of its class namely the percy anecdotes by sholto and reuben percy brothers of the benedictine monastery of mont in forty-four parts commencing in eighteen twenty so said the title pages but the names and the locality were supposé reuben percy was thomas byerley who died in eighteen twenty four he was the brother of sir john byerley and the first editor of the mirror commenced by john limbert in eighteen twenty two sholto percy was joseph clinton robertson who died in eighteen fifty two he was the projector of the mechanics magazine which he edited from its commencement to his death the name of the collection of anecdotes was not taken, as at the time supposed, from the popularity of the Percy Relique, but from the Percy Coffee House, where Byerley and Robertson were accustomed to meet, to talk over their joint work. The idea was, however, claimed by Sir Richard Phillips, who stoutly maintained that it originated in a suggestion made by him to dr tulloch and mr maine to cut the anecdotes from the many years files of the star newspaper of which dr tulloch was the editor and mr byerley assistant editor and to the latter overhearing the suggestion sir richard contested might the percy anecdotes be traced they were very successful, and a large sum was realized by the work. P. 
Peel's Coffee House, numbers 177 and 178 Fleet Street, east corner of Fetter Lane, was one of the coffee houses of the Johnsonian period, and here was long preserved a portrait of Dr. Johnson, on the keystone of a chimney-piece, stated to have been painted by Sir Joshua Reynolds. Peel's was noted for files of newspapers from these dates, Gazette, 1759, Times, 1780, Morning Chronicle, 1773, Morning Post, 1773, Morning Herald, 1784, Morning Advertiser, 1794, and the evening papers from their commencement. The house is now a tavern. Coffee Literature and Ideals the bibliography at the end of this work will serve to indicate the nature and extent of the general literature of coffee. Not that it is complete or nearly so. It would require twice the space to include mention of all the fugitive bits of verse, essays, and miscellaneous writings in newspapers and periodicals dealing with the poetry and romance, history, chemistry, and physiological effects of coffee. Only the early works and the more notable contributions of the last three centuries are included in the bibliography but there is sufficient to enable the student to analyze the lines of general progress a study of the literature of coffee shows that the french really internationalized the beverage the english and italians followed with the advent of the newspaper press coffee literature began to suffer from its competition the complexities of modern life suggest that coffee drinking in perfection, the aesthetics, and a new literature of coffee may once more become the pleasure of a small caste. Are the real pleasures of life, the things truly worth while, only to the swift, the most efficient? Who shall say? are not some of us particularly in america rather prone to glorify the gospel of work to such an extent that we are in danger of losing the ability to understand or to enjoy anything else granted that this is so coffee already recognized as the most grateful lubricant known to the human machine is destined to play another part of increasing importance in our national life as a kind of national shock absorber as well. But its role is something more than this, surely. When life is drab, it takes away its grayness. When life is sad, it brings us solace. When life is dull, it brings us new inspiration." When we are aweary, it brings us comfort and good cheer. The lure of coffee lies in its appeal to our finer sensibilities, and signs are not wanting that this pursuit of the long sweet happiness that everyone is seeking will lead some of us, even in big bustling America, into footpaths that end in places where coffee will offer much of its pristine inspiration and charm it probably will not be a coffee-house anything like that of the long ago but perhaps it will be a kind of modernized coffee club why not section fifty nine of all about coffee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. All About Coffee by William Euchers. Coffee in Relation to the Fine Arts. Part 1. How coffee and coffee drinking have been celebrated in painting, engraving, sculpture, caricature, lithography, and music. Epics, rhapsodies, and cantatas in praise of coffee beautiful specimens of the art of the potter and the silversmith as shown in the coffee service of various periods in the world's history some historical relics coffee has inspired the imagination of many poets 
musicians and painters in seventeenth and eighteenth centuries those whose genius was dedicated to the fine arts seem to have fallen under its spell and to have produced much of great beauty that has endured to the painters engravers and caricaturists of that period we are particularly indebted for pictures that have added greatly to our knowledge of early coffee customs and manners adrian van ostad sixteen ten to sixteen eighty five the dutch genre painter and etcher pupil of franz hals in his dutch coffee house sixteen fifty shows the genesis of the coffee house of western europe about the time it still partook of some of the tavern characteristics coffee is being served to a group in the foreground it is believed to be the oldest existing picture of a coffee house the illustration is after the etching by j Beauvarlet in the graphic collection at munich william hogarth sixteen ninety seven to seventeen sixty four the famous english painter and engraver of satirical subjects chose the coffee houses of his time for the scenes of a number of his social caricatures in his series four times of the day which throws a vivid light on the street life of london of the period of seventeen thirty eight we are shown covent garden at seven fifty five a m by the clock on st paul's church a prim maiden lady said to have been sketched from an elderly relation of the artist who cut him out of her will on her way home from early service accompanied by a shivering footboy is scandalized by the spectacle presented by some roistering blades issuing from tom king's notorious coffee-house to the right the beaux are forcing their attentions upon the more comely of the market women in the foreground tom king was a scholar at eton before he began his ignoble career at the date of this picture it is thought he had been succeeded by his widow moll king also of scandalous repute scene six of the rake's progress by hogarth is laid at the club in white's chocolate coffee-house which dr swift described as the common rendezvous of infamous sharpers and noble cullies the rake has lost all his recently acquired wealth pulls off his wig and flings himself upon the floor in a paroxysm of fury and execration in allusion to the burning of whites in seventeen thirty three flames are seen bursting from the wainscot but the preoccupied gamblers take no heed even of the watchman crying fire to the left is seated a highwayman with horse pistol and black mask in a skirt pocket of his coat he is so engrossed in his thoughts that he does not notice the boy at his side offering a glass of liquor on a tray the scene well depicts the low estate to which whites had fallen it recalls a bit of dialogue from farquhar's beau stratagem act three scene two where aimwell says to gibet who is a highwayman pray sir hand i seen your face at will's coffee-house yes sir and at white's too answers the highwayman after the fire the club and chocolate house were removed to gaunt's coffee-house the removal was thus announced in the daily post of may third this is to acquaint all noblemen and gentlemen that mr arthur having had the misfortune to be burnt out of white's chocolate house is removed to gaunt's coffee house next the st james coffee house in st james street where he humbly begs they will favor him with their company as usual alessandro longhi seventeen thirty three to eighteen thirteen the italian painter and engraver called the venetian hogarth in one of his pictures presenting life and manners in venice during the years of her decadence shows goldoni the dramatist as a visitor in a cafe of the period with a female mendicant soliciting alms in the louvre at paris hangs the petit dejeuner by francois boucher seventeen o three to seventeen seventy famous court painter of louis the fifteenth it shows a french breakfast room of the period of seventeen forty four and is interesting because it illustrates the introduction of coffee into the home it shows also the coffee service of the time in van loo's portrait of madame de pompadour second mistress and political adviser of louis the fifteenth of france the coffee service of a later period of the eighteenth century appears the nubian servant is shown offering the marquise a demi-tasse which has just been poured from the covered oriental pot which succeeded the original 
arabian turkish boiler and was much in vogue at the time coffee and madame du barry or would it be more polite to say madame du barry and coffee inspired the celebrated painting of madame de pompadour's successor in the affections of louis the well-beloved this is entitled madame du barry at versailles and in the versailles catalogue it is described as painted by de Cruz after Drouet. de Cruz was a pupil of Gros and painted many of the historical portraits at versailles malcolm c salomon in his french color prints of the eighteenth century referring to dagoti's print of this picture done in seventeen seventy one says the original has been attributed to francois hubert drouet but there can be little doubt that the original portraiture was from the hand of the engraver dagoti as the style is far inferior to drouet he thus describes it here we see the last of louis the fifteenth's mistresses sitting in her bedroom in that alluring retreat of hers at louve sienne near the woods of marley as she takes her cup of coffee from her pet attendant the little negro boy zamour as the prince de conti had named him all brave in red and gold doubtless she is expecting the morning visit of the king no longer the handsome young gallant but old and leaden-eyed and puffy-cheeked and perhaps it will be on this very morning that she will wheedle louis in a moment of extravagant badinage into appointing the negro boy to be governor of the chateau and pavilion of louvesienne at a handsome salary just as on another day she playfully teased the jaded old sensualist into decorating with the cordon bleu her cuisiniere when it was triumphantly revealed to him that the dinner he had been praising with enthusiastic gusto was after all the work of a woman cook the very possibility of which he had contemptuously doubted but as we look at these two the royal mistress and her little black favorite we forget the well-beloved and his voluptuous pleasures and indulgences for in the shadows we see another picture some twenty years on when the proud unconscionable beauty no longer reine de la main gauche stands before the dreaded tribunal of the terror while zamore the treacherous ungrateful negro dismissed from his service at louve sienne and now devoted to the committee of public safety and one of her implacable accusers sends her shrieking to the guillotine the introduction of the coffee-house into europe was memorialized by franz Schams, the genre painter pupil of the vienna academy in a beautiful picture entitled the first coffee-house in vienna sixteen eighty four owned by the austrian art society a lithographic reproduction was executed by the artist and printed by joseph stoofs in vienna there are several specimens in the united states and the illustration printed on page forty eight has been made from one of these in the possession of the author the picture shows the interior of the blue bottle where kolschitsky opened the first coffee house in vienna the hero proprietor stands in the foreground pouring a cup of the beverage from an oriental coffee pot and another is suspended from the coffee house sign that hangs over the fireplace in the fire alcove a woman is pounding coffee in a mortar men and women in the costumes of the period are being served coffee by a vienna madchen the painters mariolat de camp and de tournemine have pictured cafe scenes the first in his cafe sur une route de syrie which was shown at the salon of eighteen forty four the second of his cafe turk which figured at the exposition of eighteen fifty five and the third in his cafe en asia mineure which received honors at the salon of eighteen fifty nine and attracted attention at the universal exposition of eighteen sixty seven a decorative panel designed for the buffet at the paris opera house by s mazerolle was shown at the exposition of eighteen seventy eight a french artist jaconde has painted two charming compositions one representing the reading room and the other the interior of a cafe many german artists have shown coffee manners and customs in pictures that are now hanging in well-known european galleries among others mention should be made of c schmidt's 
the sweets shop of josti in berlin eighteen forty five mild's pastor rautenberg and his family at the coffee table eighteen thirty three and his manager Klassen and his family at the afternoon coffee table eighteen forty adolf menzel's parisian boulevard cafe eighteen seventy hugo meith's saturday afternoon at the coffee table john phillips old woman with coffee cup friedrich walls afternoon coffee in the court gardens at munich paul meyerheim's oriental coffee house and peter philippi's dusseldorf coffee be such at the exposition des beaux-arts salon of 1881 there was shown p a ruffio's picture le cafe vient au secours de la muse coffee comes to the aid of the muse in which the graceful form of an oriental ewer appears the coffee house at cairo a canvas by jean leon jerome 1824 to 1904 that hangs in the metropolitan museum of art new york has been much admired it shows the interior of a typical oriental coffee house with two men near a furnace at the left preparing the beverage a man seated on a wicker basket about to smoke a hookah a dervish dancing and several persons seated against the wall in the background the new york historical society acquired in 1907 from miss margaret a ingram an oil painting of the tontine coffee house it was painted in philadelphia by francis guy and was sold at a raffle after having been admired by president john adams it shows lower wall street in 1796 to 1800 with the tontine coffee house on the northwest corner of wall and water streets where its more famous predecessor the merchant's coffee house was located before it moved to quarters diagonally opposite charles p groups born eighteen sixty painting showing general washington's official welcome to new york by city and state officials at the merchant's coffee house april twenty third seventeen eighty nine just one week before his inauguration as first president of the united states is a colorful canvas that has been much praised for its atmosphere and historical associations it is the property of the author the art museums and libraries of every country contain many beautiful watercolors engravings prints drawings and lithographs whose creators found inspiration in coffee space permits the mention of only a few t h shepherd has preserved for us buttons afterward the caledonian coffee house great russell street covent garden in a watercolor drawing of eighteen fifty seven tom's coffee house seventeen great russell street covent garden eighteen fifty seven slaughter's coffee house in st martin's lane eighteen forty one also in eighteen fifty seven the lion's head at buttons put up by addison and now the property of the duke of bedford at woburn hogarth figures in the sam ireland collection with several original drawings of frequenters of buttons in seventeen thirty thomas rolanson seventeen fifty six to eighteen twenty seven the great english caricaturist and illustrator has given us several fine pictures of english coffee-house life his mad dog in a coffee-house presents a lively scene and his water-color of the french coffee-house is one of the best pictures we have of the french coffee-house in london as it looked during the latter half of the eighteenth century during the campaign in france in eighteen fourteen napoleon arrived one day unheralded in a country presbytery where the good cure was quietly turning his hand coffee roaster the emperor asked him what are you doing there abbe sire replied the priest i am doing like you i am burning the colonial fodder charlet seventeen ninety two to eighteen forty five made a lithograph of the incident several french poet musicians resorted to music to celebrate coffee Brittany has its own songs in praise of coffee as have other french provinces there are many epics rhapsodies and cantatas and even a comic opera by mayotte 
music by deaf bearing the title le cafe du roi produced at the théâtre lyrique november sixteenth eighteen sixty one fusilier wrote in honor of coffee a cantata set to music by bernier this is the burden of the poet's song ah coffee what climes yet unknown ignore the clear fires that thy vapors inspire thou countest in thy vast empire those realms that bacchus's reign disown favored liquid which fills all my soul with delights thy enchantments to life happy hours persuade we vanquish even sleep by thy fortunate aid thou hast rescued the hours sleep would rob from our nights favored liquid which fills all my soul with delights thy enchantments to life happy hours persuade o liquid that i love triumphant stream of sable even for the gods above drive nectar from the table make thou relentless war on treacherous juices sly let earth taste and adore the sweet calm of the sky o liquid that i love triumphant stream of sable even for the gods above drive nectar from the table during the early vogue of the cafe in paris a chanson entitled coffee reproduced here was set to music with accompaniment for the piano by m h collet a professor of harmony at the conservatoire printed in the form of a placard and put up in cafes it received the approbation of and was signed by de voyeur d'argenson at that time seventeen eleven lieutenant of police this poetry is not irreproachable it can hardly be attributed to any of the well-known poets of the time but rather to one of those bohemian rhymesters that wrote all too abundantly on all sorts of subjects it is the development of a theory concerning the properties of coffee and the best method of making it it is interesting to note that the uses of advertising were known and appreciated in paris in seventeen eleven for in the chanson there appears the name and address of one vilain a merchant rue des lombards who was evidently in fashion at that point the translation of the stanza reproduced as follows coffee a chanson if you with mind untroubled would flourish day by day let each day of the seven find coffee on your tray it will your frame preserve from every malady its virtues drive afar la la migraine and dread catarr ha ha dull cold and lethargy the most notable contribution to the music of coffee if one may be permitted the expression is the coffee cantata of johann sebastian bach sixteen eighty five to seventeen fifty the german organist and the most modern composer of the first half of the eighteenth century he hymned the religious sentiment of protestant germany and in his coffee cantata he tells in music the protest of the fair sex against the libels of the enemies of the beverage who at the time were actively urging in germany that it should be forbidden women because its use made for sterility later on the government surrounded the manufacture sale and use of coffee with many obnoxious restrictions as told in chapter eight box coffee cantata is number two hundred eleven of the secular cantatas and was published in leipzig in seventeen thirty two in german it is known as schweit still plottery nicht be silent do not talk it is written for soprano tenor and bass solos and orchestra bach used as his text a poem by picander the cantata is really a sort of one-act operetta a jocose production representing the efforts of a stern parent to check his daughter's propensities in coffee drinking the new fashioned habit one seldom thinks of bach as a humorist but the music here is written in a mock heroic vein recitatives and arias having a merry flavor hinting at what the master might have done in light opera the libretto shows the father schlandrian or slowpoke trying by various threats to dissuade his daughter from further indulgence in the new vice and in the end succeeding by threatening to deprive her of a husband but his victory is only temporary 
when the mother and the grandmother indulge in coffee asks the final trio who can blame the daughter bach uses the spelling coffee not cafe the cantata was sung as recently as december eighteenth nineteen twenty one at a concert in new york by the society of the friends of music directed by arthur badansky lyschen or betty the daughter has a delightful aria beginning ah how sweet coffee tastes lovelier than a thousand kisses sweeter far than muscatel wine the opening bars of which are reproduced on page five hundred ninety eight as the text is not long it is printed here in its entirety characters messenger and narrator tenor slowpoke bass betty daughter to slowpoke soprano tenor recitative be silent do not talk but notice what will happen here comes old slowpoke with his daughter betty he's grumbling like a common bear just listen to what he says enter slowpoke muttering what vexatious things one's children are a hundred thousand naughty ways what i tell my daughter betty might as well be told to the moon enter betty slowpoke recitative you naughty child you mischievous girl oh what can i have my way give up your coffee betty dear father do not be so strict if i can't have my little demi toss of coffee three times a day i'm just like a dried-up piece of roast goat betty aria ah how sweet coffee tastes lovelier than a thousand kisses sweeter far than muscatel wine i must have my coffee and if anyone wishes to please me let him present me with coffee slowpoke recitative if you won't give up coffee young lady i won't let you go to any wedding feasts i won't even let you go walking betty oh yes do let me have my coffee slowpoke what a little monkey you are anyway i will not let you have any whalebone skirts of the present fashionable size betty oh i can easily fix that slowpoke but i won't let you stand at the window and watch the new styles betty that doesn't bother me either but be good and let me have my coffee slowpoke but from my hands you'll get no silver or gold ribbon for your hair betty oh well so long as i have what does satisfy me slowpoke you wretched betty you you won't give in to me slowpoke air oh these girls what obstinate dispositions they do have they certainly are not easy to manage but if one hits the right spot oh well one may succeed slowpoke with an air of being sure of success this time recitative now please do what father says betty in everything except about coffee slowpoke well then you must make up your mind to do without a husband betty oh yes father a husband slowpoke i swear you can't have him betty till i give up coffee oh well coffee let it be forgotten dear father i will not drink none slowpoke then you can have one betty aria today dear father do it today he goes out ah a husband really this suits me exactly when they know i must have coffee why before i go to bed tonight i can have a valiant lover goes out tenor recitative now go hunt up old slowpoke and just watch him get a husband for his daughter for betty is secretly making it known that no wooer may come to the house unless he promises me himself and has it put in the marriage contract that he will allow me to make coffee whenever i will enter slowpoke and betty singing as chorus with tenor trio the cat will not give up the mouse old maids continue coffee sisters the mother loves her drink of coffee grandma too is a coffee fiend who now will blame the daughter research has discovered only one piece of sculpture associated with coffee the statue of the austrian hero kolschitsky the patron saint of the vienna coffee houses it graces the second floor corner of a house in the Favoriten Strasse, where it was erected in his honor by the coffee makers guild of vienna the great brother heart is shown in the attitude of pouring coffee into cups on a tray from an oriental service pot the celebrated cafe pedroki 
the center of life in the city of padua italy in the early part of the nineteenth century is one of the most beautiful buildings erected in italy its use is apparent at first glance it was begun in eighteen sixteen opened june ninth eighteen thirty one and completed in eighteen forty two antonio pedrocchi seventeen seventy six to eighteen fifty two an obscure paduan coffee-house keeper tormented by a desire for glory conceived the idea of building the most beautiful coffee-house in the world and carried it out section sixty of all about coffee this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b all about coffee by william Eukers. coffee in relation to the fine arts part two artisans and craftsmen of all ages since the discovery of coffee have brought their genius into play to fashion various forms of apparatus associated with the preparation of the coffee drink coffee roasters and grinders have been made of brass silver and gold coffee mortars of bronze and coffee making and serving pots of beautiful copper pewter pottery porcelain and silver designs in the peter collection in the united states national museum there is to be seen a fine specimen of the baghdad coffee pot made of beaten copper and used for making and serving also a beautiful turkish coffee set in the metropolitan museum in new york there are some beautiful specimens of persian and egyptian ewers in faience probably used for coffee service also in american and continental museums are to be seen many examples of seventeenth-century german dutch and english bronze mortars and pestles used for braying coffee beans to make coffee powder a very beautiful specimen of the oriental coffee grinder made of brass and teak wood set with red and green glass jewels and inlaid in the teak wood with ivory and brass is at the metropolitan this is of indo-persian design of the nineteenth century the metropolitan museum shows also many specimens of pewter coffee pots used in india germany holland belgium france russia and england in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries one can guess at the luxuriousness of the coffee pots in use in france throughout the eighteenth century by noting that from march twentieth seventeen fifty four to april sixteenth seventeen fifty five louis the fifteenth bought no fewer than three gold coffee pots of lazare duveau they had carved branches and were supplied with chafing dishes of burnished steel and lamps for spirits of wine they cost respectively one thousand nine hundred fifty one thousand five hundred thirty six and two thousand four hundred francs in the inventory of marie joseph de saxe dauphine of france we note too a two-cup coffee pot of gold with its chafing dish for spirits of wine in a leather case the italian wrought iron coffee roaster of the seventeenth century was often a work of art the specimen illustrated is rich in decorative motifs associated with the best in florentine art madame de pompadour's inventory disclosed a gold coffee mill carved in colored gold to represent the branches of a coffee tree the art of gold which sought to embellish everything did not disdain these homely utensils and one may see at the cluny museum in paris among many mills of graceful form a coffee mill of engraved iron dating from the eighteenth century upon which are represented the four seasons we are told however that it graced the sale after the death of madame de pompadour which of course makes it much more valuable the teapot coffee pot and chocolate pot first used in england closely resembled each other in form says charles james jackson in his illustrated history of english plate each being circular in plan tapering toward the top and having its handle fixed at a right angle with the spout he says further the earliest examples were of oriental ware and the form of these was adopted by the english plate workers as a model for others of silver it apparently was not until after both tea and coffee 
had been used for several years in this country england that the teapot was made proportionately less in height and greater in diameter than the coffee pot this distinction which was probably due to copying the forms of chinese porcelain teapots was afterwards maintained and to the present day the difference between the teapot and the coffee pot continued to be mainly one of height the coffee pot illustrated sixteen eighty one formerly belonged to the east india company and is preserved in the victoria and albert museum it is almost identical with the teapot 1670 in the same museum except that its straight spout is fixed nearer to the base as is its leather covered handle which with the sockets into which it fits forms a long recurving scroll fixed opposite to and in line with the spout its cover which is hinged to the upper handle socket is high like that of the 1670 teapot but instead of the straight outline of that cover this is slightly waved and surmounted by a somewhat flat button-shaped knob engraved on the body is a shield of arms a chevron between three crosses flurry surrounded by tied feathers the inscription is the gift of richard stern esq to ye honorable east india company this pot is nine and three quarters inches in height by four and seven eighths inches in diameter at the base it bears the london hallmarks of sixteen eighty one to eighty two and the maker's mark g g in a shaped shield thought by jackson to be george garthorne's mark the sixteen eighty nine coffee pot illustrated is the property of king george v it bears the london hallmarks of sixteen eighty nine to ninety and the mark of francis garthorne its tall round body tapers toward the top and has applied mouldings on the base and rim its spout is straight and tapers upward to the level of the rim of the pot its handle is of ebony crescent shaped and riveted into two sockets fixed at a right angle with the spout the lid is a high cone surmounted by a small vase-shaped finial and is hinged to the upper socket of the handle on no part of the pot is there any ornamentation other than the royal cipher of king william the third and queen mary which is engraved on the reverse side of the body this example which measures nine inches in height to the top of its cover resembles very closely in form the east india company's teapot just referred to but as teapots with much lower bodies appear to have come into fashion before sixteen eighty nine this pot was probably used as a coffee pot from the first the sixteen ninety two coffee pot of lantern shape is the property of h d ellis and has its spout curved upward at the top being furnished with a small hinged flap and a scroll-shaped thumb piece attached to the rim of the cover the body and cover were originally quite plain the embossing and chasing with symmetrical rococo decoration being added later probably about seventeen forty jackson says the wooden handle is not the original one which was probably c-shaped the pot bears the usual london hallmarks for the year sixteen ninety two and the maker's mark is g g upon a shaped shield a mark recorded upon the copper plate belonging to the goldsmith's company which mr cripps thinks was that of george garthorne the characteristics of this lantern-shaped coffee pot are one the straight sides so rapidly tapering from the base upward that in a height of only six inches the base diameter of four and three-eighths inches tapers to a diameter of no more than two and one-half inches at the rim two the nearly straight spout furnished with a flap or shutter three the true cone of the lid four the thumb piece which is a familiar feature upon the tankards of the period five the handle fixed at right angles to the spout mr ellis in a paper before the society of antiquaries on the earliest form of coffee pot says if coffee was first introduced into this country by the turkey merchants nothing is more probable than that those who first brought the berry brought also the vessel in which it was to be served such a vessel would be the turkish ewer whose shape is familiar to us 
the same today as two hundred years ago, for in the East things are slow to change. And throughout the reign of the second Charles, so long as the extended use of coffee in the houses of the people was retarded by the opposition of the women of England and by the scarcely less powerful influence of the king's court, the small requirements of a mere handful of coffee houses would be easily met by the importation of Turkish vessels. Reference to the coffee house keeper's tokens in the Beaufoy collection in the Guildhall Museum shows that many of the traders of 1660 to 1675 adopted as their trade sign a hand pouring coffee from a pot. This pot is invariably of the Turkish ewer pattern. It is true that there is nothing to show that the Turks themselves ever served coffee from the ewer, but it is scarcely conceivable that the English coffee house keepers should have adopted as their trade sign their pictorial advertisement, so to speak, a vessel which had no connection with the commodity in which they dealt, and which would convey no meaning associated with coffee to the public. But as soon as the extended use of the beverage created a demand which stimulated a home manufacture of coffee pots, a new departure is apparent. The undulating outlines beloved by the Orientals, bowed as their scimitars, curvilinear as their graceful flowing script, do not commend themselves to the more severe western taste of the period, which had then declared its preference for sweet simplicity in silversmith's work, such as we see in the basins, cups, and especially the flat-topped tankards of that day. The beauty of the straight line had asserted its power, and fashion felt its sway. Such was the feeling that produced the coffee pot of 1692, the straight lines of which continued in vogue until the middle of the following century, when a reaction in favor of bulbous bodies and serpentine spouts set in. Some of the more notable of the coffee house keepers' tokens in the Guildhall Museum were photographed for this work. They are described and illustrated in Chapter 10. There are illustrated other silver coffee pots in the Victoria and Albert Museum by Folkingham, 1715 to 16, and Wastel, 1720 to 21, the latter pot being octagonal. There is illustrated also a design in tiles that were let into the wall of an ancient coffee house in Brick Lane, Spitalfields, known as the Dish of Coffee Boy. In the catalogue of the collection of London Antiquities in the Guildhall Museum. Mr. Ellis thinks this belongs to a period a little earlier, but certainly not later than 1692, the coffee pot represented being exactly of the lantern shape. It is an oblong sign of glazed Delft tiles decorated in blue, brown, and yellow, representing a youth pouring coffee. Upon a table by his side are a gazette two pipes, a bowl, a bottle, and a mug. Above on a scroll is Dish of Coffee Boy. Modifications of the lantern began to appear with great rapidity in England. In the coffee pot of Chinese porcelain, illustrated, probably made in China from an English model a few years later than the 1692 pot. Mr. Ellis observes that the spout has already lost its straightness, the extreme taper of the body is diminished, and the lid betrays the first tendency to depart from the straightness of the cone to the curved outline of the dome. He adds, These variations rapidly intensified, and at the commencement of the 18th century we find the body still less tapering and the lid has become a perfect dome. As we approach the end of Queen Anne's reign, the thumb piece disappears and the handle is no longer set on at right angles to the spout. Through the reign of George I, but little modification took place, save that the taper of the body became less and less. In the second George's time, we find the taper has almost entirely disappeared, so that the sides are nearly parallel, while the dome of the lid has been flattened down to a very low elevation above the rim. In the second quarter of the 18th century, the pear-shaped coffee pot was the vogue. In the earlier years of George III, when many new and beautiful designs in silversmith's work were created, 
a complete revolution in coffee pots takes place and the flowing outlines of the new pattern recall the form of the turkish ewer which had been discarded nearly one hundred years previously the evolution is shown by illustrations of lord swathling's pot of seventeen thirty one the coffee jug of seventeen thirty six the vincent pot of seventeen thirty eight the viscountess wolseley's coffee pot of copper plated with silver the irish coffee pot of seventeen sixty and the silver coffee pots of seventeen seventy three to seventy six end of seventeen seventy nine to eighty there are illustrated in this connection specimens of coffee pots in stoneware by ellers seventeen hundred and in salt glaze by astbury and another of the period about seventeen twenty five these are in the department of british and medieval antiquities of the british museum we are to be seen also some beautiful specimens of coffee service pots in wealden ware and in wedgwood's jasper ware illustrated too are some beautiful examples of the art of the potter applied to coffee service as found in the metropolitan museum where they have been brought from many countries included are leeds and staffordshire examples of the eighteenth nineteenth and twentieth centuries a sino low stoffed pot of the eighteenth nineteenth centuries an italian capo de monte pot of the eighteenth century german pots of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries a vienna coffee pot of the eighteenth century a french la seine coffee pot of seventeen seventy four to seventeen ninety three a sevres pot of seventeen ninety two to eighteen o four and a spanish eighteenth century coffee pot decorated in copper lustre at the metropolitan may be seen also hatfield and sheffield plate pots of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries and many examples of silver tea and coffee service and coffee pots by american silversmiths silver teapots and coffee pots were few in america before the middle of the eighteenth century early coffee pot examples were tapering and cylindrical in form and later matched the teapots with swelling drums molded bases decorated spouts and molded lids with finials from notes by r t haynes halsey and john h buck collected by florence n levy and woven into an introduction to the metropolitan museum's art exhibition catalog for the hudson fulton celebration of 1909 we learn that the first silver made in new england was probably fashioned by english or scottish immigrants who had served their time abroad they were followed by craftsmen who were either born here or like john hull arriving at an early age learned their trade on this side in england it was required that every master goldsmith should have his mark and set it upon his work after it was assayed and marked with the king's mark hallmark testifying to the fineness of the metal the colonial silversmiths marked their wares with their initials with or without emblems placed in shields circles etc without any guide as to place of manufacture or date after about seventeen twenty five it was the custom to use the surname with or without an initial and sometimes the full name since the establishment of the united states the name of the town was often added and also the letters d or c in a circle probably meaning dollar or coin showing the standard or coin from which the wares were made in the new york colony there were evolved silver teapots of a unique design that was not used elsewhere in the colonies mr halsey says they were used indiscriminately for both tea and coffee in style they followed to a certain extent the squat pear-shaped teapots of the period of seventeen seventeen to eighteen in england but had greater height and capacity the colonial silversmiths wrought many beautiful designs in coffee tea and chocolate pots fine specimens are to be seen in the halsey and clearwater loan collections in the metropolitan museum included in the clearwater collection is a coffee pot by pygen adams seventeen twelve to seventeen seventy six and recently there was added a coffee pot by ephraim brasher whose name appears in the new york city directory from seventeen eighty six 
1805. He was a member of the Gold and Silversmiths Society, and he made the die for the famous gold doubloon, known by his name, a specimen of which recently sold in Philadelphia for $4,000. His brother, Abraham Brasher, who was an officer in the Continental Army, wrote many popular ballads of the Revolutionary period and was a constant contributor to the newspapers. Judge Clearwater's collection of colonial silver in the Metropolitan Museum, to which he is constantly adding, is a magnificent one, and the coffee pot is worthy of it. It is 13 and one half inches high, weighs 44 ounces, exclusive of the ebony handle, has a curved body and splayed base, with a gudrooned band to the base and a similar edge to the cover. The spout is elaborate and curved, the cover has an urn-shaped finial, and there is a decoration of an engraved medallion surrounded by a wreath with a ribbon forming a true lover's knot. In the Halsey collection is shown a silver coffee pot by Samuel Minot and several beautiful specimens of the handiwork of Paul Revere, whose name is more often connected with the famous Midnight Ride than with the art of the silversmith. Of all the American silversmiths, Paul Revere was the most interesting. Not only was he a silversmith of renown, but a patriot, soldier, Grand Master Mason, confidential agent of the state of Massachusetts Bay, engraver, picture frame designer, and die sinker. He was born in Boston in 1735 and died in 1818. He was the most famous of all the Boston silversmiths, although he is more widely known as a patriot. He was the third of a family of 12 children and early entered his father's shop. When only 19, his father died, but he was able to carry on the business. The engraving on his silver bears witness to his ability. He engraved also on copper and made many political cartoons. He joined the expedition against the French at Crown Point and in the War of the Revolution was a lieutenant colonel of artillery. After the close of the war, he resumed his business of a goldsmith and silversmith in 1783. Decidedly a man of action, he well played many parts, and in all his manifold undertakings achieved brilliant success. There clings, therefore, to the articles of silver made by him an element of romantic and patriotic association which endears them to those who possess them. Revere had a real talent that enabled him to impart an unwanted elegance to his work, and he was famous as an engraver of the beautiful crests, armorial designs, and floral wreaths that adorn much of his work. His teapots and coffee pots are unusually beautiful. Revere coffee pots are to be seen in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, as well as in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts has also a coffee pot made by William Shaw and William Priest in 1751-52 to 52 for Peter Faneuil, the wealthiest Bostonian of his time, who gave to Boston Faneuil Hall New England's cradle of American liberty. Among other American silversmiths who produced striking designs in coffee pots, mention should be made of G. Aiken, 1815, Garrett Eoff, New York, 1785 to 1850, Charles Ferris, who worked in Boston about 1790, Jacob Hurd, 1702 to 1758, known in Boston as Captain Hurd, John McMullen, mentioned in the Philadelphia Directory for 1796, James Musgrave, mentioned in Philadelphia Directories of 1797, 1808, and 1811, Meyer Myers, admitted as Freeman, New York, 1746, active until 1790, president of the New York Silversmith Society, 1786, and Anthony Roche, who is known to have worked in Philadelphia, 1815. In the museums of the many historical societies throughout the United States are to be seen interesting specimens of coffee pots in pewter, Britannia metal, and tinware, as well as in pottery, porcelain, and silver. Some of these are illustrated. As in other branches of art, during the 17th and 18th centuries, the United States were indebted to England, Holland, and France 
from much of the early pottery and porcelain. Ellers, Astbury, Wealdon, Wedgwood, their imitators, and later the Staffordshire potters flooded the American market with their wares. Porcelain was not made in this country previous to the 19th century. Decorative pottery was made here, however, from an early period. Britannia ware began to take the place of pewter in 1825, and the introduction of japanned tinware and pottery gradually caused the manufacture of pewter to be abandoned. An interesting relic is in the collection of the Bostonian Society. It is a coffee urn of Sheffield ware, formerly in the Green Dragon Tavern, which stood on Union Street from 1697 to 1832 and was a famous meeting place of the patriots of the revolution. It is globular in form and rests on a base, and inside is still to be seen the cylindrical piece of iron, which, when heated, kept the delectable liquid contents of the urn hot until imbibed by the frequenters of the tavern. The iron bar was set in a zinc or tin jacket to keep such fireplace ashes as still clung to it from coming in contact with the coffee, which was probably brewed in a stew kettle before being poured into the urn for serving. The Green Dragon Tavern site, now occupied by a business structure, is owned by the St. Andrew's Lodge of Freemasons of Boston, and at a recent gathering of the lodge on St. Andrew's Day, the urn was exhibited to the assembled brethren. When the contents of the tavern were sold, the urn was bought by Mrs. Elizabeth Harrington, who then kept a famous boarding house on Pearl Street in a building owned by the Quincy family. The house was raised in 1847 and was replaced by the Quincy Block, and Mrs. Harrington moved to High Street and from there to Chauncey Place. Some of the prominent men of Boston boarded with her for many years. At her death, the urn was given to her daughter, Mrs. John R. Bradford. It was presented to the Society by Miss Phoebe C. Bradford of Boston, granddaughter of Mrs. Elizabeth Harrington. A somewhat similar urn made of pewter is in the Museum of the Maine Historical Society of Portland, Maine, another in the Museum of the Essex Institute at Salem, Massachusetts. Among the many treasured relics of Abraham Lincoln is an old Britannia coffee pot from which he was regularly served while a boarder with the Rutledge family at the Rutledge Inn in New Salem, now Menard, Illinois. It was a valued utensil, and Lincoln is said to have been very fond of it. It is illustrated on page 690. The pot is now the property of the Old Salem Lincoln League of Petersburg, Illinois, and was donated to it with other relics by Mrs. Saunders of Sisquoc, California, the only surviving child of James and Mary Ann Rutledge. Mrs. Rutledge carefully preserved this and other relics of New Salem days, and shortly before her death in 1878, she gave them into the keeping of her daughter, Mrs. Saunders, advising her to preserve them until such time as a permanent home for them would be provided by a grateful people back at New Salem, where they were associated with the immortal Lincoln and his tragic romance with her daughter, Anne. Section 61 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shireen Hickey. All About Coffee by William Eukers. The Evolution of Coffee Apparatus, Part 1. Chapter 34. The Evolution of Coffee Apparatus showing the development of coffee roasting, coffee grinding, coffee making, and coffee serving devices from the earliest time to the present day, the original coffee grinder, the first coffee roaster, and the first coffee pot, the original French drip pot, the de Beloy percolator, Count Rumford's improvement, how the commercial coffee roaster was developed, the evolution of filtration devices, the old Carter pull-out roaster, trade customs in New York and St. Louis in the 60s and 70s, the story of the evolution of the Burns Roaster, how the gas roaster was developed in France, Great Britain, and the United States. A book could be written on the subject of this chapter. 
we shall have to be content to touch briefly upon the important developments in the devices employed. The changes that have taken place in the preparation of the drink itself will be discussed in Chapter 36. In the beginning, that is, in Ethiopia, about 800 A.D., coffee was looked upon as a food. The whole ripe berries, beans, and hulls were crushed and molded into food balls held in shape with fat. Later, the dried berries were so treated. So the primitive stone mortar and pestle were the original coffee grinder. The dried hulls and the green beans were first roasted sometime between 1200 and 1300 in crude burnt clay dishes or in stone vessels over open fires. These were the original roasting utensils. Next, the coffee beans were ground between little millstones, one turning above the other. Then came the mill used by the Greeks and Romans for grain. This mill consisted of two conical millstones, one hollow and fitted over the other, specimens of which have been found in Pompeii. The idea is the same as that employed in the most modern metal grinder. Between 1400 and 1500, individual earthenware and metal coffee roasting plates appeared. These were circular, from four to six inches in diameter, about three sixteenths inch thick, slightly concave, and pierced with small holes, something like the modern kitchen skimmer. They were used in Turkey and Persia for roasting a few beans at a time over braziers, open pans or basins for holding live coals. The braziers were usually mounted on feet and richly ornamented. About the same time, we notice the first appearance of the familiar Turkish pocket cylinder coffee mill and the original Turkish ibrik, or coffee boiler, made of metal. Little drinking cups of Chinese porcelain completed the service. The original coffee boiler was not unlike the English ale mug with no cover, smaller at the top than at the bottom, fitted with a grooved lip for pouring, and a long straight handle. They were made of brass, and in sizes to hold from one to six tiny cupfuls. A later improvement was of the Ewer design, with bulbous body, collar top, and cover. The Turkish coffee grinder seems to have suggested the individual cylinder roaster, which later, 1650, became common, and from which developed the huge modern cylinder commercial roasting machines. The individual coffee service of early civilization first employed crude clay bowls, or dishes, for drinking. But as early as 1350, Persian, Egyptian, and Turkish ewers made of pottery were used for serving. In the 17th century, ewers of similar pattern, but made of metal, were the favorite coffee-serving devices in Oriental countries and in Western Europe. Between 1428 and 1448, a spice grinder standing on four legs was invented, and this was later used for grinding coffee. The drawer to receive the ground coffee was added in the 18th century. Between 1500 and 1600, shallow iron dippers with long handles and footrests designed to stand in open fires were used in Baghdad and by the Arabs in Mesopotamia for roasting coffee. These roasters had handles about 34 inches long and the bowls were eight inches in diameter. They were accompanied by a metal stirrer, spatula, for turning the beans. Another type of roaster was developed about 1600. It was in the shape of an iron spider on legs and was designed, like that just described, to sit in open fires. At this period, pewter serving pots were first used. Between 1600 and 1632, mortars and pestles of wood, iron, brass, and bronze came into common use in Europe for braying the roasted beans. For several centuries, coffee connoisseurs held that pounding the beans in a mortar was superior to grinding in the most efficient mill. Peregrine White's parents brought to America on the Mayflower in 1620 a wooden mortar and pestle that were used for braying coffee to make coffee powder. When La Roque speaks of his father bringing back to Marseille from Constantinople in 1644 the instruments for making coffee, he undoubtedly refers to the individual devices which at that time in the Orient included the roaster plate, the cylinder grinder, the small long-handled boiler, and fengens, the little porcelain drinking cups. 
When Bernier visited Grand Cairo about the middle of the 17th century in all the city's thousand-odd coffee houses, he found but two persons who understood the art of roasting the bean. About 1650 there was developed the individual cylinder coffee roaster made of metal, usually tin plate or tinned copper, suggested by the original Turkish pocket grinder. This was designed for use over open fires in braziers. There appeared about this time also a combined making and serving metal pot, which was undoubtedly the original of the common type of pot that we know today. There appeared in England about 1660 Elford's white iron machine, sheet iron coated with tin, which was turned on a spit by a jack. Footnote, a mechanical contrivance that took the place of a boy. End of footnote. This was simply a larger size of the individual cylinder roaster and was designed for family or commercial use. Modifications were developed by the French and Dutch. In the 17th century, the Italians produced some beautiful designs in wrought iron coffee roasters. Before the advent of the Elford machine, and indeed for two centuries thereafter, it was the common practice in the home to roast coffee in uncovered earthenware tart dishes, old pudding pans, and fry pans. Before the time of the modern kitchen stove, it was usually done over charcoal fires without flame. The improved Turkish combination coffee grinder with folding handle and cup receptacle for the beans, used for grinding, boiling, and drinking, was first made in Damascus in 1665. About this period, the Turkish coffee set, including the long-handled boiler and the porcelain drinking cups and brass holders, also came into vogue. In 1665, Nicholas Book, living at the sign of the frying pan in St. Tully's Street, London, advertised that he was the only known man for making of mills for grinding of coffee powder, which mills are sold by him from 40 to 45 shillings the mill. By combining the long handle idea contained in the Baghdad roaster with that of the original cylinder roaster, the Dutch perfected a small, closed, sheet iron cylinder roaster with a long handle that permitted its being held and turned in open fireplaces. From 1670 and well into the middle of the 19th century, this type of family roaster enjoyed great favor in Holland, France, England, and the United States, more especially in the country districts. The museums of Europe and the United States contain many specimens. The iron cylinder measured about five inches in diameter and was from six to eight inches long, being attached to a three or four foot iron rod provided with a wooden handle. The green coffee was put into the cylinder through a sliding door. Balancing the roaster over the blaze by resting the end of the iron rod projecting from the far end of the roasting cylinder and a hook of the usual fireplace crane, the housekeeper was wont slowly to revolve the cylinder until the beans had turned the proper color. Portable coffee-making outfits to fit the pocket were much in vogue in France in 1691. These included a roaster, a grinder, a lamp, the oil, cups, saucers, spoons, coffee, and sugar. The roaster was first made of tin plate or tinned copper, but for the aristocracy, silver and gold were used. In 1754, a white silver coffee roaster, eight inches long and four inches in diameter, was mentioned among the deliveries made to the army of the king at Versailles. Humphrey Broadbent, the London coffee man, wrote in 1722, I hold it best to roast coffee berries in an iron vessel full of little holes, made to turn on a spit over a charcoal fire, keeping them continually turning, and sometimes shaking them that they do not burn, and when they are taken out of the vessel, spread them on some tin or iron plate till the vehemency of the heat is vanished. I would recommend to every family to roast their own coffee for then they will be almost secure from having any damaged berries or any art to increase the weight, which is very injurious to the drinkers of coffee. Most persons of distinction in Holland roast their own berries. Between 1700 and 1800, there was developed a type of small portable household stove to burn coke or charcoal 
made of iron and fitted with horizontal revolving cylinders for coffee roasting. These were provided with iron handles for turning. A modification of this type of roaster under a three-sided hood and standing on three legs was designed to sit on the hearth of open fireplaces close to the fire or in the smoldering ashes. Because of its greater capacity, it was probably used in the inns and coffee houses for roasting large batches. Still another type, which made its appearance late in the 18th century, was the sheet iron roaster suspended at the top of a tall, iron, box-like compartment or stove in which the fire was built. This too was designed to roast coffee in comparatively large quantities. In some examples, it was provided with legs. Great silver coffee pots, with all the utensils belonging to them of the same metal, were first used by Pascal at Saint-Germain's Fair in Paris in 1672. It remained for the English and American silversmiths to produce the most beautiful forms of silver coffee pots, and there are some notable collections of these in England and the United States. The oriental serving pot was nearly always of metal, tall and, in old models, of graceful curve with a slightly twisted ornamental beak in the form of an S attached below the middle of the vessel. A handle ornamented in the same way formed a decorative balance. In 1692, the Lantern Straight Line Coffee Serving Pot with True Cone Lid, Thumb Piece, and handle fixed at right angle to the spout was introduced into England, succeeding the curved oriental serving pot. In 1700, coffee pots made of cheaper metals like tin and Britannia ware began to appear on the home tables of the people. In 1701, silver coffee pots appeared in England having perfect domes and bodies less tapering. Between 1700 and 1800, silver, gold, and delicate porcelain serving pots were the vogue among European royalty. In 1704, Bull's machine for roasting coffee was patented in England. This probably marks the first use of coal for commercial roasting. In 1710, the popular coffee roaster in French homes was a dish of varnished earthenware. The same year, a novelty was introduced in France in the shape of a fustian linen bag for infusing ground coffee. By 1714, the thumb piece on English serving pots had disappeared, and the handle was no longer set at a right angle to the spout. English coffee pot bodies showed a further modification in 1725, the taper becoming less and less. Coffee grinders were so common in France in 1720 that they were to be had for a dollar and twenty cents each. Their development by the French had been rapid from the original spice grinder. At first they were known as coffee mills, but in the 18th century roasters came to be known by that name. They were made of iron, retaining the same principle of the horizontal millstones, one of which is fixed while the other moves, that the ancients employed for grinding wheat. They were squat, box-shaped affairs, having in the center a shank of iron that revolved upon a fixed, corrugated iron plate. There was also the style that fastened to the wall. At first, the drawer to receive ground coffee was missing, but this was supplied in later types. Before its invention, the ground coffee was received in a sack of greased leather or in one treated on the outside with beeswax, probably the original of the duplex paper bag for conserving the flavor. The French brought their innate artistic talents to bear upon coffee grinders, just as they did upon roasters and serving pots. In many instances, they made the outer parts of silver and of gold. By 1750, the straight line serving pot in England had begun to yield to the reactionary movement in art favoring bulbous bodies and serpentine spouts. About 1760, French inventors began to devote themselves to improvements in coffee-making devices. Don Martin, a Paris tinsmith, in 1763 invented an urn pot that employed a flannel sack for infusing. Another infusion device produced the same year by Lanet, also a tinsmith of Paris, was known as a diligence. A complete revolution in the style of English serving pots took place in 1770 with a return to the flowing lines of the Turkish ewer, and between 1800 and 1900 there was a gradual return to the style of serving pot 
having the handle at a right angle to the spout. In 1779, Richard Dearman was granted an English patent on a new method of making mills for grinding coffee. In 1798, the first American patent on an improved coffee grinding mill was granted to Thomas Bruff, Sr. It was a wall mill fitted with iron plates in which the coffee was ground between two circular nuts, three inches broad, and having coarse teeth around their centers and fine shallow teeth at the edges. De Balois, or Du Balois, coffee pot appeared in Paris about 1800. It was first made of tin, but later of porcelain and silver, the original French drip pot. This device was never patented, but it appears to have furnished the inspiration for many inventors in France, England, and the United States. The first French patent on a coffee maker was granted to Denobe, Orient, and Rouge in 1802. It was for a pharmacological chemical coffee making device by infusion. Charles Wyatt obtained a patent the same year in London on an apparatus for distilling coffee. The de Bolloy pot is illustrated on page 622. In 1806, Adreau was granted a French patent on a device for filtering coffee without boiling and bathed in air. This use of the word filtering was misleading, as it was many times after in French, English, and American patent nomenclature, where it often meant percolation or something quite different from filtration. True percolation means to drip through fine interstices of china or metal. Filtration means to drip through a porous substance, usually cloth or paper. De Balois' pot was a percolator. So was Adro's. The improvement on which Adro got his patent was to replace the white iron filter, sick, used in ordinary filtering pots by a filter composed of hard tin and bismuth, and to use a rammer of the same metal, pierced with holes. The rammer was designed to press down and to smooth out the powdered coffee in an even and uniform fashion. It also, says Adrell in his specification, stops the derangement which boiling water poured from a height can produce. It is held by its stem a half inch from the surface of the powder, so that it receives only the action of the water which it divides and facilitates thus the extraction which it must produce in each of the particles. A coffee percolator was invented in Paris about 1806 by Benjamin Thompson, FRS, an American-British scientist, philanthropist, and administrator. He was known as Count Rumford, a title bestowed on him by the Pope. Rumford's invention was first given to the public in London in 1812. He has gained great credit for his device because of an elaborate essay that he wrote on it in Paris under the title of The Excellent Qualities of Coffee and the Art of Making it in the Highest Perfection, and that he caused to be published in London in 1812. It was a simple percolator pot provided with a hot water jacket and was a real improvement on the French drip or percolator coffee pot invented by de Bolloy, but not at all unlike Adro's patented device. Count Rumford, however, was a picturesque character and a good advertiser. He is generally credited with the invention of the coffee percolator, but examination of his device shows that, strictly speaking, the de Balois pot was just as much a percolator and apparently antedated it by about six years. De Balois employed the principle of having the boiling water drip through the ground coffee when held in suspension by a perforated metal or porcelain grid. This is true percolation. Adro did the same thing with the improvements noted above. Count Rumford, in his essay, admits that this method of making coffee was not new, but claims his improvement was. This was to provide a rammer for compressing the ground coffee in the upper or percolating device into a definite thickness, this being accomplished by providing the perforated circular tin disc water spreader that rested on the ground coffee with four projections, or feet, that kept the spreader within half an inch of the grid, holding the powder in suspension and free from agitation. His argument was that two-thirds of an inch of ground coffee should be leveled and compressed into a half-inch thickness before the boiling water was introduced. Practically, the same result was achieved in the de Bolloy and Adro pots. 
also provided with water spreaders and pluggers, but the same mathematical exactitude in the matter of the depth of the ground coffee before the percolation started was not assured. De Bolloy's spreader did not have the projections on the underside upon which Count Rumford laid such stress. Then there was the hot water jacket, which was an improvement on Adro's hot air bath. Inventors that followed Rumford have made light of the importance that he attached to scientific accuracy in coffee making. But it is interesting to note how many of the features of the de Bolloy, Adro, and Rumford pots have been retained in the modern complex coffee machines and in most of the filtration devices. French inventors continued to apply themselves to coffee roasting and coffee making problems, and many new ideas were evolved. Some of these were improved upon by the Dutch, the Germans, and the Italians. But the best work in the line of improvements that have survived the test of time was done in England and the United States. In 1815, Sonnet was granted a French patent on a device to make coffee without boiling. In 1819, Lawrence produced the original of the percolation device in which the boiling water is raised by a tube and sprayed over the ground coffee. The same year, Maurice, a Paris tinsmith and lamp maker, followed with a reversible double drip pot, which was the pioneer of all the reversible filtration pots of Europe and America. Godet, another tinsmith, in 1820, patented an improvement on the percolator idea that employed a cloth filter. By 1825, the pumping percolator, working by steam pressure and by partial vacuum, was much used in France, Holland, Germany, and Austria. Meanwhile, it was common practice to roast coffee in England in an iron pan or in hollow cylinders made of sheet iron, while in Italy the practice was to roast it in glass flasks, which were fitted with loose corks. The flasks were held over clear fires of burning coals and continually agitated. Anthony Schick was granted an English patent in 1812 on a method or process for roasting coffee, but as he never filed his specifications, we shall probably never know what the process was. The custom of the day in England was to pound the roasted beans in a mortar or to grind them in a French mill. In 1822, Louis Bernard Rabot was granted an English patent in which the French drip process was reversed by using steam pressure to force the boiling water upward through the coffee mass. Casseneuve, a Paris tinsmith, seems to have patented practically the same idea in France in 1824. Casseneuve employed a paper filter in his machine. In America, a United States patent was granted in 1813 to Alexander Duncan Moore of New Haven on a mill for grinding and pounding coffee. This was followed by a patent granted to Increase Wilson of New London in 1818 on a steel mill for grinding coffee. In 1815, Archibald Kenrich was granted a patent in England on mills for grinding coffee. The coffee biggin, said to have been invented by a Mr. Biggin, came into common use in England for making coffee about 1817. It was usually an earthenware pot. At first it had in the upper part a metal strainer like the French drip pots. Suspended from the rim in later models, there was a flannel or muslin bag to hold the ground coffee through which the boiling water was poured, the bag serving as a filter. The idea was an adaptation of the French Fustian infusion bag of 1711 and of the other early French drip and filtration devices, and it attained great popularity. Any coffee pot with such a bag fitted into its mouth came to be spoken of as a coffee biggin. Later, there was evolved the metal pot with a wire strainer substituted for the cloth bag. The coffee biggin still retains its popularity in England. While French inventors were busy with coffee makers, English and American inventors were studying means to improve the roasting of the beans. Peregrine Williamson of Baltimore was granted the first patent in the United States for an improvement on a coffee roaster in 1820. In 1824, Richard Evans was granted a patent in England for a commercial method of roasting coffee comprising a cylindrical sheet iron roaster fitted with improved flanges for mixing, a hollow tube and trier for sampling coffee while roasting, 
and a means for turning the roaster completely over to empty it. The next year, 1825, the first coffee pot patent in the United States was granted to Louis Mortelli of New York. It marked the first American attempt to perfect an arrangement to condense the steam and the essential oils and to return them to the infusion. In 1838, Antony Bensini of Milton, North Carolina, was granted a similar patent in the United States. Rowland, in 1844, and Waite and Sunner, in their Old Dominion pot of 1856, tried for the same result, namely the condensation of the steam in upper chambers. The French, meantime, focused on coffee makers, and in 1827, Jacques-Augustin Gandet, a manufacturer of plated jewelry in Paris, produced a really practicable pumping percolator. This machine had the ascending steam tube on the exterior. The same year, 1827, Nicolas Félix Durant, a manufacturer in chalon sur marne was granted a French patent on a percolator employing for the first time an inner tube for spraying the boiling water over the ground coffee. In 1828, Charles Parker of Meriden, Connecticut, began work on the original Parker coffee mill, which later was to bring him fame and fortune. The next year, 1829, the first French patent on a coffee mill was issued to Collot and Compagnie of Molsheim. That same year, 1829, the Etablissement Lausanne, Paris, began to make hand-turned iron cylinder coffee roasting machines. In 1831, David Selden was granted a patent in England for a coffee grinding mill having cones of cast iron. The first Parker coffee grinder patent for a household coffee and spice mill was issued in the United States in 1832 to Edmund Parker and Herman M. White of Meriden, Connecticut. The Charles Parker Company's business was founded the same year. In 1832 and 1833, United States patents were issued to Amy Clark of Berlin, Connecticut, also on improved coffee and spice mills for home use. Amos Ransom, Hartford, Connecticut, was granted a United States patent on a coffee roaster in 1833. The English began exporting coffee roasting and coffee grinding machinery to the United States in 1833 to 34. It was not until 1836 that the first French patent was issued on a combined coffee roaster and grinder to François René Lacou of Paris. The roaster was made of porcelain because the inventor believed that metal imparted a bad taste to the beans while roasting. In 1839, James Vardy and Moritz Platow were granted an English patent on a kind of urn percolator employing the vacuum process of coffee making, the upper vessel being made of glass. The first French patent on a glass coffee making device using the same principle was granted to Madame Vassieu of Lyon in 1842. These were the forerunners of the double glass balloons for making coffee which later on, in the early part of the 20th century, attained much vogue in the United States. They were very popular in Europe until the latter part of the 19th century. In 1839, John Rittenhouse of Philadelphia was granted a United States patent on a cast iron mill designed to handle the problem of nails and stones in grinding coffee. His improvement was intended to prevent injury to the grinding teeth by stopping the machine. In 1840, Abel Stillman, Poland, New York, was granted a United States patent on a family coffee roaster having a mica window to enable the operator to observe the coffee while roasting. In 1841, William Ward Andrews was granted an English patent on an improved coffee pot employing a pump to force the boiling water upward through the coffee, which was contained in a perforated cylinder screwed to the bottom of the pot. This was Rabot's idea of 19 years before. We find it again repeated in the United States in a machine which appeared on the New York market in 1906. In 1841, Claude-Marie Victor Bernard of Paris was granted a French patent on a coffee roaster, which was an improvement designed to bring the roasting cylinder and the fire in closer contact. This was accomplished, to quote the quaint language of the inventor, by applying movable legs and 
by superimposing a sheet iron circlet around the edge of the furnace to get double the quantity of heat, and it presents so much advantage that it has seemed to me worthy of being patented. But the French were only toying with the roaster, because roasting in France was not yet a separate branch of business as it had become in England and the United States, where keen minds were already at work on the purely commercial coffee roasting machine. The application of intensive thought in this direction was destined to bear fruit in America in 1846 and in England in 1847. French inventive genius continued to occupy itself with coffee making and in the invention of Edward Loisel de Santé of Paris in 1843 produced the first of the ideas that were later incorporated in the hydrostatic percolator for making 2,000 cups of coffee an hour at the exposition of 1855 and that has since been improved upon by the Italians in their rapid filter machines. It should be noted that Loisel's 2,000 cups were probably demitasses. The modern Italian rapid filter machine produces about 1,000 large coffee cups per hour. James W. Carter of Boston was granted a United States patent in 1846 on his pull-out roaster, and this was the machine most generally employed for trade roasting in America for the next 20 years. Carter did not claim to have invented the combination of cylindrical roaster and furnace but he did claim priority for the combination with the furnace and roasting vessel of the airspace or chamber surrounding it, the same being for the purpose of preventing the too rapid escape of heat from the furnace when the air chamber's induction and eduction air openings or passages are closed. The Carter pull-out was so called because the roasting cylinder of sheet iron was pulled out from the furnace on a shaft supported by standards to be emptied or to be refilled from sliding doors in its sides. It was in use for many years in such old-time plants as that of Dwinnell Wright Company, 25 Haverhill Street, Boston, by James H. Forbes and William Shotton in St. Louis, and by D. Y. Harrison in Cincinnati. The picture of a roasting room with Carter machines in operation, reproduced here, recalled to George S. Wright, the present head of the Dwinnell Wright Company's business, the scene as he saw it so many times when, as a boy of ten or twelve, he occasionally spent a day in his father's factory. The only difference I notice, he wrote, the author, is that according to my recollection, there was no cooler box to receive the roasted coffee which was dumped on the floor where it was spread out three or four inches deep with iron rakes and sprinkled with a watering pot. The contact of water and hot coffee caused so much steam that the roasting room was in a dense fog for several minutes after each batch of coffee was drawn from the fire. A. E. Forbes also thus recalled the Carter machine in his father's factory in St. Louis in 1853 when he used to help after school, and sometimes ran the roasters after 1857. It was barrel-shaped, having a slide the full length of one side to fill and empty. A heavy shaft ran through the center, resting on the wall of the furnace at the rear end and on an upright about eight feet from the front wall. The fire was about 16 to 18 inches below the cylinder and of soft coal. The cylinder was not perforated, the theory being to keep the vapors from escaping. Footnote. In his patent specification, Mr. Carter said on this point, small holes should be made through the roaster in sufficient number to allow of the escape of the vapors and volatile matters which escape from the coffee while undergoing the process of being roasted. End of footnote. This, of course, was erroneous. The color of the smoke bursting from the edge of the slide was our medium of telling when the roasting process was nearing completion, and often the cylinder was pulled out and opened for inspection several times before that point was reached. When just right, the belt was shifted to a loose pulley, stopping the cylinder, which was pulled off the fire. A handle was attached to the shaft, the slide drawn, and the coffee was dumped into a wooden tray which had to be shoved under the cylinder. The coffee was stirred around in the tray until cool enough to sack. The roaster man had to be a husky in those days, to pick up a sack of Rio weighing about 160 to 175 pounds, 
not a hundred, thirty-two pounds as now, and to empty it in the cylinder. We had no overhead hoppers. Later we built in the rear and put in two cylinders of the Chris Abiel type, having stationary fronts, and filling and emptying from the front end. We still used soft coal, with the fire sixteen to eighteen inches under the cylinder. We had other machines made locally from the Carter pattern. The idea of the tight cylinder was to keep out smoke, as well as to keep in the aroma. I think we were the first to use perforations, because I remember old Jabez Burns coming along after we put in one of his machines and remarking on it. We had a kind of mechanical genius for engineer at that time. He also did the roasting, and he conceived the idea that we ought to get rid of the moisture in the roasting coffee because it would cook quicker. When the holes clogged up, he put in loose pieces of wire bent at the ends, which shook as the cylinder revolved and kept the holes open. Another thing, he put a hole in the cylinder head and a stopper with a string on it so he could get out a few grains at a time to note the progress of the roasting, but he judged mostly by the smoke. The cooling box was as I have described it, but later we put in a perforated false bottom which let out some chaff and small stones. On our first watering we pulled out the slide and dashed in a bucket of water, then closed the slide and let it revolve outside the furnace. This was hard on the cylinder, so later we used the sprinkling can and put on water sparingly. Once we had a party that wanted to put in a soapstone-lined roaster, and another near us named Saul's Gerber patented a superheated steam roaster, which was shaped like our modern milk bottle. This was covered with asbestos, and worked on a central bearing so it could be depressed for emptying and elevated for filling. It did good work. Mr. Forbes' recollections of the early days of roasting and selling coffee at retail in St. Louis are so illuminating and paint so interesting a picture of the period that they are printed here to illustrate the conditions that prevailed generally at the time when the commercial roasting machine of the United States was being developed into the modern type. He says further, Selling roasted coffee was uphill work, as everyone roasted coffee in the kitchen oven. People were buying, say, at twenty cents. Our asking twenty-five cents roasted called for a lot of explanation about shrinkage, tight cylinders, so the strength and flavor would not get away, etc. While when they roasted a pound in the oven, the flavor scented the whole house, thus losing so much strength to say nothing of the unevenness of their roasts, part raw, part roasted, producing an unpleasant taste. An occasional burned roast at home helped some. They tell of a man who, going out in the back yard and kicking over a clod by accident, uncovered some burned coffee. He called to his wife and wanted an explanation. She acknowledged she had burnt it, and hid it so he would not scold. He said, We had better buy it roasted in the future and avoid such accidents. We roasted in the cellar. We had an elaborately polished reed and man engine in one window two brass hoppered mills in the other, and our boiler was under the sidewalk. We had a mahogany top counter, oil paintings on the wall, and bin fronts of Chinamen, etc., done by the celebrated artist Matt Hastings, now dead. So you see, we started right. The fight we had to introduce roasted coffee was fierce. Our argument was on the saving of fuel, labor, temper, scorched faces, and anything we could think of. We talked only three coffees, Rio, Java, and Mocha. When Santos began to come, it was hard to change them over from the rank Rio flavor to the more mild Santos. The latter, they claimed, did not have the rough taste. They missed it and longed for the wild tang of the Rio. We did not import, but bought in New Orleans and from several local wholesale grocers. No one delivered. Shipments were FOB, St. Louis. Draying and packages were extra. Coffee was not cleaned or stoned, but was sold as it came from the sack. However, we did not use any very low grades then. If anyone complained of the stones hurting their mills, we advised them to buy ground coffee, 
showing how it kept better ground as it was packed tight, whereas the roasted was looser and the air could get through it. It was fully a year or more before we began to sell in quantities to make it profitable. In roasting for others, we got a cent per pound, and after a while that became so much a business it paid all our expenses. We were the first to roast coffee by steam power west of the Mississippi and east of the Rocky Mountains. The tea department helped us to hold out until coffee got its hold on the public. For in those days everyone used tea and insisted on having it good. Price was no object. How different now! Five years later, 1862, J. Nevison, an Englishman, drifted into town and opened at 85 North 4th Street. He got out a very bombastic circular which caused us to put out the one eye and close. Illustration, page 436. Then came a party named Childs, and after him, Hugh Menon, granduncle of the present Menon of Menon and Gregory, and Matt Hunt, all passed over to the great majority. After the Civil War, they multiplied pretty fast, coming and going until now we have 19 roasting establishments in the city. The late Julius J. Shotton also wrote the author as follows concerning the days of the Carter Roaster and of the wholesale coffee roasting business founded by William Shotton in 1862. In the early days, every wholesale grocer was selling coffee. The wholesale grocer controlled 90% of the trade in the country. It did not pay the coffee roaster to have men on the road selling coffee in those days. Such being the case, 75% of the roasting done by the coffee roasters was job roasting, at one cent a pound. In the beginning, there were only two kinds of roasted coffee known to the trade in this section of the country, St. Louis, and of course, one of these brands was Rio, the other, Java. The former was a genuine Rio, but the Java was mostly Jamaica coffee. Roasted coffee then was packed, for city trade, in five and ten pound packages, and this size package seemed to supply the wants of the ordinary grocer for a week. Occasionally, a twenty-five pound package, and in a few instances as much as fifty pounds of one grade, was sold at a time. The class of customers the coffee roasters sold in those days were the smaller merchants. The larger stores, having their ideas as to quality, bought their coffees green. As they had very little sale for the roasted, they would send a half sack, and sometimes a whole sack, to have it roasted. It took a number of years to induce the larger grocers, and even the average grocers, to purchase their coffee already roasted. Coffees were roasted in the old-style, pull-out roaster cylinder. That is to say, it was necessary to stop the roaster and to pull out the cylinder to sample the coffee in order to know when to take the coffee off the fire. When the coffee was ready to take off, the cylinder was pulled out its entire length. It was then turned over, and a slide nine inches wide, running the full length of the cylinder, was opened and the contents were dumped in the cooling box. When the coffee reached the cooling box, it took two men with hose or wooden shovels to stir and turn it until it was properly cooled, there being no cooling arrangements then as we have nowadays. At that time, there were no stoning or separating machines, and as a bag of the ordinary green Jamaica coffee contained from three to five pounds of stones and sticks, it was necessary to hand-pick the coffee after it was roasted. Section 62 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Shireen Hickey. All About Coffee by William Eukers. The Evolution of Coffee Apparatus, Part 2. Chapter 34. The Evolution of Coffee Apparatus how the commercial coffee roaster was developed, the evolution of filtration devices, the old Carter pull-out roaster, trade customs in New York and St. Louis in the 60s and 70s, the story of the evolution of the Burns roaster, how the gas roaster was developed in France, Great Britain, and the United States. 
After Carter, the next United States coffee roaster patent was granted to J.R. Remington of Baltimore on a roaster employing a wheel of buckets to move the green coffee beans singly through a charcoal-heated trough. It never became a commercial success. C4, page 630. In 1847-48, William and Elizabeth Dakin were granted patents in England on an apparatus for cleaning and roasting coffee and for making decoctions. The roaster specification covered a gold, silver, platinum, or alloy-lined roasting cylinder and traversing carriage on an overhead railway to move the roaster in and out of the roasting oven. And the decoction specification covered an arrangement for twisting a cloth bag ground coffee container in a coffee biggin, or applied a screw motion to a disc within a perforated cylinder containing the ground coffee, so as to squeeze the liquid out of the grounds after infusion had taken place. The roaster has survived, but the coffee maker was not so fortunate. The Dakin idea was that coffee was injuriously affected by coming in contact with iron during the roasting process. The roasting cylinder was enclosed in an oven instead of being directly exposed to the furnace heat. The apparatus was provided also with a taster, or sampler, the first of its kind, to enable the operator to examine the roasting berries without stopping the machine. As will be seen by referring to the picture of the model shown, the apparatus was ingenious and not without considerable merit. Dakin and company are still in existence in London, operating a machine very like the original model. In 1848, Thomas John Knollis was granted a patent in England on a perforated roasting cylinder coated with enamel. It is to be noted in passing that this idea of handling the green bean with extreme delicacy, evidently obtained from the French, was never taken seriously in the United States, whose inventors chose to handle it with rough courage. The first English patent on a coffee grinder was granted to Luke Herbert in 1848. In 1849, Apollione Pierre Pruter of Havre was granted an English patent on a coffee roaster mounted on a weighing apparatus to indicate loss of weight in roasting and automatically stop the roasting process. At the same time, he secured an English patent on a vacuum percolator, not unlike Durant's, of 1827. In 1849 also, Thomas R. Wood of Cincinnati was granted a United States patent on a spherical coffee roaster for use on kitchen stoves. It attained considerable popularity among housewives who preferred to do their own roasting. C6, page 630. In 1852, Edward G. secured a patent in England on a coffee roaster fitted with inclined flanges for turning the beans while roasting. C. W. Van Vliet a Fishkill Landing, New York, was granted a United States patent in 1855 on a household coffee mill employing upper breaking and lower grinding cones. He assigned it to Charles Parker of Meriden, Connecticut. In 1860-61, to 61, several United States patents were granted John and Edmund Parker on coffee grinders for home use. In 1862, E.J. Hyde of Philadelphia was granted a United States patent on a combined coffee roaster and stove fitted with a crane on which the roasting cylinder was revolved and swung out horizontally for emptying and refilling. This machine proved to be a commercial success. Benedict Fisher used one in his first roasting plant in New York. It is still being manufactured by the Bramhall Dean Company of New York. In 1864, Jabez Burns of New York was granted a United States patent on the original Burns coffee roaster, the first machine which did not have to be moved away from the fire for discharging the roasted coffee, and one that marked a distinct advance in the manufacture of coffee roasting apparatus. It was a closed iron cylinder set in brickwork. See illustration, page 635. Jabez Burns had been a student of coffee roasting in New York for 20 years before he produced the machine that was to revolutionize the coffee business of the United States. He had brought with him from England a knowledge of the trade in that country, where he first began his business training by selling Java coffee at 14 cents and Sumatra at 11 cents to hotels, boarding houses, and private families. Up to the time of the Civil War, the contrivances employed for roasting coffee in every case necessitated the removal of the roasting apparatus, whether pan, 
globe, or cylinder from the fire. The process of causing coffee to discharge from the end of the roasting cylinder at the pleasure of the operator while the cylinder was still in motion was new, and the double set of flanges to produce this effect and at the same time during the process of roasting to keep the coffee equally distributed from end to end of the cylinder was new. Someone suggested this last improvement was simply an Archimedean screw placed in a cylinder, but Mr. Burns replied, it is a double screw, a thing never suggested by the Archimedean screw. It is, in fact, a double right and left auger, one within the other, firmly secured together and also to the shell or cylinder, and when the cylinder revolves, the desired result is obtained, the idea being entirely original. Mr. Burns had watched the development of the coffee business from the time when the preparation of coffee was largely confined to the home where the approved roasting implements were hot stones or tiles, iron plates, skillets, and frying pans. Some of these were still in use 20 years after he produced his first machine, and he often said that coffee evenly roasted by such methods was just as good as if done by the best mechanical device ever invented. He also said, coffee can be roasted in very simple machinery. Some of the best we ever saw was done in a corn popper. Patent portable roasters are almost as numerous as rat traps or churns. He early saw the practice of domestic roasting falling into disuse, as it was becoming possible to supply the consumer with roasted coffee for only a trifle more than in the green state, with all the labor and annoyance of roasting done away with, a talking point that John Arbuckle was quick to seize upon in his first Ariosa advertising. In almost every town of any size, there were concerns engaged in the roasting business. Within a few years, Burns machines were placed in all the principal roasting centers. Pupke and Reed in New York, Flint, Evans and Company, and James H. Forbes in St. Louis, Arbuckles and Company in Pittsburgh, the Weichel and Smith Spice Company in Philadelphia, Theodore F. Johnson and Company in Newark, Evans and Walker in Detroit, W. and J. G. Flint in Milwaukee, and Parker and Harrison in Cincinnati were among his first customers. It is said that in 1845 there were facilities in and around New York to roast as much coffee as was then consumed in Great Britain. Steam power was being extensively used, and the roasting was done here for a large part of the country. The habit was to buy roasted coffee from the coffee and spice mills by the bag or larger quantity for country consumption and the grocers and small tea stores for local consumption bought from 25 pounds upward at a time. This method cheapened the roasting of coffee to half a cent a pound, and then good profits could be made, for everything was cheap in those days. Even at that, it would have been impossible for each tea dealer to have roasted his own coffee for several times the amount, so the practice was generally adhered to all over the country. Jabez Burns wrote in 1874, it is preposterous to suppose that household roasting will be continued long in any part of this country, if coffee properly prepared can be had. This is demonstrated by the remarkable advances made in Pittsburgh and other places, where only a few years ago the sales were chiefly in green coffee. Now the amount roasted in Pittsburgh alone by those who make a business of it exceeds the entire consumption of coffee any kind in the United States fifty years ago. It will never pay for small stores to roast, if the large manufactories will do the work well, and if they will not, small dealers will add proper machinery and will eventually become strong, competing dealers. By doing the work with proper care, they will not only secure a reputation with large sales for themselves, but will command the roasting for other parties. Until the Burns Roaster appeared, coffee roasters were usually cylinders that revolved upon an axis. The other devices that were tried were not successful. Jabez Burns thus describes the first roaster he ever saw at Hull, England. It consisted of a furnace open at the top and a perforated cylinder with a slide door. The axis or shaft of the cylinder had bearings on a frame which passed outside the furnace while the cylinder went down into the fire pit the top of which could be covered over. In this position, it could be turned by means of a crank on the end of a shaft. The only means of testing was by the escape of the steam or aroma, whichever predominated, 
passing out through the perforations at the top. But so expert was the operator and so quick to detect the aroma that he seldom had to return the cylinder to the fire to produce a satisfactory roast. This man roasted 50 pounds or less in a batch for a number of retail stores. Globes, consisting of two hemispheres made of cast iron and so arranged that they opened to fill and discharge, but operated substantially as above, only with the method of lowering into the fire changed somewhat, I have seen in use in Scotland in 1840. They were called French roasters. In this country, a few years ago, the use of the long sheet iron cylinder was almost universal, varying only in the method of placing the cylinder over the fire, some sideways on a track, others endwise, sliding on a long shaft or by turning on a crane, in either case causing considerable labor and loss of time, which often resulted in the hands of the inexperienced and more or less spoiling the batch of coffee. From his expert knowledge of coffee and coffee roasting problems, Jabez Burns quickly rose to a commanding position in the industry. He was a trade teacher and a trade builder. He had very definite ideas on roasting. He said, The object of roasting is not attained until all the moisture, water of vegetation, is driven off, roast properly, uniformly and sufficiently, and you will get all the aroma there is in the bean. Coffees of various kinds cannot be roasted to a uniform color. Some will be of a light shade when sufficiently roasted, while others will have to be roasted dark to develop the aroma. Therefore, appearance alone is not a proper test. Aroma-saving devices have had their day. Coffee is of no use unless the aroma is fully developed, and the more it is developed by roasting, the better it is. What passes off in the roasting process cannot be saved, and is so small that if all of it in the country could be collected and freed of all foreign matter, it would not weigh an ounce. Roast coffee over a slow fire, so that it will be an hour before it has the color of roasted coffee, and, in contrast, produce in another batch of like quantity the same color in thirty minutes, and it will be found for all intended purposes, either to grind, sell, or drink, that the latter will be, beyond all comparison, the best. Coffee should be roasted uniform and as quickly as possible. Only it must not be scorched or spotted, otherwise it will have a bitter burned taste. If roasted properly, it will very considerably increase its bulk and will be plump, swelled out and crisp, easily crushed in the hand or between the fingers. In his Spice Mill Companion, published in 1879, J. Bez Burns said further in regard to roasting, All coffees do not roast alike. Some will be a bright light color when done, and others will be dark before done. There are two infallible rules which, if properly appreciated and tried, will prove to be practically useful. One is, when the aroma is sufficiently developed to produce a sharp, cutting, but aromatic sensation in the nose. Those who practice that way do not need to see the roast. The other rule is that when a berry is broken, it is crisp and uniform in color inside and out. Those who are accustomed to this method may be good coffee roasters, albeit they may not have any nose at all. But we must state in this connection that a man who has no smell and is color blind is not a fit candidate for the coffee roasting profession, and moreover, we affirm that any person who cannot roast coffee, so far as judgment is concerned, after a few trials will never make a good operator. In 1867, Jabez Burns was granted a United States patent on an improved coffee, cooler, mixer, and grinding mill, or granulator. Another granulator patent was issued to him in 1872. Mr. Burns had also given the subject of cooling coffees considerable study and his cooler was the result. He argued that it was necessary to cool quickly. Before his day, various methods had been employed, such as placing the coffee in revolving drums covered with wire cloth. Sometimes a draft of cold air was applied to the cooling drums, and the dirt and chaff blown through the wire cloth. It was also customary in wholesale establishments to blow cold air up through a perforated bottom, 
and this had been found effective when properly applied. The Burns idea was to cool by means of suction, causing a downward draft through the coffee and wire cloth bottomed box, which was found to be more uniform and efficient for cooling purposes as well as in controlling smoke, heat, and dust, which by this means could be blown out of the roasting room by any convenient outlet. On the subject of grinding, likewise Mr. Burns had reached some definite conclusions. The French and English lap and wall mills, the English steel mills, and the swift mills were all used in the United States. Tremners, the Enterprise, and others, to be mentioned later in chronological order, were extending their use in a retail way, but Jabez Burns confined his attention to a practicable mill for wholesale grinding establishments. For manufacturing purposes, burstone mills were for many years exclusively employed, especially one first known as the Prentice and Page, and later as the Page Mill. There was a time when all the coffee establishments in New York sent their coffee to Prentice and Page to be ground. Some of the places roasted by hand, others by horsepower, and if by steam, it was limited, and they did not have enough to spare for grinding. With the march of improvement, burstone mills went into the discard. The difficulty lay in finding men experienced in stone dressing to run them, and the demand grew for a better style of grinding than could be done in a mill out of face and balance. This demand was met in an altogether different style of machine, which for twenty-five years was well known as the barber mill. It was for improvements on this mill that Jabez Burns, in 1867, 1872, and 1874, obtained his granulator patents. The mill comprised cutters in the form of an iron roller running in near contact with a concave, also of iron, and a revolving cylinder provided with sieves or screens that received the ground material, rolled it over the wire surface, sifting out the fine, and discharging the course automatically into the cutter to be again manipulated until it was fine enough to pass through the meshes of the screen. Jabez Burns patented an improved form of his roaster in 1881 and a sample coffee roaster in 1883 before he died in 1888, and since that time his sons, who continue the business, have perfected a number of improvements and brought out new machines which will be referred to in chronological order. James H. Nason of Franklin, Mass., was granted a United States patent in 1865 on a percolator with fluid joints. P. H. Vanderwaide of Philadelphia was granted United States patents in 1866 on a percolator and a continuous coffee filtering machine. Riparlier was granted a French patent on a pocket coffee-making device in 1867. In later years, his invention became very popular among French coffee drinkers. It was one of the early practicable forms of double-glass globe filtration devices. E.B. Manning of Middletown, Connecticut was granted his first patent on a tea and coffee pot in 1868. Others followed in 1870 and 1876. In the latter year, John Bauman brought out the valve-type percolator, which subsequently attained great favor in American households. Thomas Smith and Son, Elkington and Company Limited, successors, began to manufacture at Glasgow, Scotland, about 1870, the Napierian vacuum coffee machine, which had been invented in 1840, but never patented by Robert Napier of the celebrated firm of Clyde Shipbuilders. This machine makes coffee by distillation and filtration. It employs a metal globe and a brewer from which the coffee is siphoned over into the globe through a tube, around the strainer end of which, as it rests in the coffee liquid in the brewer, there is tied a filter cloth. It is still being manufactured by Elkington and Company. Napier's Vacuum Machine, 1840 Thomas Page, a New York millwright, began the manufacture of a pull-out coffee roaster similar to the old Carter machine in 1868. Later, Chris Abiel, who was foreman in the Page shop, succeeded to the business, and in 1882 he was granted a United States patent 
on an improvement on a coffee roaster similar to the original Burns machine. The patent had then expired, which he marketed under the name of Knickerbocker. German Coffee Machinery The Germans first began to show an active interest in coffee machinery in 1860. In that year, Alexius von Gulpen of Emmerich produced a green coffee grater, and later, 1868, in partnership with J. H. Lensing and Theodore von Gimborn, began the manufacture of coffee roasting machines. From this start, there developed in Emmerich quite an industry in coffee machinery building. In 1870, Alexius von Gulpen introduced to the German trade a globular coffee roaster employing wood and coke as fuel and having perforations and an exhauster. Van Gulpen and von Gimborn are the two names most often met with in the development of German coffee roasting machinery. The first recorded German patent on a coffee roaster was issued to G. Tuberman's son in 1877 for a coffee burner with vertically adjusted stirring works. German patents were issued in 1878 to R. Mulberg of Tausche for coffee roasters with movable partitions and screw-shaped declining walls. Six roaster patents were issued to other inventors in 1878-79. to Peter Pearson of Manchester took out a German patent on a coffee roasting apparatus in 1880. Fleury and Barker of London were granted a coffee roaster patent in Germany in 1881. After 1870, Van Gulpen devoted himself to the cylinder type of roaster on which he obtained several patents. The partnership between Mr. Van Gulpen, Lensing, and von Gimborn was dissolved in 1906. They were succeeded by the Emmericher Maschinenfabrik und Eisengießerei and Van Gulpen and Company. Van Gulpen died in 1920. Among his inventions were a circular air fan to supply fresh air to the beans while roasting, a fire dampening device, roasting and cooling exhausters, and a withdrawable mixer remaining inside the cylinder during the roasting process, but designed to be withdrawn at the end, discharging the contents with a jerk into a circular cooler. These improvements are featured in von Gulpen and Company's latest Meteor machine. They make also the Typhoon and Comet machines and a line of globular roasters. A dozen coffee roaster patents were issued in Germany in 1880 to 82. Among them was one to the Emmerich machine factory and iron foundry. Von Gulpen, Lensing, and von Gimborn, Emmerich in 1882. Numerous coffee cooling, coffee grinding, and coffee making devices were patented in Germany from 1877 to 1885. Among them, Neustadt's coffee extract machine in 1882, safety attachments, rapid filters, Vienna coffee makers, etc. The first Vienna coffee maker seems to have been patented in Germany in 1879. The Emmerich Machine Factory and Iron Foundry acquired certain Danish and Austrian coffee roaster patents in 1881, and in 1892 it was granted a German patent on a ball roaster. In the 80s, this concern began the manufacture of a closed ball, or globular, roaster with gas heater attachment. It acquired, in 1889, the rights for Germany to manufacture gas roasters under the Dutch Henneman Patents of 1888. In 1892, Theodore von Gimborn was granted French and English patents on a coffee roaster employing a naked gas flame in a rotary cylinder. In 1897, the Emmericher concern was granted a German patent on an automatic circular tipping cooler with power drive. Today, this factory features the Probat and Perfect roasters, but manufactures a general line of cylinder and ball machines for coal, coke, and gas. Among others engaged in the manufacture of coffee machines in Germany are G. W. Barth, Ludwigsburg, and Ferd Gottot Mulheim on Ruhr. The latter manufactures a coke or gas heated quick roaster known as the Ideal Rapid and a smaller hand power machine of the same type called Favor. In 1869, Elie Moneuse and L. Du Parquet of New York were granted three United States patents on a coffee pot or urn 
made of sheet copper and lined with pure sheet block tin. These patents were the foundation of the successful coffee urn business, afterward built up under the name of the Duparquet, Huot, and Manoeuvres Company. Thomas Smith and Son, Elkington and Company Limited, successors, began in 1870 the manufacture of the Napierian coffee-making machine at Glasgow, Scotland. This was a device for making coffee by distillation, employing a metal globe siphon and brewer with filter cloth. The principle was subsequently used in the Napier List steam coffee machine for ships and institutions, patented in England in 1891. John Gulick Baker of Philadelphia, one of the founders of the Enterprise Manufacturing Company of Pennsylvania, was granted a United States patent in 1870 on a coffee grinder introduced to the trade as the Enterprise Champion No. 1 Store Mill. Another Baker patent was granted in 1873, and this became known as the Enterprise Champion Globe No. 0. These mills were the pioneer machines for store use. In 1870, Delphine, sister of Marurme, France, was granted a French patent on a tubular coffee roaster which turned over a flame. In the 60s and 70s, French inventors became quite active on coffee roaster improvements. Many patents were granted, and quite a few were for practical, small-capacity machines that have survived and are in use today in France and on the continent. Some supplied inspiration for inventors in neighboring countries. Among the more notable names, mention should be made of Martin of San Quentin, who produced a sheet iron cylinder roaster with interior gatherer in 1860, Marchand of Paris, fan roaster with movable firebox, 1866 and 1869, Lausanne, Paris, rocking system of roasting coffee in a round stove, 1873, Idol's glass sphere, Lyon, 1874, and Marchand and Ignette, Paris, 1877, a ball coffee roaster. Evolution of the gas roaster. According to the patent records, Ruhr of Marseille appears to have produced the original gas coffee roaster in 1877. The evolution of the gas roasting machine was as follows. In 1879, H. Falder of Stockport, England, obtained an English patent on an external air blast burner applied to a cylinder gas machine, which is still being manufactured by the Grocers, Engineering, and Whitney Limited of London. Fleury and Barker of London followed with another English gas machine in 1880, the heat being supplied from gas jets over the roasting cylinder. In 1881, Peter Pearson of Manchester produced a gas roaster which consisted of a wire gauze cylinder revolving under a metal plate heated by gas. Beeston Tupholm of London was granted an English patent in 1887 on a direct flame gas roaster, which he assigned to Joseph Baker and Sons. Carol F. Henneman, The Hague, Netherlands, took out his first patent on the Henneman Direct Flame Gas Roaster in Spain in 1888, and the following year he obtained patents in Belgium, France, and England. His United States patents were granted in 1893-95. to 95. Postulart secured a patent in France for a gas coffee roaster in 1888. The Germans also began, in the 80s, to take the quick gas coffee roaster seriously. In 1889, Carl Alexander Otto of Dresden secured a German patent on a spiral tubular machine to roast coffee in three and a half minutes. It was first manufactured and sold by Max Thermer of Dresden in 1891 to 93. The subject of quick roasting has greatly agitated German and French coffee men. Otto found that coffee roasted in small quantities, say 50 grams, on a sample roaster produced a finer flavor and aroma than that roasted in the big machines. He set out to produce a machine that would roast continuous, small quantities in the shortest time. He built the first commercial machine under his patent in 1893. It was shown at the International Food Exhibition in Dresden in 1894. The latest type, manufactured by Max Thermer, Dresden, in which firm Otto is a partner, has a spiral five meters long, 
and an hourly production of about 450 pounds. The Thermer machine, as it is called, has been sold to the trade since 1914. Quick roasting is gone in for quite extensively in Germany, even in the big trade roasting plants, where machines to roast in 10 to 17 minutes are common. Natural, slow cooling is most necessary with quick roasting, according to Thermer. On the other hand, A. Moton of Paris, who also manufactures a line of quick gas roasting machines, called Magic, argues that quick cooling is essential after quick roasting. Three of the Moton machines are illustrated on pages 642 and 644. Other quick roasting machines of German make are the Combinator, Tornado, and Record. In a lecture before the Society of Medical Officers of Health, London, October 24, 1912, William Lawton demonstrated to the satisfaction of his audience that coffee could be roasted in three minutes using a perforated gas roaster of his own invention. The first direct flame gas coffee roaster in America was installed in the plant of the Potter Parlin Company, New York, by F.T. Holmes in 1893. This was Tupholm's machine, patented in England in 1887 and in the United States in 1896-97. to The Potter Parlin Company subsequently placed the Tupholm machines throughout the United States on a daily rental basis, limiting its leases to one firm in a city, having obtained the exclusive American rights from the Waygood Tupholm Company, now the Grocers Engineering and Whitney Limited. Natural gas was first used in the United States as fuel for roasting coffee in 1896, when it was introduced under coal roasting cylinders in Pennsylvania and Indiana by improvised gas burners. Edwin Crawley and W.T. Johnston, Newport, Kentucky, assigners to the Potter Parlin Company, New York, were granted four United States patents on gas coffee roasting machines. In 1897, a special gas burner, not to be confused with a direct flame machine, was first attached to a regular Burns roaster in the United States and was made the basis of application for a patent. In 1897-99, to David B. Fraser of New York began to market in the United States a central heated gas fuel machine with an inner wire cloth cylinder to keep the coffee from dropping into the flame. Developed under United States patents granted to Carl H. During of Hoboken in 1897 and to D.B. Fraser in 1899. M.F. Hamsley of Brooklyn was granted a United States patent on an improved direct flame gas roaster in 1898. L.S.M. Potter, New York, was granted in 1899 a United States patent on an improved direct flame gas roaster in which the flame was spread over a large area to avoid scorching and to ensure a more thorough and uniform roast. In the top home machine, the gas flame entered at one end and the smoke and flame went out through a stack on top. In the Potter machine, the stack was put on the end opposite the gas intake, with a fan to pull the flame all the way through. The Burns Direct Flame Gas Roaster with patented swing gate head for feeding and discharging was introduced to the trade in 1900. The Burns Gas Sample Roaster followed. In 1901, Joseph Lambert of Marshall, Michigan introduced to the trade one of the earliest indirect gas roasting machines. In 1901, also, T.C. Moorwood of Brentford, England, was granted an English patent on a gas roaster fitted with a sliding burner and a removable sampling tube. This machine is now being made by the Grocers Engineering and Whitney Limited. In the same year, 1901, F.T. Holmes, formerly with the Potter Parlin Company, joined the Huntley Manufacturing Company, Silver Creek, New York, which then began to build the Monitor Direct Flame Gas Coffee Roaster. Mr. Holmes still further improved the Tupholm idea by putting gas burners in both ends of the roasting cylinder, with the pipes bent down so as to cause the gas flame to go first to the bottom and then up to the stack on top. This improvement was never patented. The Henneman Direct Flame Gas Roaster was introduced to the United States trade in 1905 by C.A. Cross & Company, Wholesale Grocers of Fitchburg, Mass., it was marketed here seven years, but was never a great success. In 1906, 
F.T. Holmes was granted a United States patent on a coffee roaster which he assigned to the Huntley Manufacturing Company. J.C. Prims of Battle Creek, Michigan, was granted a United States patent in 1908 on a corrugated cylinder improvement for a gas and coal roaster designed for retail stores. The A.J. Deere Company, Hornell, New York, acquired this machine in 1909 and began to market it as the Royal Coffee Roaster. An improvement patented in 1915 by J.C. Prims was assigned to the A.J. Deere Company. In 1915, and again in 1919, Jabez Burns & Sons, New York, patented their Jubilee Roaster, an inner heated machine in which the gas is burned inside a revolving cylinder in a combustion chamber protected from direct coffee contact. The heat is deflected downward and then passes upward through the coffee. In 1919, William Fullard, died 1921, of Philadelphia, was granted a United States patent on a heated fresh air system roaster in which the fresh air is forced by an electric fan through a pipe to a set of coils over gas, coal, or oil flame. At the top of the coils is a manifold, the hot air being forced through small holes to circulate in and around a regulation perforated roasting cylinder. The vapors and spent air are then drawn into an overhead exhaust pipe that connects with a pipe provided with a fresh air intake, the idea being to return them to the roasting cylinder after being mixed with fresh air and heated in the coils as before. This patent has not been successfully marketed at the time of writing. The purpose is to roast by heated air not mixed with any furnace gases. Whether this can be done with sufficient fuel economy and whether coffee thus roasted would have any greater value are questions that are raised by the coffee experts. Section 63 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All About Coffee by William Eukers. The Evolution of Coffee Apparatus, Part 3. Coffee Grinding and Coffee Making Chronology To return to our coffee grinding and coffee making chronology, it is to be noted that in 1875-76-78, to 76 to 78, Turner Strobridge of New Brighton, PA, was granted three United States patents on a box coffee mill, first made by Logan and Strobridge, later the Logan and Strobridge Iron Company, the latter being succeeded by the Wrightsville Hardware Co. in 1906. In 1878, a United States patent was issued to Rodolphus L. Webb, a signer to Landers, Frary, and Clark, New Britain Con, on an improved box coffee grinder for home use. In 1878 and in 1880, United States patents were issued to John C. Dell of Philadelphia on a store coffee mill. In 1879 and in 1880, United States patents were issued to Orson W. Stowe of the Peck, Stowe, and Wilcox Co., Southington Con, on a household coffee mill. In 1879, Charles Halstead of New York was granted the first United States patent on a metal coffee pot having a china interior. It was an infuser for home use. In 1880, coffee pots with tops having muslin bottoms for clarifying and straining were first made in the United States by the Duparquet, Huo, and Manu Co. of New York. The name Hungerford first appears in the United States Patent Records in 1880-81 to in connection with patents granted to G.W. and G.S. Hungerford on machines for cleaning, scouring, and polishing coffee. In 1882, the Hungerfords, father and son, bought out a roaster. This machine and the one patented by Chris Abel of New York, already referred to, were constructions resulting from the expiration of the original Burns patent of 1864. In 1881, Jabez Burns patented the improved Burns Roaster, comprising a turnover front head serving for both feeding and discharging. Additional United States coffee roaster patents were issued to G.W. Hungerford in 1887-89. to In the latter year, David Fraser, who came to the United States from Glasgow in 1886, established the Hungerford Co., succeeding the business of the Hungerfords, and later being granted certain United States patents already mentioned. In 1910, the Hungerford Co. business was discontinued in New York. 
and David B. Fraser moved to Jersey City, where he continued to operate as Fraser Manufacturing Co. This business was discontinued in 1918. Chris Abiel was an active competitor of the Hungerfords and of the Fraser Manufacturing Co., and his Knickerbocker roaster was sold over a wide territory. He died in 1910, and his son-in-law, Gottfried Bay, succeeded to the business. In 1881, the Morgan brothers, Edgar H. and Charles, began the manufacture of household coffee mills, the business being acquired in 1885 by the Arcade Manufacturing Co. of Freeport, Illinois. The latter concern brought out the first pound coffee mill in 1889. Its mills became very popular in the United States. In 1900, Charles Morgan was granted a United States patent on a glass jar coffee mill with removable glass measuring cup. In 1881, Harvey Ricker of Brooklyn, later of Minneapolis, introduced to the trade in the United States a minute coffee pot and urn known as the Boss, the name being subsequently changed to Minute. He improved and patented the device in 1901 as a half-minute coffee pot. It is a filtration device employing a cotton sack with a thickened bottom. In 1882, Chris Abiel of New York patented an improvement on the old-style Burns roaster with openings cut in the front plate. It was known as the Knickerbocker. As already noted, the machine was a competitor of the Hungerford machine, patented the same year. In 1882, a German patent was granted to Emil Neustadt of Berlin on one of the earliest coffee extract machines. In 1883, Jabez Burns was granted a United States patent on his improved sample coffee roaster. In 1884, the Star Coffee Pot, later known as the Marion Harland, was introduced to the trade. It employed a wire gauze drip device called a filter, which was fitted to a metal pot it was extensively advertised and attained considerable popularity. The same year, Finley Acker, Philadelphia, brought out an improved coffee pot for family trade. Later, he produced his Mo Kofi pot and an individual porcelain drip pot for testing table use. In 1885, F.A. Cachois, New York, brought out an improved porcelain lined urn. In 1887 to 88, the Etruscan Coffee Pot was invented and put on the market by the Etruscan Coffee Pot Co. of Philadelphia. It employed a muslin cylinder with metal ends and a mechanism for combining agitation, distillation, and infusion. It was not unlike the Dakin device of 1848, previously mentioned. In 1890, A. Mutant Barladuc, France, began to manufacture a line of coffee roasting machinery which included vertical ball and cylinder machines using wood, coal, coke, or gas for fuel. His best-known makes are Magic and Sirocco. Before 1895, the commercial roaster was little used in France. Since then, the industry has developed, but without displacing the smaller roaster for family use. Ball roasters are popular with shopkeepers, especially the variety manufactured by the Etablissement Luzon à Paris and known as Aromatic, being equipped with electric motors. This firm builds also a larger machine known as Modern. Other makes of roasters that have attained prominence in France are the Lambert, equipped with a steam condenser, Van den Broeks, having the roasting cylinder lined with wire gauze, and Resin's machine for wholesale plants. The French led off with glass cylinder roasters for home use in the early 70s. They are still popular. One of the developments of the last decade was known as the Bijou, and was operated by Clockwork. A similar automatic machine, made of glass, was manufactured and sold in New York in 1908 under the name of the Home Roaster. As late as 1914, an American inventor produced a home roaster for use in a stove hole. This device had a stirrer in the cover to be rotated by hand. A similar device was sold in 1917 under the name Savo. Home roasting, however, has become a lost art in America. In 1897, Joseph Lambert of Vermont began the manufacture and sale in Battle Creek, Michigan of the Lambert self-contained coffee roaster without the brick setting then required for coffee roasting machines. In 1900, he was joined by A.P. Groens. In 1901, the Lambert Food and Machinery Co. was organized. In 1904, the company was reorganized. Since then, many improvements have been made under Mr. Groen's direction. The Lambert Gas Roaster, one of the first machines employing gas as fuel for indirect roasting, dates back to 1901, as previously mentioned. 
The Economic Roaster is Mr. Groen's latest development for coal or coke fuel. It is a compact, self-contained equipment operating in connection with a new type rotary cooler. He has also recently bought out a gas-fired, electrically operated 600-pound Victory Roaster and a 50-pound miniature coffee roasting plant designed for retail stores. In 1897, the Enterprise Manufacturing Co. of Pennsylvania was the first to regularly employ electric motors for driving commercial coffee mills by means of belt and pulley attachments. In 1898, the Hobart Manufacturing Co. of Troy, Ohio, introduced to the trade another early coffee grinder connected with an electric motor and driven by belt and pulley attachment. In 1900, the first gear-driven electric coffee grinder was put on the market by the Enterprise Manufacturing Co. of Pennsylvania. In 1902, the Coles Manufacturing Co. and Henry Tromner of Pennsylvania began the manufacture and sale of gear-driven electric coffee grinders. In 1905, the A.J. Deere Co., Buffalo, New York, began to sell its Royal Electric coffee mills direct to dealers on the installment plan, revolutionizing the former practice of selling coffee mills through hardware jobbers. In 1905, H.L. Johnston was granted a United States patent on a coffee mill. He assigned the patent to the Hobart Manufacturing Co. In 1900, Charles Lewis was granted a United States patent on an improved reversible filtration coffee pot known as the Kin He. This pot has since been further improved, and the patent rights sold in several foreign countries. It employs a filter cloth in place of the metal or china strainer used in the French drip pot. In 1901, Landers, Freire, and Clark's improved universal percolator was patented in the United States. This pot has proved to be one of the most popular percolators on the American market. This firm brought out the Universal Cafenora, a double glass filtration device, in 1916. It is covered by design and structural patents issued in 1916 and 1917. In 1900, the Burns Swingate sample roasting outfit was patented in the United States. In 1901, Robert Burns of New York was granted two United States patents on a coffee roaster and cooler. In 1901, Friedrich Kuchelmeister, Brooks, Austria-Hungary, was granted a United States patent on a coffee roaster having a double-walled drum, the inner being of wire gauze, and the outer of solid iron, designed to prevent scorching of the beans. In 1902, W.M. Still and Sons, London, were granted an English patent on a steam coffee-making machine employing 12 ounces of coffee to the gallon. In 1902, T.K. Baker of Minneapolis was granted two United States patents on a cloth filter coffee-making device. In 1903, A.E. Bronson Jr., a signer to the Bronson Walton Company, Cleveland, Ohio, was granted a United States patent on a coffee mill. In 1903, John Arbuckle was granted a United States patent on a coffee roasting apparatus employing a fan to force the hot fire gases into the roasting cylinder. From this was developed the Jumbo Roaster, now used in the Arbuckle plant, which roasts 10,000 pounds an hour. Electric Coffee Roasting In 1903, George C. Lester of New York was granted a United States patent on an electric coffee roaster, that is, a machine to roast by electric heat. There were two cylinders, the inner being of wire gauze, and the outer of copper and asbestos. Between the two, four electric heaters were placed. There was demonstrated in Germany, in 1906, an electric coffee roaster employing a number of resistance coils consisting of strips of crep metal 2 and one half millimeter thick, 5 millimeter broad, and 13 and one half millimeter long wound on porcelain tubes which transmitted the heat to the air within the roasting cylinder. Analysis showed that coffee electrically roasted contained more substances insoluble in water than that roasted by coke, as well as considerably more material soluble in ether. This machine was invented by Captain Carl Mogling about 1900. Another electric fuel machine patent was granted in the United States to Robert H. Talbot of Baltimore in 1911. This machine had the electric heater in the center of the roasting cylinder. An electrically heated machine called Ben Franklin was demonstrated in New York in 1918. In 1919, Everett T. Short, Dallas, Texas, was granted a United States patent on an electric roaster. Up to the present writing, no great progress has been made in the United States with the roasting of coffee by electric heat. 
The Phoenix Electrical Heating Co. manufactured and the Uno Company LTD of London marketed an electrically heated roaster as far back as 1909. The machine was not altogether satisfactory, even to the makers, and the Uno Company is now experimenting with a new type of electric roaster which it expects will remedy the defects of the early machine. The 1909 roaster was made of two concentric cylinders revolving around a set of fixed heating elements, consisting of a series of spiral wires held in position on fireproof clay insulators, these wires being assembled, insulated, and brought out through the fixed sensor to a terminal, or a set of terminals, at one end. In this way, no contact brushes or rings were needed. The machine had a sampling device at one end which threw out a few berries each time it was operated. It was not possible to return these sample berries. Such an arrangement appeared necessary, however, unless one was prepared to have the heating element on the outside of the machine and to pick up the current by means of rings or brushes. When the operator became accustomed to the coffee he was roasting, this was not a matter of great moment, because in England, at least, the average coffee roaster does not require a testing sample unless he is about ready to turn out and to cool the corrosive. The Uno machine had a capacity of 7 pounds, and the time occupied in roasting was from 8 to 10 minutes, depending on whether the roaster had been freshly switched on or had been running for a few minutes. The wattage was 5,520. The consumption per 100 weight was under 13 units. The makers gave, as the most economical pressure on which to work, 220 to 240 volts. The machine was operated for 18 months in the show window of a London retail grocer. In 1921, a United States patent was granted to Mark T. Seymour Stowe, New York, on an electric coffee and peanut roaster, which has the heating element embedded in a cement-lined cylinder that contains a roasting cage. In 1921, Fred J. Kuhlmer and Ralph J. Quell of Burlington, Iowa, were granted a United States patent on a small household coffee roaster electrically equipped and roasting by electric heat. Other Machinery Patents In 1903, Luigi Giacomini of Florence, Italy, was granted a United States patent on a process for roasting coffee. In 1905, A.A. A. Warner, a signer to Landers, Frary, and Clark, New Britain Con, was granted two United States patents on a coffee mill. In 1906, Ludwig Schmidt, a signer to the S. Mueller Mill Furnishing Co., St. Louis, was granted a United States patent on a coffee roaster. This company and the Reuter Jones Manufacturing Co., also of St. Louis, were making machines similar to the original Burns model. The Reuter Jones Manufacturing Co., in 1910, brought out a self-contained gas roaster called the St. Louis Jr. In 1913, at a receiver's sale, A.P. Groens of the Lambert Machine Co. acquired all the machinery and patent rights of the Reuter Jones Manufacturing Company. In 1904, J.W. Chapman and G.W. Kuman, assigners to Manning, Bowman & Co., Meriden Con were granted a United States patent on a coffee or teapot. The same year, George E. Savage and G. W. Hope were granted two United States patents on coffee or teapots, also assigned to Manning, Bowman & Co. In 1904, Sigmund Sternau, J. P. Stepp, and L. Strasburger, assigners to S. Sternau & Co., New York, were granted a United States patent on a percolator. Six others were granted to Charles Nelson and assigned to S. Sternow & Co. in 1912 and 1913 for a percolator, the manufacture and sale of which were discontinued in 1915. In 1905, a celebrated case was decided in Kansas City involving litigation between William E. Baker of Baker & Co. Minneapolis and the F. A. Duncombe Manufacturing Co. of St. Joseph, Missouri over Mr. Baker's patent rights and a machine to produce steel-cut coffee. The suit was brought in 1903, and Mr. Baker contended that his patent gave him the exclusive right to the uniformity of granules by means of the sharply dressed mechanism, and by the use of a fan for blowing away the silver skins produced by his machine, while the defendant said he obtained the same result by grating the granules through screens or sieves. The defense was that Mr. Baker's process was not a discovery, because... Grinding coffee was as old as the world's knowledge, and winnowing the chaff was equally ancient. The lower court dismissed the bill because the patents sued upon are devoid of patentable invention, and the United States Court of Appeals confirmed the decision. 
In 1905, Frederick A. Cachua of New York brought out his private estate coffee maker, a clever combination of the French drip and filter processes, employing a thin layer of Japanese paper as a filtering agent. The same year, Finley Acker of Philadelphia was granted a United States patent on a percolator employing two cylinders perforated on the sides with a sheet of percolator paper placed between them to act as a filtering medium. In 1906, George Savage and J.W. Chapman, assigners to Manning, Bowman & Co. of Meriden Con, were granted a United States patent on a coffee percolator. In 1906, Alonzo A. Warner, a signer to Landers, Frary, and Clark, New Britain Con, was granted a United States patent on a coffee percolator. In 1906, H.D. Kelly, Kansas City, was granted a United States patent on the Kellum automatic coffee urn, employing a coffee extractor in which ground coffee is continually agitated before percolation by a vacuum process. Sixteen patents followed. In 1906, Desiderio Pavoni of Milan, Italy, was granted a patent in Italy for an improvement on the Bezzera system for preparing and serving coffee as a rapid infusion of a single cup, first introduced in 1903 to 1904. It is known as the ideal urn, and makes 150 cups per hour. Among other Italian rapid coffee-making machines which, with this one, have attained considerable prominence in Europe and South America, Mention should be made of La Victoria Arduino, made by Pierre Tessio Arduino of Turin, Italy, introduced in 1909, that makes 1,000 cups per hour. It was patented in the United States in 1920. There are, also, La Italiana Sovereign Filter Machine, made by Bossi Vernetti and Bartolini Turin, and Jose Barros Express, Buenos Aires, making 600 cups an hour. In 1908, A.E. White, Chicago, was granted a United States patent on a coffee urn. He assigned it to the James Heakin Co. of Cincinnati. In 1908, I.D. Reichemer, Chicago, introduced his tricolator to the trade and the consumer. This is an aluminum device to fit any coffee pot, combining French drip and filtration ideas with Japanese paper as the filtration medium. In 1908, an improved type of Burns roaster was patented in the United States. The improvement consisted of an open perforated cylinder with flexible back head and balanced front bearings. The following year, the Burns Tilting Sample Roaster for gas or electric heating units was patented. In 1909, Frederick A. Cachua of New York was granted a United States patent on a coffee urn fitted with a centrifugal pump for re-pouring. In 1909, C.F. Blanc of St. Louis was granted two United States patents on a China coffee pot with a cloth filter, the sides tightly and the bottom loosely woven. In 1911, Edward Aborn of New York was granted a United States patent on his make-right coffee filter device. This was later incorporated with improvements in a true brew coffee pot, on which he was granted another patent in 1920. In 1912, John E. King of Detroit was granted a United States patent on an improved coffee percolator for restaurants, employing a sheet of filter paper on a ring in a metal basket, the ring to be removed once the filter paper was in position on the perforated bottom plate of the percolator basket. In 1913, F.F. Ware, Los Angeles, perfected a coffee-making device in which a metal perforated clamp was employed to apply a filter paper to the underside of an English earthenware adaptation of the French drip pot. In 1912, William Lawton demonstrated in London a gas coffee roaster of his own invention, by means of which he roasted coffee in suspension to a light brown color in three minutes. Herbert L. Johnston, a signer to the Hobart Electric Manufacturing Co., Troy, Ohio, was granted a United States patent on a machine for refining coffee in 1913. In 1914, the Phylax coffee maker, embodying an improvement on the French drip principle, was introduced to the trade. The process was demonstrated by Benjamin H. Calkin of Detroit in 1921 as an art of brewing coffee. In 1914, Robert Burns, a signer to Jabez Burns & Sons, New York, was granted a United States patent on a coffee granulating mill. In 1914-15, Herbert Galt of Chicago was granted three United States patents on the Gate coffee pot, made of aluminum and having two parts, a removable cylinder employing the French drip principle, and the containing pot. 
In 1915, the Burns Jubilee gas coffee roaster was patented in the United States and put on the market. In 1915, the National Coffee Roasters Association Home Coffee Mill, employing an improved set screw operating on a cog and ratchet principle, was introduced to the trade. In 1916, a United States patent was granted to I.D. Richheimer, Chicago, for an infused improvement on his trickle In 1916, Saul Blickman, a signer to S. Blickman, New York, was granted a United States patent on an apparatus for making and dispensing coffee. In 1916, Orville W. Chamberlain, New Orleans, was granted a United States patent on an automatic drip coffee pot. In 1916, Jules Lepage, Darlington, Indiana, obtained two United States patents on cutting rolls to cut, and not to grind or crush, corn, wheat, or coffee. These were subsequently incorporated in the Ideal Steel Cut Coffee Mill and marketed to the trade by the B.F. Grump Co., Chicago. In 1917, Richard A. Green and William G. Burns, assigners to Jabez Burns & Sons, New York, were granted patents in the United States on the Burns Flexible Arm Cooler, providing full fan suction to a cooler box at all points in its track travel. In 1919, Joseph F. Smart, a signer to Landers, Ferry, and Clark, New Britain Con, was granted a United States patent on a percolator. In 1919, Charles Morgan, a signer to the Arcade Manufacturing Co., Freeport, Illinois, was granted a United States patent on an improved grinding mill. In 1919, Edward F. Schnuck, a signer to Jabez Burns & Sons, New York, was granted a United States patent on an improvement for a gas coffee roaster. In 1920, he was granted a United States patent on an improved process of twice cutting coffee and removing the chaff after each cutting. In 1920, Natale de Matti of Turin, Italy was granted a United States patent on a rapid coffee filtering machine. In 1920, Frederick H. Muller of Chicago was granted a United States patent on an art of making coffee and on an improved apparatus for hotels and restaurants which comprised a series of superposed metal containers, or cartridges, of ground coffee placed in a perforated bucket designed to rest in a coffee urn, the cartridges being lifted out as the boiling water poured on them sinks with the drying off of the decoction at the faucet. In 1920, Alfredo M. Salazar of New York was granted a United States patent on a coffee urn in which the coffee is made at the time of serving by using steam pressure to force the boiling water through ground coffee held in a cloth sack attached to the faucet. In 1920, William H. Bruning, Evansville, Indiana, was granted a United States patent on an improved French drip pot made of aluminum and provided with a vacuum jacket in the dripper section and a hot water jacket in the serving portion to keep the beverage hot. In 1921, the Manthe Zorn Laboratories Co. of Cleveland brought out a rapid coffee infuser and dispenser employing in the infuser a centrifugal to make and extract in 38 seconds, and designed to deliver a gallon of concentrated liquid, or coffee base, every three minutes. The dispenser automatically combines the coffee base with boiling water in a differential faucet, in the proportion desired, usually one of base to four of water. The dispenser serves 600 cups per hour. An additional faucet may be added which will double the capacity. Among foreign coffee makers applying the French drip principle, the Vienna coffee making machine, known in the United States as the Bohemian Coffee Pot, has met with much favor in this country. Elsewhere, it is known as the Carlsbad. It is made of China, and the European manufacturer has a patent on the porcelain strainer, or grid, which is provided with slits that are very fine on the inner side but that widen on the outer side to permit careful straining and to facilitate cleaning. Some of the latest developments in coffee apparatus were shown at the Industrial Exposition at the National Coffee Roasters Association, held in New York, November 1-3, 1921. Among items of distinction not heretofore included in this work, mention should be made of an American-French coffee biggin, being a French drip pot made of American porcelain and fitted with a muslin stainer. A glass urn liner, intended to supplant the porcelain liner, and an electric repouring pump designed to be attached to any type of coffee urn. 
Careful research of the records of the United States Patent Office discloses that the number of patents relating to coffee apparatus and coffee preparations issued from 1789 to 1921 is as follows. United States Coffee Patents Coffee Mills 185 Patents Coffee Roasting Devices and Improvements Thereon 312 Patents Coffee Making Devices 835 Patents Coffee cleaning, hulling, drying, polishing, and plantation machinery in general, 175 patents. Miscellaneous patents for coating, glazing, treated coffees, substitutes, etc., 300 patents. Total, 1,807 patents. It must be borne in mind that there was a number of patents granted on machines that were intended for, and used for, coffee, but that did not mention coffee in the specifications. Many coffee dryers were listed as grain dryers, for instance. Also, many excellent devices have been made that were never patented. End of section 63. Section 64 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Blue Bowser, Dessau, March 2022. All About Coffee by William Uckers. Chapter 35 World's Coffee Manners and Customs. Part 1 How coffee is roasted, prepared, and served in all the leading civilized countries. The Arabian Coffee Ceremony. The present day coffee houses of Turkey. 20th century improvements in Europe and the United States. Coffee manners and customs have shown little change in the Orient in the 600-odd years since the coffee drink was discovered by Sheikh Omar in Arabia. As a beverage for Western peoples, however, and more particularly in America, there have been many improvements in making and serving it. A brief survey of the coffee conventions and coffee service in the principal countries where coffee has become a fixed item in the dietary, is presented here, with a few to show how different peoples have adapted the universal drink to their national needs and preferences. To proceed in alphabetical order, and beginning with Africa, coffee drinking is indulged in largely in Abyssinia, Algeria, Egypt, Portuguese East Africa, and the Union of South Africa. Coffee Manners and Customs in Africa In Abyssinia and Somaliland, among the native population, the most primitive methods of coffee making still obtain. Here, the wandering gala still mix their pulverized coffee beans with fats as a food ration, and others of the native tribes favor the kishir, or beverage made from the toasted coffee hulls. An hour's boiling produces a straw-colored decoction of a slightly sweetish taste. Where the Arabian customs have taken root, the drink is prepared from the roasted beans after the Arabian and Turkish method. The white inhabitants usually prepare and serve the beverage as in the homeland, so that it is possible to obtain it after the English, French, German, Greek or Italian styles. Adaptions of the French sidewalk coffees and of the Turkish coffee house may be seen in larger towns. In the equatorial provinces of Egypt and in Uganda, the natives eat the raw berries, or first cook them in boiling water, tie them in the sun, and then eat them. It is a custom to exchange coffee beans in friendly greeting. Individual earthen vessels for making coffee, painted red and yellow, are made by some of the native tribes in Abyssinia, and usually accompany disciples of Islam when they journey to Mecca where the vessels find a ready sale among the pilgrims, most of whom are coffee devotees. Turkish and Arabian coffee customs prevail in Algeria and Egypt, modified to some extent by European contact. The Moorish coffees of Cairo, Tunis and Algiers have furnished inspiration and copy for writers, artists and travellers for several centuries. They change little with the years. The Mazagran, sweet and cold coffee to which water or ice has been added, originated in Algeria. Probably took its name 
from the fortress of the same name, reserved to France by the Treaty of the Tafna in 1837. De Say, that the French colonial troops were first served with a drink made from coffee syrup and cold water, or marches near Mazagran, formerly spelled Massagran. Upon their return to the French capital, they introduced the idea, whether added Philip of service in tall glasses, in the favorite cafes, what became known as Café Mazagran, where Ryan's or coffee syrup with seltzer and with hot water. This fashion of serving coffee in glasses, says Chardin, has no raison d'être, and nothing can justify abandoning the cup of coffee. In the principal streets and public squares of any town in Algeria, it is a common sight to find a group of Arabs squatting about a portable stove and a table on which cups are in readiness to receive the boiling coffee. The thirsty Arab approaches the dealer, and for a modest sum he gets his drink and goes his way, unless he prefers to go inside the café, where he may get several drinks and linger over them, sitting on a mat, with his legs crossed, and smoking his cheap book. Indeed, this is a typical scene throughout the Near East, where sheds or coffee tents, sketches of the more pretentious coffee houses, coffee shops and itinerant coffee vendors are to be met at almost every turn. In an unpublished work, Baron Antoine Rousseau and Thierry Roland de Bussy have the following description of a typical Moorish café at Algiers. We entered without ceremony into a narrow deep cave decorated with the name of the café. On the right and on the left, along its length, were two benches covered with mats, notched cups, tongs, a box of brown sugar, all placed near a small stove, completed the furniture of the place. In the evening, the dim light from a lamp hanging from the ceiling shows the indistinct figures of a double row of natives listening to the nasal cadences of a band who play in a pizza cutter accompaniment on small three-stringed violins. Here, as in Europe, the cafés are the providential rendezvous for idlers and gossips, exchanges for real estate brokers and players at cards. Europeans recently arrived frequent them particularly. Some go only to satisfy their curiosity, others out of an inborn scorn for the customs of civilization. They go to sleep as Frenchmen, they awake Mohammedans. Their love for Turkish art only leads them to haunt the native shops and to affect oriental poses. If we quit for a moment the interior or the city to follow between two hedgerows of mastics or aloes, one of those capricious paths which lead one now up to the summit of a hill, now to the depth of some ravine, very soon the tones of a rustic flute, the modulations of a dew walk, will betray some cool and peaceful retreat, some rustic café, easily recognized by its façade, pierced with large openings. To my eyes, nothing equals the charm of these little buildings scattered here and there along the edges of a stream, sheltered under the thick foliage and constantly enlivened by the coming and going of the husbandman of the neighborhood. Certain old moors from the neighboring districts fleeing the noises of the city are the faithful habitués of these agreeable retreats. Here they install themselves at dawn and know how to enjoy every moment of the day with tales of their travels and youthful adventures, and many a legend for which their imagination takes all the responsibility. Jerome's painting of The Coffee House at Cairo, which hangs in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, New York, gives one a good idea of the atmosphere of the Egyptian coffee. The preparation and service is modified Turkish Arabian. The coffee is ground to a powder, boiled in an ibrik with the addition of sugar, and served frothing in small cups. Storytellers, singers and dancers furnish amusement as of jaw. The oriental customs have not changed much in this respect. Trolley cars, victorias and taxis may have replaced the donkeys in the new sections of the large Egyptian cities, but in old Alexandria and Cairo the approach to the native coffee house is as dirty and as odorous as ever. Coffee is always served in all business transactions. Nowadays the Egyptian woman chew gum and the man smoke cigarettes. French department stores offer bargain sales 
and the hotels advertise tea dances. But the Egyptian coffee drink is still the tiny cup of coffee grounds and sugar that it was 300 years ago when sugar was first used to sweeten coffee in Cairo. In Portuguese East Africa, the natives prepare and drink coffee after the approved African native fashion, but the white population follows European customs. In the Union of South Africa, Dutch and English customs prevail in making and serving the beverage. Manners and Customs in Asia Arabia the Happy deserves to be called the blessed, if only for its gift of coffee to the world. Here it was that the virtues of the drink were first made known. Here the plant first received intensive cultivation. After centuries of habitual use of the beverage, we find the Arabs, now as then, one of the strongest and noblest races of the world, mentally superior to most of them, generally healthy and growing old so gracefully that the faculty of the mind seldom gives way sooner than those of the body. They are an ever-living earnest of the healthfulness of coffee. The Arabs are proverbially hospitable, and the symbol of their hospitality for a thousand years has been the great drink of democracy, coffee. Their very houses are built around the cup of human brotherhood. William Wallace, writing on Arabian philosophy, manners and customs, says. The principal feature of an Arab house is the kava, or coffee room. It is a large apartment spread with mats and sometimes furnished with carpets and a few cushions. At one end is a small furnace or fireplace for preparing coffee. In this room the men congregate. Here guests are received and even lodged. Women rarely enter it except at times when strangers are unlikely to be present. Some of these apartments are very spacious and supported by pillars. One wall is usually built transversely to the compass direction of the Kaaba, sacred shrine of Mecca. It serves to facilitate the performance of prayer by those who may happen to be in the Kaaba at the appointed times. Several rounds of coffee without milk or sugar, but sometimes flavored with cardamom seeds, are served to the guest at first welcome, and coffee may be had at all hours between meals or whenever the occasion demands it. Always the beans are freshly roasted, pounded and boiled. The Arabs average 25 to 30 cups, finjans, a day. Everywhere in Arabia there are to be found coffees where the beverage may be bought. Those of the lower classes are thronged throughout the day. In front, there is generally a porch or bench where one may sit. The rooms, benches and little chairs lack the cleanliness and elegance of the one-time luxurious caffeinets of cities like Damascus and Constantinople, but the drink is the same. There is not in all Yemen at a single market town or hamlet where one does not find upon some simple hut the legend shed for drinking coffee. The Arab drinks water before taking coffee, but never after it. Once in Syria, says a traveller, I was recognized as a foreigner because I asked for water just after I had taken my coffee. If you belonged here, said the waiter, you would not spoil the taste of coffee in your mouth by washing it away with water. It is an adventure to partake of coffee prepared in the open, at a roadside inn or a khan in Arabia by an Araba, a diligence driver. He takes from his saddlebag the ever-present coffee kit containing his supply of green beans, of which he roasts just sufficient on a little perforated iron blade over an open fire, deftly taken off the beans, one at a time, as they turn the right colour. Then he pounds them in a mortar, boils his water in the long, straight-handed open boiler, or ibric, a sort of brass mug, or chefze, tosses in the coffee powder, moving the vessel back and forth from the fire as it boils up to the rim and, after repeating this manoeuvre three times, pours the contents foaming merrily into the little egg-like serving cups. Café Sultan or Kisha, the original decoction made from dried and toasted coffee hulls, is still being drunk in parts of Arabia and Turkey. Coffee in Arabia is part of the ritual of business, as in other oriental countries. Shopkeepers serve it to the customers before the argument starts. Recently, a New Yorker barber got some valuable publicity because he regaled his customers with tea and music. 
It was old stuff. The Arabian and Turkish barber shops have been serving coffee, tobacco and sweetmeats to their customers for centuries. For a faithful description of the ancient coffee ceremony of the Arabs, which, with slight modification, is still observed in Arabian homes, we turn to Palgrave. First, he describes the dwelling and then the ceremony. The Kaaba was a large oblong hall about twenty feet in height, fifteen in length and sixteen or thereabouts in breadth. The walls were coloured in a ruddily decorative manner with brown and white wash and sunk here and there into small triangular recesses destined to the reception of books. So of this scaffold, at least, had no overabundance, lamps and other such like objects. The roof of timber and flat, the floor was strewed with fine clean sand and garnished all around alongside of the walls with long strips of carpet upon which cushions, covered with a faded silk, were disposed at suitable intervals. In poorer houses, fade rugs usually take the place of carpets. In one corner, namely the furthest removed from the door, stood a small fireplace, or, to speak more exactly, furnace, formed of a large square block of granite or some other hard stone, about twenty inches each way. This is hollowed inwardly into a deep funnel, open above, and communicating below with a small horizontal tube or pipe hole, through which the air passes, bellows driven, to the lighted charcoal piled up on a crating about halfway inside the cone. In this manner, the fuel is soon brought to a white heat, and the water and the coffee pot placed upon the funnel's mouth is readily brought to boil. The system of coffee furnaces is universal in Dior and Djebel Chomer, but in Nijet itself, and indeed in whatever other yet more distant regions of Arabia I visited to the south and east, the furnace is replaced by an open fireplace, hollowed in the ground floor, with a raised stone border and dog irons for the fuel and so forth, like what may be yet seen in Spain. This diversity of arrangement, so far as Arabia is concerned, is due to the greater abundance of firewood in the south, whereby the inhabitants are enabled to light up on a larger scale, whereas throughout the Djors and Djebel Shomer wood is very scarce, and the only fuel at hand is bare charcoal, often brought from a considerable distance and carefully husbanded. This corner of the kava is also the place of distinction, whence honour and coffee radiate by progressive degrees round the apartment, and hereabouts, accordingly sits the master of the house himself, or the guests whom he more especially delightens to honour. On the broad edge of the furnace or fireplace, as the case may be, stands an ostentatious range of copper coffee pots, varying in size and form. Here in the Tjorf, their make resembles that in vogue at Damascus, but in Nijet and the eastern districts, they are of a different and much more ornamental fashioning, very tall and slender, with several ornamental circles and mouldings in elegant relief, besides boasting long, beak-shaped spouts and high steeples for covers. The number of these utensils is often extravagantly great. I have seen a dozen at a time in a row by one fireside, though coffee-making requires, in fact, only three at most. Here and at Yorf, Five or six are considered to be the thing. For the south, this number must be doubled. All this to indicate the riches and munificence of the owner, by implying the frequency of his guests and the large amount of coffee that he is in consequence obliged to have made for them. Behind the stove sits, at least in wealthy houses, a black slave, whose name is generally a diminutive and token of familiarity or affection. In the present case, it was Zoe Lim, the diminutive of the limb. His occupation is to make and pour out the coffee. Where there is no slave in the family, the master of the premises himself, or perhaps one of his sons, performs that hospitable duty, rather a tedious one, as we shall soon see. We enter. On passing the threshold, it is proper to say Bishmala, for example, in the name of God. Not to do so would be looked on as a bad augury alike for him who enters and for those within. The visitor next advances in silence, till on coming about halfway across the room, he gives to all present, but looking specially at the master of the house, the customary, as salam alaikum, or peace be with you, literally on you, all this while everyone else in the room 
has kept his place motionless and without saying a word. But on receiving the salam of etiquette, the master of the house rises, and if a strict Wahhabi or at any rate desirous of seeming such, replies with a full length traditionary formula Alaikumu, Salamu, Hoi Hamat, Uloi, Wabarakatua, which is, as everyone knows, and with or on you be peace and the mercy of God and his blessings. But should he happen to be of anti Wahhabi tendencies, the odds are that he will say Marhaba or Allah Salan, welcome, or worthy and pleasurable, or the like. For of such phrases there is an infinite but elegant variety. All present follow the example thus given, by rising and saluting. The guest then goes up to the master of the house, who has also made a step or two forwards, and places his open hand in the palm of his hosts, but without grasping or shaking, which would hardly pass for decorous, and at the same time each repeats once more his greeting, followed by the set phrases of polite inquiry, how are you, how goes the world with you, and so forth, all in a tone of great interest, and to be gone over three or four times, till one or other has the discretion to say, El Hamdu Ilah, praise be to God, or in equivalent value, all right, and this is a signal for a seasonable diversion to the ceremonious interrogatory. The guest then, after a little contest of courtesy, takes his seat in the honoured post by the fireplace after an apologetical salutation to the black slave on the one side and to the nearest neighbour on the other. The best cushions and newest-looking carpets have been, of course, prepared for his honoured weight. Shoes or sandals, for in truth the latter alone are used in Arabia, are slipped off on the sand just before reaching the carpet, and there they remain on the floor close by. But the riding stick or wand, the inseparable companion of every true Arab, whether Bedouin or townsman, rich or poor, gentle or simple, is to be detained in the hand, and will serve for playing with during the pauses of conversation, like the van of our grand-grandmothers in the days of conquest. Without delay, Zoe Lim begins his preparations for coffee. These open by about five minutes of blowing with a bellows and arranging the charcoal till a sufficient heat has been produced. Next, he places the largest of the coffee pots, a huge machine, and about two-thirds full of clear water, close by the edge of the glowing coal pit, that its contents may become gradually warm, while other operations are in progress. He then takes a dirty knotted rag out of a niche in the wall close by, and having untied it, empties out of it three or four handfuls of unroasted coffee, the which he places on a little trencher of plaited grass and picks carefully out any blackened grains or other non-homologous substances, commonly to be found intermixed with the berries when purchased in gross. Then, after much cleansing and shaking, he pours the grain so cleansed into a large open iron ladle and places it all over the mouth of the funnel, at the same time blowing the bellows and steering the grains gently round and round till they crackle, redden and smoke a little but carefully withdrawing them from the heat long before they turn black or charred, after the erroneous fashion of Turkey or Europe, after which he puts them to cool a moment on the grass platter. He then sets the warm water in the large coffee pot over the fire aperture, that is may be ready boiling at the right moment, and draws in close between his own trouserless legs a large stone mortar, with a narrow pit in the middle, just enough to admit the large stone pastel for a foot long and an inch and a half thick, which he now takes in hand. Next, pouring the half-roasted berries into the mortar, he proceeds to pound them, striking right into the narrow hollow, with wonderful dexterity, nor ever missing his blow, till the beans are smashed, but not reduced into powder. He then scoops them out, now reduced to a sort of coarse reddish grit, very unlike the fine charcoal dust which passes in some countries for coffee, and out of which every particle of real aroma has long since been burned or ground. After all these operations, each performed with as intense a seriousness and deliberate nicety as if the welfare of the entire dwarf depended on it, he takes a smaller coffee pot in hand, fills it more than half 
with hot water from the larger vessel and then shaking the pounded coffee into it, sets it on the fire to boil, occasionally steering it with a small stick as the water rises to check the ebullition and prevent overflowing. No, is the boiling stage to be long or vehement. On the contrary, it is and should be as light as possible. In the interim, he takes out of another rag knot a few aromatic seeds called hail, an Indian product, but of whose scientific name I regret to be wholly ignorant, or a little saffron, and after slightly pounding these ingredients, throws them into the simmering coffee to improve its flavor, for such an additional spicing is held indispensable in Arabia, though often omitted elsewhere in the East. Sugar would be a totally unheard of profanation. Last of all, he strains off the liquor through some fibers of the inner palm bark placed for that purpose in the chuck spout and gets ready the tray for delicate party-colored grass and the small coffee cups ready for pouring out. All these preliminaries have taken up a good half hour. Meantime, we have become engaged in active conversation with our host and his friends, but our Shararat guide, Suleiman, like a true Bedouin, feels too awkward when among townsfolk to venture on the upper places, so repeatedly invited and accordingly has squatted down on the sand near the entrance. Many of Gafil's relations are present. Their silver-decorated swords proclaim the importance of the family. Others, too, have come to receive us for our arrival, announced beforehand by those we had met at the entrance pass. It is a sort of event in the town. The dress of some betokens poverty. Others are better clad, but all have a very polite and decorous manner. Many a question is asked about our native land and town, that is to say, Syria and Damascus, conformably to the disguise already adopted, and which is was highly important to keep well up. Then follow inquiries regarding our journey, our business, what we have brought with us, about our medicines, our goods and wares, etc., etc. From the very first, it is easy for us to perceive that patients and purchases are likely to abound. Very few travelling merchants, if any, visited Jove's at this time of year, for one must be mad or next door to it to rush into the vast desert around during the heats of June and July. I, for one, have certainly no intention of doing it again. Hence, we had small danger of competitors and found the market almost at our absolute disposal. But before a quarter of an hour has passed, and while Blackie is still roasting and pounding his coffee, a tall, thin lad, Gafil's eldest son, appears, charged with a large circular dish, grass platted like the rest, and throws it with a graceful jerk on the sandy floor close before us. He then produces a large wooden bowl full of dates, bearing in the midst of the heap a cup full of melted butter. All this he places on the circular mat and says, Simo, literally, pronounce the name. Of God understood, this means set to work it did. Hereon, the master of the house quits his place by the fireside and seats himself on the sand opposite to us. We draw nearer to the dish and four or five others, after some respectful coyness, join the circle. Everyone then picks out a date or two from the juicy half-amalgamated mass, dips them into the butter, and thus goes on eating, till he has had enough, when he rises and washes his hands. By this time the coffee is ready, and Zoe Lim begins his round, the coffee pot in one hand, the tray and cups on the other. The first pouring out he must in etiquette drink himself, by way of a practical assurance that there is no death in the pot. The guests are next served, beginning with those next, the honorable fireside. The master of the house receives his cup last of all. To refuse would be a positive and unpardonable insult, but one has not much to swallow at a time, for the coffee cups, or finjans, are about the size of a large eggshell at most, and are never more than half filled. This is considered essential to good breeding, and a brimmer would here imply exactly the reverse of what it does in Europe. Why it should be so I hardly know, unless perhaps the rareness of cup stands or shafts, sea lanes, modern Egyptians, in Arabia, so these implements are universal in Egypt and Syria, 
might render an overfull cup inconveniently hot for the fingers that must grasp it without medium. Be that, as it may, fill the cup for your enemy is an adage common to all Bedouins or townsmen throughout the peninsula. The beverage itself is singularly aromatic and refreshing, a real tonic, and very different from the black mud sucked by the Levantine or the watery roast bean preparations of France. When the slave or freeman, according to the circumstances, presents you with a cup, he never fails to accompany it with a sim, say the name of God, nor must you take it without answering Bismillah. When all have been thus served, a second round is poured out, but in inverse order, for the host this time drinks first and the guests last. On special occasions, at first reception for instance, the ruddy liqueur is a third time handed round, nay, a fourth cup is sometimes added, but all these put together do not come up to one-fourth of what a European imbibes in a single draught at breakfast. For a more recent pen picture of coffee manners and customs in Arabia, we turn to Charles M. Doddy's Travels in Arabia Deserta. Irfa, ever demanded of her husband towards which part should the house be built, trust the face, Said would answer, to this part, showing her with his hands the south, for if his booth face be all day turned to the hot sun, there will come in fewer young loitering and parasitical fellows that would be his coffee drinkers. Since the sheikh or heads alone receive their tribes, surah, it is not much that they should be to the arms of his coffee hosts. I have seen Said avoid them, as he saw them approach, or even rise ungraciously upon such men's presenting themselves, the half of every booth, namely the man's side, is at all times open, and any enter there that will, in the free desert. And the murmuring, he tells them, voila, his affairs to call him forth, adieu. He must away to the Medjils. Go they and seek the coffee elsewhere. But were there any shake with them, a coffee lord, said, could not honestly choose but abide and serve them with coffee. And if he be absent himself, yet any shakely man coming to the shake's tent, coffee must be made for him, except he gently protest, Bilach, he would not drink. Hirfa, a shake's daughter, and his nigh kinswoman, was a faithful maid to Said in all his sparing policy. Our men still now standing, the men step over to Said's coffee fire, if the sheikh be not gone forth to the Meshlis to drink his midday cup there. A few gathered sticks are flung down beside the hearth, with flint and steel, on stoops and strikes fire in tinder, he blows and cherishes those seeds for the cheerful flame, and some dry camel dung, sets the burning shred under dry straws, and powders over more dry camel dung. As the fire kindles, the sheikh reaches for his dalal coffee pots, which are carried in the fatya coffee gear basket. These people of a nomad life bestow each thing of theirs in a proper bait. It would otherwise be lost in their daily removings. One rises to go to fill up the pots at the water skins, or a bowl of water is handed over the curtain from the woman's side. The pot at the fire, Hirfa reaches over her little palm full of green coffee berries. These are roasted and braid. As all is boiling, he sets out his little cups, fenjil or fenjin. When, with a pleasant gravity, he has unbuckled his kutia or cup box, we see the nomad has not above three or four fenjins, wrapped in a rusty cloth with which he scours them busily as if this should make his cups clean. The roasted beans are pounded amongst Arabs with a magnanimous rattle and, as all the labor, rhythmical, in breath of the town, or an old wooden mortar, gaily studded with nails, the work of some nomad smith. The water bubbling and the small dalal, he casts in his fine coffee powder, el bun, and withdraws the pot to simmer a moment. From a knot, in his handkerchief he takes then a head of cloves, a piece of cinnamon, or other spice, baha, and braying these, he casts the dust in after. Soon he pours out some hot drops to assay his coffee if the taste be to his liking, making dexterously a nest of all the cups in his hand, with pleasant clattering 
he is ready to pour out for all the company and begins upon his right hand. The first, if such be present, to any considerable shake and principal persons. The Fengin Kawa is but four sips. To fill it up to our guest, as in the northern towns, where among Bedouins an injury, and of such bitter meaning, these drink though and depart. Then is often seen a contention and courtesy amongst them, especially in any greater assemblies, who shall drink first. Some man that receives the Fengin in his turn will not drink yet. He proffers it to one sitting in order under him, as to the more honourable, but the other putting off with his hand will answer a bit then. Nay, I shall never be by Allah, but do thou drink. Thus licensed, the humble man is dispatched in three sips and hands up his empty fengin. But if he have much insisted, by this he opens his willingness to be reconciled with one not his friend. That neighbour, seeing the company of coffee drinkers watching him, may with an honest grace receive the cup and let it seem not willingly. But any hard man will sometimes rebut the other's gentle brother. Some may have taken lower seats than becoming their shake blood, of which the nomads are jealous. Entering untimely, they sit down out of order, sooner than trouble all the company. A shake, coming late, and any business going forward, will often sit far out in the assembly, and show himself a popular person in this kind of honourable humility. The more inward in the booth is, the higher blaze, where also is, with the shakes, the seat of a stranger. To sit in the loose circuit without and before the tent is for the common sword. A tribesman arriving presents himself at that part or a little lower, where in the eyes of all men his pretension will be well allowed. And in such observances of good nurture is a nomad's man honour among his tribesmen. And this is the nigh all that serves the nomad for a conscience, namely, that which man will hold of him. A poor person, approaching from behind, stands obscurely, wrapped in his tattered mantle, with grave ceremonial, until those sitting indolently before him in the sand shall vouchsafe to take notice of him. Then they rise unwillingly, and giving back enlarge the coffee circle to receive him. But if there arrive a shake, a coffee host, a richard amongst them of a few cattle, all the coxcomb companions within will hail him with a pleasant adulation. Tad, Henny step thou up hither. The astute Fukara Sheikh surpasses all men in their coffee drinking courtesy, and Said himself was more than any large of this gentlemanlike imposture. He was full of swaggering complaisance and compliments to an humbler person. With what suavity could he encourage and gently to compel a man? and rising himself yield him parcel of another man's room. In such fashions, Said showed himself a bountiful great man, who indeed was the greatest niggard. The cups are drunk twice about each one sipping after other's lips, without misliking. To the great coffee shakes, the cup may be filled more times, but this is an adulation of the coffee server. There are some of the Fukara shakes or delicate sabarites, that of these three bitter sips to throw out all their joyance, twisting, turning, and tossing again the cup, they could make ten. The coffee service ended, and the grounds are poured out from the small into the great store pot that is reserved full of warm water. With a bitter lay, the nomads will make their next bever and think they spare coffee. Here's an Arabian recipe for making coffee as given by Kadi Khodad, the best informed man of this time. Taj Edin Aid al Maknab ben Yakub Maki Molki, chief of all the contents of Hedjas, may God have mercy on him, I learned it when once in his company at the time of the holy feasts. He informed me that nothing is more beneficial than to drink cold water before coffee, because it lengthens the dryness of the coffee, and thus, taking it does not cause insomnia to the same degree. Howard did not forget to explain this manner of taking coffee. As with art is prepared, one should drink it with art. The mere commonplace drinks one observes with free heart. But this, once with care, from the bright flame removed, and the lime set aside that its value has proved. Take it first in deep draughts, meditative and slow. Quit it now, now resume, thus imbibe with gusto. While charming the palate, 
it burns yet in chance. In the hour of its triumph, the virtue it grants penetrates every tissue, its powers condense, circulate during warmth, bring new life to each sense. From the cauldron profound spiced aromas unseen, mount to tease and delight your olfactories keen. The while you inhale with felicity fraud the enchanting perfume that a sufferer has brought. End of section 64「Section 65 of All About Coffee – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Bender All About Coffee by William Eukers World's Coffee Manners and Customs, Part 2 Gone are the, quote, luxurious and magnificent, end quote, coffee houses of Constantinople, if they ever existed, at least as we understand luxury and magnificence, which first brought the beverage worldwide fame. Such caffeinettes, as the one pictured by Thomas Allen and described by the Reverend Robert Walsh in Constantinople Illustrated, quote, the caffeinette or coffee house is something more splendid, and the Turk expends all his notions of finery and elegance on this, his favorite place of indulgence. The edifice is generally decorated in a very gorgeous manner, supported on pillars and open in front. It is surrounded on the inside by a raised platform, covered with mats or cushions, on which the Turks sit cross-legged. On one side are musicians, generally Greeks, with mandolins and tambourines accompanying singers whose melody consists in vociferation, and the loud and obstreperous concert forms a strong contrast to the stillness and taciturnity of Turkish meetings. On the opposite side are men, generally of a respectable class, some of whom are found here every day and all day long, dozing under the double influence of coffee and tobacco. The coffee is served in very small cups, not larger than egg cups, grounds and all, without cream or sugar, and so black, thick, and bitter that it has been aptly compared to, quote, stewed soot, end quote. Besides the ordinary shabuk for tobacco, there is another implement called nargale, used for smoking in a caffeinette, of a more elaborate construction. It consists of a glass vase filled with water, and often scented with distilled rose or other flowers. This is surmounted with a silver or brazen head from which issues a long flexible tube. A pipe bowl is placed on the top and so constructed that the smoke is drawn and comes bubbling up through the water, cool and fragrant to the mouth. A peculiar kind of tobacco, grown at Shiraz in Persia and resembling small pieces of cut leather, is used with this instrument." End quote. Certainly there never was any such thing as a coffee house architecture. It may be that up to the time of Abdul Hamid, when money was more plentiful than it has been for the past 50 years, there were coffee houses more comfortably appointed than now exist. The coffee house in a modernized form is, however, quite as numerous in Turkey as in the days of Amirath III and the notorious Kuprili. H. G. Dwight, writing on the present-day Turkish coffee house, says, quote, There are thoroughfares in any Turkish city that carry on almost no other form of traffic. There is no quarter so miserable or so remote as to be without one or two. They are the clubs of the poorer classes, men of a street, a trade, a province, or nationality, for a Turkish coffee house may also be Albanian, Armenian, Greek, Hebrew, Kurd, almost anything you please, meet regularly when their work is done, at coffee houses kept by their own people. So much of the humbler coffee houses frequented by a fixed clientele that a student of types or dialects may realize for himself how truly they used to be called schools of knowledge. The arrangement of a Turkish coffee house is of the simplest. The essential is that the place should provide the beverage for which it exists and room for enjoying the same. 
A sketch of a coffee shop may often be seen on the street, in a scrap of shade or sunshine according to the season, where a stool or two invite the passerby to a moment of contemplation. Larger establishments, though they are rarely very large, are most often installed in a room longer than it is wide, having as many windows as possible at the street end, and what we would call the bar at the other. It is a bar that always makes me regret I do not etch, with its pleasing curves, its highlights of brass and porcelain striking out of deep shadow, and its usually picturesque cave. You do not stand at it. You sit on one of the benches running down the sides of the room. They are more or less comfortably cushioned, though sometimes higher and broader than a foreigner finds to his taste. In that case, you slip off your shoes, if you would do as the Romans do, and tuck your feet up under you. A table stands in front of you to hold your coffee, and, often in the summer, an aromatic pot of basil to keep the flies away. Chairs or stools are scattered about. Decorative Arabic texts, sometimes wonderful prints, adorn the walls. There may even be hanging rugs and china to entertain your eyes. And there you are. The habit of the coffee house is one that requires a certain leisure. You must not bolt coffee as you bolt the fire waters of the West, without ceremony, in retreats withdrawn from the public eye. Being a less violent and a less shameful passion, I suppose, it is indulged in with more of the humanities. The etiquette of the coffee house, of those coffee houses which have not been too much infected by Europe, is one of their most characteristic features. Something like it prevails in Italy, where you tip your hat on entering and leaving a cafe. In Turkey, however, I have seen a newcomer salute one after another each person in a crowded coffee room, once on entering the door and again after taking his seat, and be so saluted in return, either by putting the right hand to the heart and uttering the greeting, Merhaba, or by making the Temena, the triple sweep of the hand, which is the most graceful of salutes. I have also seen an entire company rise upon the entrance of an old man and yield him the corner of honor. Such courtesies take time. Then you must wait for your coffee to be made. To this end, coffee, roasted fresh as required by turning in an iron cylinder over a fire of sticks and ground to the fineness of powder in a brass mill, is put into a small, uncovered brass pot with a long handle. There, it is boiled to a froth three times on a charcoal brazier, with or without sugar as you prefer. But to desecrate it by the admixture of milk is an unheard of sacrilege. Some caves replace the pot in the embers with a smart wrap in order to settle the grounds. You, in the meanwhile, smoke. That also takes time, particularly if you, quote, drink, end quote, an argila, as the Turks say. This is familiar enough in the West to require no great description. It is a big carafe with a metal top for holding tobacco and a long coil of leather tube for inhaling the water-cooled fumes thereof. The effect is wonderfully soothing and innocent at first, though wonderfully deadly in the end, to the novice. The tobacco used is not the ordinary weed, but a much coarser and stronger one called tumbeki, which comes from Persia. The same sort of tobacco used to be smoked a great deal in shallow red earthenware pipes with long mouthpieces. They are now chiefly seen in antiquity shops. When your coffee is ready, it is poured into an after-dinner coffee cup or into a miniature bowl and brought to you on a tray with a glass of water. A foreigner can almost always be spotted by the manner in which he finally partakes of these refreshments. A Turk sips his water first, partly to prepare the way for the coffee, but also because he is a connoisseur of the former liquid, as other men are of stronger ones. And he lifts his coffee cup by the saucer, whether it possess a handle or no, managing the two together in a dexterous way of his own. The current price for all of this, not including the water pipe, is ten paras, a trifle over a cent, for which the cave will cry you, quote, blessing, end quote. More pretentious establishments charge 20 paras, while a giddy few rise to a piaster, not quite five cents, or a piaster and a half. 
That, however, begins to look like extortion. And mark that you do not tip the waiter. I have often been surprised to be charged no more than the tariff, although I gave a larger piece to be changed, and it was perfectly evident that I was a foreigner. That is an experience which rarely befalls a traveler among his own co-religionaries. It has even happened to me, which is rarer still, to be charged nothing at all, nay, to be steadfastly refused when I persisted in attempting to pay, simply because I was a foreigner and therefore a guest. There is no reason, however, why you should go away when you have had your coffee or your glass of tea and your smoke. On the contrary, there are reasons why you should stay, particularly if you happen into the coffee house not too long after sunset. Then coffee houses of the most local color are at their best. Earlier in the day, their clients are likely to be at work. Later, they will have disappeared altogether. For Constantinople has not quite forgotten the habits of the tent. Stambul, except during the holy month of Ramazan, is a deserted city at night. But just after dark, it is full of a life which an outsider is often content simply to watch through the lighted windows of coffee rooms. These are also barber shops where men have shaved not only their chins, but different parts of their heads according to their, quote, countries, end quote. In them, likewise, checkers, the Persian backgammon, and various games of long, narrow cards are played. They say that bridge came from Constantinople. Indeed, I believe a club of para claims the honor of having communicated that passion to the Western world. But I must confess that I have yet to see an open hand in the coffee house of the people. One of the pleasantest forms of amusement to be obtained in coffee houses is, unfortunately, getting to be one of the rarest. It is that afforded by itinerant storytellers who still carry on in the East the tradition of the troubadours. The stories they tell are more or less on the order of the Arabian Nights, though perhaps even less suitable for mixed companies which, for the rest, are never found in coffee shops. These men are sometimes wonderfully clever at character monologue or dialogue. They collect their pay at a crucial moment of the action, refusing to continue until the audience has testified to the sincerity of its interest by some token more substantial. Music is much more common. There are those, to be sure, who find no music in the sounds poured forth oftenest by a gramophone, often by a pair of gypsies with a flaring pipe and two small gourd drums, and sometimes by an orchestra so-called of the fine lute, a company of musicians on a railed dais who sing long songs while they play on stringed instruments of strange curves. For myself, I know too little of music to tell what relation the recurrent cadences of those songs and their broken rhythms may bear to the antique modes. But I can listen as long as musicians will perform, to those infinite repetitions, that insistent sounding of the minor key. It pleases me to fancy there are music come from far away, from unknown river gorges, from campfires glimmering on great plains. Does not such darkness breathe through it, such melancholy, such haunting of elusive airs? There are flashes, too, of light, of song, the playing of the shepherd's pipes, the swoop of horsemen, and sudden outcries of savagery. But the note to which it all comes back is the monotone of a primitive life, like the day-long beat of camel bells. And more than all, it is the mood of Asia, so rarely penetrated, which is neither lightness or despair. There are seasons in the year when these various forms of entertainment abound more than at others, as Ramazan and the two Bayrams. Throughout the month of Ramazan, the purely Turkish coffee houses are closed in the daytime, since the pleasures which they minister may not then be indulged in, but they are open all night. It is during that one month of the year that Karak Yuz, the Turkish shadow show, may be seen in a few of the larger coffee shops. The Bayrams are two festivals of three and four days respectively, the former of which celebrates the close of Ramazan, while the latter corresponds in certain respects to the Jewish Passover. Dancing is a particular feature of the coffee houses in Bayram. 
The Kurds, who carry the burdens of Constantinople on their backs, are above all other men given to this form of exercise. Through the lazes, the boatmen vie with them. One of these dark tribesmen plays a little violin like a pashel, or two of them perform on a pipe and a big drum, while the others dance round them in a circle, sometimes till they drop from fatigue. The weird music and the picturesque costumes and movements of the dancers make the spectacle one to be remembered. Christian coffee houses also have their own festal seasons. These coincide in general with the festivals of the church, but every quarter has its patron saint, the saint of the local church or of the local holy well, whose feast is celebrated by a three-day panayiri. The street is dressed with flags and strings of colored paper, Tables and chairs line the sidewalk, and libations are poured forth in honor of the holy person commemorated. For this reason, and because of the more volatile character of the Greek, the general note of his merrymaking is louder than that of the Turk. One may even see the scandalous spectacle of men and women dancing together at a Greek panayiri. The instrument which sets the key of these orgies is the lanterna, a species of hand organ peculiar to Constantinople. It is a hand piano, rather, of a loud and cheerful voice, whose Eurasian harmonies are enlivened by a frequent clash of bells. What first made coffee houses suspicious to those in authority, however, is their true resource, the advantages they offer for meeting one's kind, for social converse and the contemplation of life. Hence, it must be that they have so happy a tact for locality. They seek shade. Pleasant corners, open squares, the prospect of water or wide landscapes. In Constantinople, they enjoy an infinite choice of sight. So huge is the extent of that city, so broken by hill and sea, so varied in its spectacle of life. The commonest type of city coffee room looks out upon the passing world from under a grapevine or a climbing wisteria." End quote. Coffee houses of distinction are to be found also in the place of the pines overlooking the Marble Sea, on Giant's Mountain, in the landing place of the Manslayer, and along the rivers that flow into the Golden Horn. Originally, the Turkish method of preparing coffee was the Arabian method, and it is so described by Mr. Fellows in his Excursions Through Asia Minor. Quote, Each cup is made separately the little saucepan or ladle in which it is prepared being about an inch wide and two deep. This is more than half filled with coffee, finely pounded with a pestle and mortar, and then filled up with water. After being placed for a few seconds on the fire, the contents are poured, or rather shaken, out, being much thicker than chocolate, without the addition of cream or sugar, into a china cup of the size and shape of half an eggshell which is enclosed in one of ornamental metal for convenience of holding in the hand. End quote. Later, the Turks sought to improve the method by adding sugar, a concession to the European sweet tooth, during the boiling process. The improved Turkish recipe is as follows, quote, First, boil the water. For two cups of the beverage, add three lumps of sugar and return the boiler to the fire. Add two teaspoonfuls of powdered coffee, stirring well, and let the pot boil up four times. Between each boiling, the pot is to be removed from the fire and the bottom tapped gently until the froth on the top subsides. After the last boiling, pour the coffee first into one cup and then the other, so as to evenly divide the froth. End quote. In Syria and Palestine, the Turkish Arabian methods are followed. The brazen dippers or ebricks, are used for boiling. In the Near East, coffee manners and customs are much the same today as they were 50 or even 100 years ago. Witness Damascus. The following pen picture of the cafes in this ancient city was written in 1836 to accompany the drawing by Bartlett and Purser, which is reproduced here, but it may have been written in 1922, so slight have been the changes in the setting or the spirit of the original coffee house that Shemsi first brought to Constantinople from Damascus in 1554. Quote, the cafes of the kind represented in the plate are, perhaps, the greatest luxury that a stranger finds in Damascus. 
Gardens, kiosks, fountains, and groves are abundant around every eastern capital. But cafes on the very bosom of a rapid river, and bathed by its waves, are peculiar to this ancient city. They are formed so as to exclude the rays of the sun while they admit the breeze. The light roof is supported by slender rows of pillars, and the building is quite open on every side. A few of these houses are situated in the skirts of the town, on one of the streams where the eye rests on the luxuriant vegetation of garden and wood. Others are in the heart of the city. A flight of steps conducts to them from the sultry street, and it is delightful to pass in a few moments from the noisy, shadeless thoroughfare where you see only mean gateways and the gable ends of edifices, to a cool, grateful, calm place of rest and refreshment, where you can muse and meditate in ease and luxury and feel at every moment the rich breeze from the river. In two or three instances, a light wooden bridge leads to the platform, close to which, and almost out of it, one or two large and noble trees lift the canopy of their spreading branches and leaves, more welcome at noonday than the roofs of fretted gold in the, quote, Arabian Nights, end quote. The high pavilion roof and the pillars are all constructed of wood, the floors of wood, and sometimes of earth, and is regularly watered, and raised only a few inches above the level of the stream, which rushes by at the feet of the customer, which it almost bathes as he sips his coffee or sherbet. Innumerable small seats cover the floor, and you take one of these and place it in the position you like best. Perhaps you wish to sit apart from the crowd, just under the shadow of the tree, or in some favorite corner where you can smoke and contemplate the motley guests, formed into calm and solemn groups, who wish to hold no communion with the jower. There is ample food here for the observer of character, costume, and pretension. The tradesman, the mechanic, the soldier, the gentleman, the dandy, the grave old man looking wise in the past and dimly on the future, the hajj in his green turban vain of his journey to Mecca and drawing a long bow in his tales and adventures, the long straight pipe, the hookah with its soft curling tube and glass vase are in request, but the poorer argile is most commonly used. From sunrise to set, these houses are never empty. We were accustomed to visit one of them early every morning, before breakfast, and very many persons were already there. Yet this, quote, balmy hour of prime, end quote, was the most silent and solitary of the whole day. It was the coolest also. The rising sun was glancing redly on the waters. There was as yet no heat in the air, and the little cup of mocha coffee and the pipe were handed by an attendant as soon as the stranger was seated. His favorite cafe was the one represented in the plate. The river is the Barada, the ancient Par Par. Never was the sound of water so pleasant to the ear as in Damascus. The air is filled with a sound with which no clash of tongues, rolling of wheels, march of footmen or horsemen mingle. The numerous groups who love to resort here are silent half the time and when they do converse, their voice is often, quote, low like that of a familiar spirit, end quote, or in short, grave sentences that pass quickly from the ear. Yet much, very much, of the excitement of the life of the Turk in this city is absorbed in these coffee houses. They are his opera, his theater, his conversation. Soon after his eyes are unclosed from sleep, he thinks of his cafe, and forthwith bends his way there. During the day, he looks forward to pass the evening on the loved floor, to look on the waters, on the stars above, and on the faces of his friends, and at the moonlight falling on all. Mahomet committed a grievous error in the admission of coffee houses in a future state. Had he ever seen those of Damascus, he would surely have given them a place on his rivers of paradise, persuaded that true believers must feel a melancholy void without them. There is no ornament or richness about these houses, no sofas, mirrors, or drapery, save that afforded by a few evergreens and creepers. The famous silks and damask of Damascus have no place here. All is plain and homely. 
Yet no Parisian café, with its beautiful mirrors, gilding, and luxuriousness, is so welcome to the imagination and senses of the traveler. After wandering many days over dry and stony and desert places, where the lip thirsted for the stream, it is not delicious to sit at the brink of a wild, impetuous torrent to gaze on its white foam and breaking waves till you can almost feel their gush in every nerve and fiber and can bathe your very soul in them. And while you slowly smoke your pipe of purest tobacco, the sands of the desert and their burning sun rise again before you when you prayed for even the shadow of a cloud on your way. The banks are in some parts covered with wood, whose soft green verdure contrasts beautifully with the clear torrent and almost droops into its bosom. Near the coffee houses are one or two cataracts several feet high, and the perpetual sound of their fall and the coolness they spread around are exquisite luxuries in the heat of day or in the dimness of evening. There are two or three cafes constructed somewhat differently from those just described. A low gallery divides the platform from the tide. Fountains play on the floor, which is furnished with very plain sofas and cushions, and music and dancing always abound, of the most unrefined description. The only intellectual gratification in these places is afforded by the Arab storytellers, among whom are a few eminent and clever men. Soon after his entrance, a group begins to form around the gifted man, who, after a suitable pause to collect hearers or whet their expectations, begins a story. It is a picturesque sight of the Arab with his wild and graceful gestures and his auditory hushed into deep and childlike attention, seated at the edge of the rushing tide, while the narrator moves from side to side, and each accent of his distinct and musical voice is heard throughout the café. The building directly opposite is another house, of a similar kind in every respect. There are few small cafés, more select as to company, where the Turkish gentlemen often go, form dinner parties, and spend the day. Night is the propitious season to visit these places. The glare of the sun glancing on the waters is passed away. The company is then most numerous, for it is their favorite hour. The lamps, suspended from the slender pillars, are lighted. The Turks, in the various and brilliant colors of their costume, crowd the platform, some standing moveless as the pillars beside them, their long pipe in their hand. Noble specimens of humanity, if intellect breathed within, some reclining against the rails, others seated in groups or solitary, as if buried in, quote, lonely thoughts sublime, end quote. While the rush of the falling waters is sweeter music than that of the pipe and the guitar that faintly strive to be heard. The cataract in the plate is a very fine one. On its foam, the moonlight was lovely. We passed many an hour here on such a night. The clear waters of the Farpar, as they rolled on, reflecting each pillar, each damascene slowly moving by in his waving garments. The glare of the lamps mingled strangely with the moonlight that rested with a soft and vivid glory on the waters, and fell beneath pillar and roof on the picturesque groups within. End quote. The slender brass coffee grinder sometimes served as a combination utensil in the equipment of the Turkish officer. Frequently, they are made of silver. They might be called collapsible, convertible coffee kits, as they are made to serve as a combination coffee pot, mill, can, and cup. The green or roasted beans are kept in the lower section. It takes but a minute to unscrew the apparatus. To make a cup of coffee, the beans are dumped out and three or four of them are put in the middle section. The steel crank is fitted over the squared rod projecting from the middle section which revolves, setting in motion the grinding apparatus inside. The ground coffee falls into the bottom section and water is added. The pot is placed on the fire and the contents brought to a boil. The coffee pot serves as a cup. The process requires but a few minutes. The cup is rinsed out, the beans replaced, the utensils put together. The whole thing is slipped into the officer's tunic and he goes on refreshed. In Persia, where tea is mostly drunk, the Turkish Arabian methods of making coffee are followed. In Ceylon and India, 
The same applies to the native population, but the whites follow the European practice. In India, many people look upon coffee as just a bon bouche, a, quote, chaser, end quote. A well-known English tea firm has had some success in India with a tinned, quote, French coffee, end quote, which is a blend of Indian coffee and chicory. European methods obtain in making coffee in China and Japan and in the French and Dutch colonies. When traveling in the Far East, one of the greatest hardships the coffee lover is called upon to endure is the European bottled coffee extract, which so often supplies lazy chefs with the markings of a most forbidding cup of coffee. In Java, a favorite method is to make a strong extract by the French drip process, and then to use a spoonful of the extract to a cup of hot milk, a good drink when the extract is freshly made for each service. End of section 65. Read by John Bender, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, May 2022. Section 66 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matea Bracic. All About Coffee by William Uckers. World's Coffee Manners and Customs, Part 3. Coffee Making in Europe. In Europe, the coffee drink was first sold by lemonade vendors. In Florence, those who sold coffee, chocolate, and other beverages were not called caffettieri, coffee sellers, but limonaggi, lemonade vendors. Pascal's first Paris coffee shop served other drinks as well as coffee, and Procope's Café began as a lemonade shop. It was only when coffee, which was an afterthought, began to lead the other beverages that he gave the name Café to his whole refreshment place. Today, nearly every country in Europe can supply the two extremes of coffee making. In Paris and Vienna, one may find it brewed and served in its highest perfection, but here too it is frequently found as badly done as in England, and that is saying a good deal. The principal difficulty seems to be in the chicory flavor, for which long years of use has cultivated a taste with most people. Now, coffee and chicory is not at all a bad drink. Indeed, the author confesses to have developed a certain liking for it after a time in France, but it is not coffee. In Europe, chicory is not regarded as an adulterant. It is an addition, or modifier, if you please. And so many people have acquired a coffee and chicory taste that it is doubtful if they would appreciate a real cup of coffee should they ever meet it. This, of course, is a generalization, and like all generalizations, is dangerous, for it is possible to obtain good coffee, properly made, in any European country, even England, in the homes of the people, but seldom in the hotels or restaurants. Austria Coffee is made in Austria after the French style, usually by the drip method or in the pumping percolator device, commonly called the Vienna coffee machine. The restaurants employ a large-size urn fitted with a combination metal sieve and cloth sack. After the ground coffee has infused for about six minutes, a screw device raises the metal sieve, the pressure forcing the liquid through the cloth sack containing the ground coffee. Vienna cafes are famous, but the World War has dimmed their glory. It used to be said that their equal could not be found for general excellence and moderate prices. From half-past eight to ten in the morning, large numbers of people were wont to breakfast in them on a cup of coffee or tea with a roll and butter. Melange is with milk, brown coffee is darker, and a schwarze is without milk. In all the cafes, the visitor may obtain coffee, tea, liquors, ices, bottled beer, ham, eggs, etc. The Café Schrangel in the Graben is typical. Then there are the dairies with coffee, a unique institution. In the Prater, public park, there are many interesting cafes. Charles J. Rosebold says in the New York Times, The cafe of Vienna has been imitated all over the world, but the result has never failed to be an imitation. 
the nearest approach to the genuine in my experience was the upstairs room of the old Fleischmann Café in New York. That was because the average New Yorker knew it not and it remained sacred to the internationalists, the musicians, artists, writers, and other bohemians to whom had been entrusted the secret of its existence. It's the spirit that counts, and it was the spirit of its frequenters that made the Vienna Café. It was every man's club, and every woman's too, where one went to relax and forget all the worries of existence, to look over papers and magazines from all parts of the world and printed in every known language, to play chess or scat or tarak, to chat with friends and to drink the inimitable Viennese coffee, the fragrance of which can no more be described than the perfume of last year's violets. The café was filled after the noon meal, when busy men took their coffee and smoked, again around five o'clock, when all the world and his wife paraded around the Graben and the Kärtnerstrasse, and then dropped into a favorite café for coffee or chocolate and cakes, horns and crescents of delicious dough filled with jam, or possibly the wonderful Kugelhopf, in comparison with which our sponge is like unto lead. Finally, in the evening, when there were family parties and those returning from theaters and concerts and opera. While the cafe life of Vienna has been nearly killed by the World War, it is to be hoped that time will restore at least something of its former glory. In spite of the stories of plundering bands of Bolshevists that in the latter part of 1921 wrecked some of the better known places, we read that Oscar Strauss, composer of The Chocolate Soldier, is living in comparative luxury in Vienna and spends most of his time in the cafes, where he is to be found usually from two until five in the afternoon and from eleven o'clock at night until some early hour of the morning, surrounded by musicians of lesser note and wealth, whom, to a degree, he supports also with him being many of the leading composers, libertists, actors, actresses, and singers of Vienna. For Vienna coffee, the liquor is usually made in a pumping percolator or by the drip process. In normal times, it is served two parts coffee to one of hot milk, topped with whipped cream. During 1914 to 18 and the recent post-war period, however, the sparkling crown of delicious whipped cream gave way to condensed milk, and saccharin took the place of sugar. Belgium In Belgium, the French drip method is most generally employed. Chicory is freely used as a modifier. The greatest coffee drinker among reigning monarchs is said to be the king of the Belgians. His majesty takes a cup of coffee before breakfast after breakfast, at his noonday meal, in the afternoon, after dinner, and again in the evening. British Isles In the British Isles, coffee is still being boiled, although the infusion, true percolation, drip, and filtration methods have many advocates. A favorite device is the earthenware jug with or without the cotton sack that makes it a coffee biggin. When used without the sack, the best practice is first to warm the jug. For each pint of liquor, one ounce, three dessert spoonfuls, of freshly ground coffee is put in the pot. Upon it is poured freshly boiling water, three-fourths of the amount required. After stirring with a wooden spoon, the remainder of the water is poured in, and the pot is returned to the hob to infuse, and to settle for from three to five minutes. Some stir it a second time before the final settling. The best trade authorities stress home grinding and are opposed to boiling the beverage. They advocate also its use as a breakfast beverage after lunch and after the evening meal. From an American point of view, the principal defects in the English method of making coffee lie in the roasting, handling, and brewing. It has been charged that the beans are not properly cooked in the first place and that they are too often stale before being ground. The English run to a light or cinnamon roast, whereas the best American practice requires a medium, high, or city roast. A fairly high shade of brown is favored on the South Downs, with a light shade for Lancashire, the West Riding of Yorkshire, and the South of Scotland. The trade demands, for the most part, a ripe chestnut brown. Wholesale roasting is done by gas and coke machines. 
while retail dealers used mostly a small type of inner heated gas machine. The large gas machines with capacities running from 25 to 700 pounds have external air blast burners, direct and indirect burners, sliding burners, etc. The best known are the Falder and Morewood machines. In the Uno, a popular retail machine, roasting 7 to 14 pounds at a time, the coffee beans are placed in the space between outer and inner concentric cylinders, one made of perforated steel and the other of wire gauze revolving together. A gas flame of the Bunsen type burns inside the inner cylinder, its heat traversing the outer or coffee cylinder, while the fumes are driven off through the open ends. The roasting coffee may be viewed through a mica or wire gauze panel inserted in the wall of the outer cylinder. The Falder machine has an external flame, a capacity of from 7 to 14 pounds. And there are quick gas machines, with capacities ranging from 3 pounds to 224 pounds for the retail trade. In recent years, there has been a marked improvement in English coffee roasting, due to the intelligent study brought to bear upon the subject by leaders of the trade's thought and by the retail distributor, who, in the person of the retail grocer, is, generally speaking, better educated to his business than the retail grocer in any other country. Years ago, it was the practice to use butter or lard to improve the appearance of the bean in roasting, but this is not so common as formerly. The British customer, however, will need much instruction before the national character of the beverage shows a uniform improvement. While the coffee may be more carefully roasted, better cooked than it was formerly, it is still remaining too long unsold after roasting, or else it is being ground too long a time before making. These abuses are, however, being corrected, and the customer is everywhere being urged to buy his coffee freshly roasted and to have it freshly ground. Another factor has undoubtedly contributed to give England a bad name among lovers of good coffee, and that is certain tinned coffees, composed of ground coffee and chicory, mixtures that attain some vogue for a time as French coffee. They found favor perhaps because they were easily handled. Package coffees have not been developed in England as in America but there is a more or less limited field for them, and there are several good brands of absolutely pure coffee on the market. The demitasse is a popular drink after luncheon, after dinner, and even during the day, especially in the cities. In London, there are cafes that make a specialty of it. Places like Peel's, Groom's, and the Café Nero in the city. Also, the shops of the London Café Company and Ye Mecca Company. While in the home, it is customary to steep the coffee. In hotels and restaurants, some form of percolating apparatus, extractor, or steam machine is employed. There are the criterion, employing a drip tray for making coffee in the Etzenberger style, fountain, plateau, siphon, napier, and very thing extractors, put out by Summerling & Company of London and the well-known J&S rapid coffee-making machine having an infuser and producing coffee by steam pressure manufactured by W. M. Still & Sons Limited, London. American visitors complain that coffee in England is too thick and syrupy for their liking. Coffee in restaurants is served white with milk or black in earthen, stoneware, or silver pots. In chain restaurants like Lyons or the ABC, there is to be found on the tariff hot milk with a dash of coffee. As to the boiling method, this is already generally discredited in the countries of Western Europe. The steeping method, so much favored in England, may be responsible for some of the unkind things said about English coffee because it undoubtedly leads to the abuse of over-infusion, so that the net result is as bad as boiling. The vast majority of the English people are, however, confirmed tea drinkers, and it is extremely doubtful if this national habit, ingrained through centuries of use of the cup that cheers at breakfast and at tea time in the afternoon, can ever be changed. As already mentioned in this work, the London coffee houses of the 17th and 18th century gave way to a type of coffee house whose mainstay was its food rather than its drink. 
in time these too began to yield to the changing influences of a civilization that demanded modern hotels luxurious tea lounges smart restaurants chain shops tea rooms and cafes with and without coffee a certain type of coffee shop with rough boarded stalls sanded floors and private rooms frequented by the lower class working men were to be found in england for a time but because of their doubtful character they were closed up by the police among other places in london where coffee may be had in english or continental style mention should be made of the cafe monaco a good place to drop in for a coffee and liquor and one of the pioneers of the modern restaurant gatti's where the cafe filtre or coffee produced by the filtration method is a specialty the cosmopolitan savoy with its popular tea lounge teas sixty cents the piccadilly hotel with its louis the fourteenth restaurant catering to refined and luxurious tastes the waldorf hotel with its american clientele and its palm court teas thirty six cents the cecil with its palm court and tea balcony also having a special attraction for americans lyon's popular cafe iced coffee twelve cents the trocadero with its special indian curries prepared by native cooks once each week the temple bar restaurant an attractive refectory owned by the semi-philanthropic trust houses limited which runs some two hundred similar establishments throughout the country serving alcoholic drinks but stressing non-intoxicating beverages among them special mocha at six and eight cents a cup slater's limited catering mostly to business folk in the city there being about a score of restaurants and tea-rooms under this name with retail shops attached the british tea table association like slater's a grown-up sister of the olden bun shop of queen victoria's day and the cardama chain of cafes where one is reasonably sure to get a satisfying cup of coffee and a cake supplementing the above charles cooper sometime editor of the epicure and the table has prepared for this work some notes on the evolution of the old-time london coffee houses into the present-day tea-rooms tea lounges cafes and restaurants for all comers mr cooper says of the transformation the old-fashioned london coffee-house that flourished forty to fifty years ago has within the past thirty years been completely extinguished by the modern tea-rooms these old-fashioned establishments were mainly situated in and about the strand and fleet street the neighbourhood of the inns of court etc they did not sacrifice much to outside show and decoration they were divided into boxes or pews and were generally speaking clean and well ordered the prices were moderate and the fare simple but superlatively good there is nothing to equal it now chops were cooked in the grill the tea and coffee were of the best the hams were york hams and the bacon the best wiltshire they were the last places where real buttered toast was made the art is now lost they catered exclusively to men and their clientele consisted of journalists artists actors men from the inns of court students at alita a man living in chambers could breakfast comfortably at one of these places and read all the morning papers at his ease the most westerly perhaps of the old houses was stones in panton street haymarket which has recently been sold grooms in fleet street where a good cup of coffee may still be had is principally frequented by barristers about the luncheon hour they are usually men who lunch lightly the tea-rooms as i have said have killed the coffee-houses at the time the latter flourished there were no facilities in london for a woman unattended by a man to obtain refreshment beyond a weak cup of tea at a few confectioners it mattered the less in the days when the girl clerk had not come into being when the field of women's employment widened fresh requirements were created which the coffee-shops did not meet the tea-room pioneers in london were the aerated bread company familiarly known as the a b c i think that coffee palaces in provincial industrial centres had been started but as part of the temperance propaganda to counteract the attractions of the public house the aerated bread company was founded about the middle of the past century for the manufacture and sale of bread made under the patent aerated process of dr dowgleish 
The shops were open for the sale of bread to the public for home consumption, but to give people an opportunity of testing it, facilities were provided for obtaining a cup of tea and bread and butter on the premises. This subsidiary object became in a short time the most important part of the company's business. It multiplied its shops, enlarged its bill of fare to include cooked foods, and while nowadays the ABC and its rival cater to many thousands daily, I doubt if anybody ever buys a loaf to take home. The fare in all these places is much alike, as are the general equipment, prices and class of customers. They cater for a cheap class of business. In the busy centres they are frequented mostly by young men and girl clerks and shop assistants by women in town, shopping and such like custom. Young employees can get a modest midday meal at a price to suit a shallow pocket. Before the war, the ruling price for a cup of tea and a roll and butter was fourpence, and the general tariff in proportion. Nowadays, the war has run up prices at least 50%. During the worst times of food control, the fare was very scanty and very unappetizing. As a rule, it is plain and wholesome, with no pretense of being recherché. Tea is almost always very good, coffee not on the same level. Their tea rooms are all places designed for small, quick meals, and are in no sense lounges. Lions have refreshment houses of different grades. The popular cafe is a cut above the tea rooms, and so are the corner houses. Two years ago the ABC amalgamated with Buzzards, an old establishment confectioners in Oxford Street, a famous cake house. The Monaco and Gatties appealed to a quite different class from that catered to by the tea shops, although perhaps not to what Mrs. Boffin would call the high flyers of fashion who frequent the lounges of the fashionable hotels. Gatties's original cafe was under the arches of Charing Cross Station. I may add about the Savoy that it was an outcome of the successful Gilbert and Sullivan operas of the 70s, Doily Cart having expended some of his profits on building the hotel on a piece of waste ground by the Savoy Theatre. He brought over M. Ritz from Monte Carlo to manage the hotel and restaurant, and Escoffier, the greatest chef of the day, to preside over the cuisine. They made the Savoy famous for its dinners, and it has always maintained a high reputation, although Escoffier, who has now retired, ruled later at the Carlton, and Ritz at the hotel in Piccadilly, which bears his name. Bulgaria In Bulgaria, Arabian Turkish methods of making coffee prevail. The accompanying illustration shows a group in a caravan of the faithful on the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. The venerable Muslim, who is ambitious of becoming a haji, is attended by his guards, distinguished by their fantastic dress, their glittering golden-hafted hanjars stuck in their shawl girdles, and their silver-mounted pistols, the grave turban replaced by a many-tasseled cap. Their accommodation is the stable of a khan, or serai, sheared with their camel. Their refreshment is coffee, thick, black, and bitter, served by the kanji in tiny egg-shaped cups. In Denmark and Finland, coffee is made and served after the French and German fashion. France Were it not for the almost inevitable high roast and frequently the disconcerting chicory edition, coffee in France might be an unalloyed delight. At least this is how it appears to American eyes. One seldom, if ever, finds coffee improperly brewed in France. It is never boiled. Second only to the United States, France consumes about two million bags of coffee annually. The varieties include coffee from the East Indies, mocha, Haitian, a great favorite, Central American, Colombian, and Brazil's. Although there are many wholesale and retail coffee roasters in France, home roasting persists, particularly in the country districts. The little sheet iron cylinder roasters that are hand turned over an iron box holding the charcoal fire find a ready sale even in the modern department stores of the big cities. In any village or city in France, it is a common sight on a pleasant day to find the householder turning his roaster on the curb in front of his home. 
Emmett G. Beeson in the Tea and Coffee Trade Journal gives us this vignette of rural coffee roasting in the south of France. In a certain town in the south of France, I saw an old man with an outfit a little larger than the home variety, a machine with a capacity of about 10 pounds. Instead of a cylinder in which to roast his coffee, he had perched on a sheet iron frame a hollow round ball made of sheet iron. In the top of this ball there was a little slide which was opened by the means of a metal tool. In the sheet iron frame he had kindled his charcoal fire. Directly in front of his roaster was a homemade cooling pan, the sides of which were of wood, the bottom covered with a fine grade of wire screening. On this particular afternoon, the old man had taken up his place on the curb, and the big black cat had taken advantage of the warmth offered by the charcoal fire and was curled up sleeping peacefully in the pan nearest the fire. The old man paid no attention to the cat, but went on rotating his ball of coffee and puffing away pensively on his cigarette. When his coffee had become blackened and burned, and blackened and burned it was, he stopped rotating the ball, opened the slide in the top, turned it over, and the hot, burned coffee rolled out, and much to his delight, on the sleeping cat, which leaped out of the pan and scampered up the street and into a hole under an old building. I afterward learned that this old fellow made a business of going about the town gathering up coffee from the houses along the way and roasting it at a few sous per kilo, much the same fashion as a scissors grinder plies his trade in an American town. Quite a few grocers roast their own coffee in crude devices much like those described above, but the large coffee roasters are gradually eliminating this sort of procedure. There are at Havre several roasters, but only two of importance. One does a business of about 250 bags a day, and the next largest has a capacity of about 160 bags a day. In Paris, there are many coffee roasters, some quite large, comparatively speaking, one having a capacity of about 750 bags a day. Shopkeepers in Paris and other large cities roast their coffee fresh daily. The machines used are of the ball or cylinder type, employing gas fuel and turned by electric power. Invariably, they stand where they may be seen from the street. Sample roasters, or testing tables, in France are conspicuous by their absence. Inquiry regarding this subject discloses that coffee is sold on description. And when the French trader is asked, how do you know your delivery is up to description so far as cup quality is concerned, he answers that this is arrived at from the general appearance and the smell of the coffee in the green. Perhaps one reason for the laxity in buying cup quality may be explained by the fact that coffee is roasted very high in fact, it is burned almost to a charred state, and unless the coffee is unusually bad in character, the burned taste eliminates any foreign flavor it may have. The fact that coffee was, and still is, quite generally sold to the consumer green, accounts for Central American coffees taking first place. Style takes preference over everything else when it comes to selling to a Frenchman. To the American coffee merchant, it seems that the French are carrying their artistic tastes to an unreasonable extreme when they apply them to coffee, for coffee is grown to drink and not to look at. Since the coming of the large coffee roaster who delivers roasted coffee right down the line to the consumer, Santos has come in for its share of the business. The roasters are getting good results out of Santos blends, up to 50% and 60% with West Indian and Central American coffees. Rio is as much in disfavor in France as it is in the United States, perhaps more so. In Brittany, the demand is for pea berry coffee, no matter of what variety. This comes about from the fact that the people of this section of the country still do a great deal of their roasting at home and have become accustomed to the use of pea berry coffee because they do not have the improved hand roasters and still do a great deal of their roasting in pans in the ovens of their stoves. The pea berry coffee rolls about so nicely in the pan that they get a much more uniform roast. 
nearly all the coffee is ground at home, which is not a bad practice for the consumer, but perhaps works hardship on the dealer, who can mix some grade grinders into his blends without doing them any material harm. Where coffee mills are used in the stores, there are of the strong arm family and of an ancient heritage. To get a growl out of the grocer in France, buy a kilo of coffee and ask him to grind it. Package coffee and proprietary brands have not come into their own to the extent that they have in the United States, although there are at present two firms in Paris which have started in this business and are advertising extensively on billboards, in streetcars, and in the subways. However, most coffee is still sold in bulk. The butter, egg, and cheese stores of France do a very large business in coffee. Prior to the war and high prices, there were some very large firms doing a premium business in coffee, tea, spices, etc. They still exist and have a very fine trade. But since the high prices of coffees and premiums, the business has gone down very materially. They operate by the wagon route and solicitor method, just as some of our American companies do. One very large firm in Paris has been in this business for more than 30 years, operating branches and wagons in every town, village, and hamlet in France. The consumption of coffee is increasing very materially in France. Some say on account of the high price of wine. Others hold that coffee is simply growing in favor with the people. Among the masses, French breakfast consists of a bowl or a cup of café au lait or half a cup or bowl of strong black coffee and chicory, and half a cup of hot milk, and a yard of bread. The working man turns his bread on end and inserts it into his bowl of coffee, allowing it to soak up as much of the liquid as possible. Then he proceeds to suck this concoction into his system. His approval is demonstrated by the amount of noise he makes in the operation. Among the better classes, the breakfast is the same, café au lait, with rolls and butter, and sometimes fruit. The brew is prepared by the drip, or true percolator method, or by filtration. Boiling milk is poured into the cup from a pot held in one hand together with the brewed coffee from a pot held in the other, providing a simultaneous mixture. The proportions vary from half and half to one part coffee and three parts milk. Sometimes the service is by pouring into the cup a little coffee and then the same quantity of milk and alternating in this way until the cup is filled. Coffee is never drunk with any meal but breakfast, but is invariably served on demitas after the noon and the evening meals. In the home, the usual thing after luncheon or dinner is to go into the salon and have your demitasse and liquor and cigarettes before a cozy great fire. A Frenchman's idea of after-dinner coffee is a brew that is unusually thick and black, and he invariably takes it with his liquor, no matter if he has had a cocktail for an appetizer, a bottle of red wine with his meat course, and a bottle of white wine with the salad and dessert course. When the demitasse comes along, with it must be served his cordial in the shape of cognac, benedictine, or creme de menthe. He cannot conceive of a man not taking a little alcohol with his after-dinner coffee as an aid, he says, to digestion. In Normandy, there prevails a custom in connection with coffee drinking that is unique. They produce in this province great quantities of what is known as cidre, made from a particular variety of apple grown there, in other words, just plain hard cider. However, they distill this hard cider, <clears throat> and from the distillation, they get a drink called Calvados. The man from Normandy takes half a cup of coffee and refills the cup with Calvados, sweetened with sugar, and drinks it with seeming relish. Ice-cold coffee will almost sizzle when Calvados is poured into it. It tastes like a corkscrew, and one drink has the same effect as a crack on the head with a hammer. From the toddling age up, the Norman takes his calvados and coffee. In the south of France, they make a concoction from the residue of grapes. They boil the residue down in water and get a drink called mac, and it is used in much the same way as the Norman in the north uses calvados. Then there is also the very popular summertime drink known as masgran, 
which in that region means seltzer water and cold coffee, or what Americans might call a coffee highball. Making coffee in France has been, and will always be, by the drip and the filtration methods. The large hotels and cafes follow these methods almost entirely, and so does the housewife. When company comes and something unusual in coffee is to be served, Mr. Beeson says he has known the cook to drip the coffee using a spoonful of hot water at a time, pouring it over tightly packed, finely ground coffee, allowing the water to percolate through to extract every particle of oil. They use more ground coffee in bulk than they get liquid in the cup and sometimes spend an hour producing four or five demitas. It is needless to say that it is more like molasses than coffee when ready for drinking. It is not unusual in some parts of France to save the coffee grounds for a second or even a third infusion, but this is not considered good practice. Von Liebig's idea of correct coffee making has been adapted to French practice in some instances after this fashion. Put used coffee grounds in the bottom chamber of a drip coffee pot. Put freshly ground coffee in the upper chamber. Pour on boiling water. The theory is that the old coffee furnishes body and strength, and the fresh coffee the aroma. The cafés that line the boulevards of Paris and the larger cities of France all serve coffee, either plain or with milk, and almost always with liquor. The coffee house in France may be said to be the wine house, or the wine house may be said to be the coffee house. They are inseparable. In the smallest or the largest of these establishments, coffee can be had at any time of day or night. The proprietor of a very large café in Paris says his coffee sales during the day almost equal his wine sales. The French, young or old, take a great deal of pleasure in sitting out on the sidewalk in front of a café, sipping coffee or liquor. Here they love to idle away the time just watching the passing show. In Paris, there are hundreds of these cafés lining the boulevards where one may sit for hours before the small tables reading the newspapers, writing letters, or merely idling. In the morning, from 8 to 11, employees, men about town, tourists, and provincials throng the cafés for café au lait. The waiters are coldly polite. They bring the papers and brush the table twice for café crème, milk, and three times for café complet with bread and butter. In the afternoon, café means a small cup or glass of café noir, or café nature. It is double the usual amount of coffee dripped by percolator or filtration device, the process consuming eight to ten minutes. Some understand café noir to mean equal parts of coffee and brandy with sugar and vanilla to taste. When café noir is mixed with an equal quantity of cognac alone, it becomes café gloria. Café masgran is also much in demand in the summertime. The coffee base is made as for café noir, and it is served in a tall glass with water to dilute it to one's taste. A few of the cafés that made Paris famous in the 18th century survive. Among those that are notable for their coffee service are the Café de la Paix, Café de la Régence, founded in 1718, and the Café Prévost, noted also for chocolate after the theater. End of section 66. Section 67 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matea Bracic. All About Coffee by William Uckers. World's Coffee Manners and Customs, Part 4 Germany Germany originated the afternoon coffee function known as the Kaffeeklatsch. Even today, the German family's reunion takes place around the coffee table on Sunday afternoons. In summer, when weather permits, the family will take a walk into the suburbs and stop at a garden where coffee is sold in pots. The proprietor furnishes the coffee, the cups, the spoons, and, in normal times, the sugar, two pieces to each cup, and the patrons bring their own cake. They put one piece of sugar into each bowl and take the other pieces home to the canary bird, meaning the sugar bowl in the pantry. 
Cheaper coffee is served in some gardens, which conspicuously display large signs at the entrance, saying families may cook their own coffee in this place. In such a garden, the patron merely buys the hot water from the proprietor, furnishing the ground coffee and cake himself. While waiting for the coffee to brew, he may listen to the band and watch the children play under the trees. French or Vienna drip pots are used for brewing. Every city in Germany has its cafes, spacious places where patrons sit around small tables drinking coffee with or without, turned or unturned, steaming or iced, sweetened or unsweetened, depending on the sugar supply. Nibble, at the same time, a piece of cake or pastry selected from a glass pyramid. Talk, flirt, malign, yawn, read, and smoke. Cafes are, in fact, public reading rooms. Some places keep hundreds of daily and weekly newspapers and magazines on file for the use of patrons. If the customer buys only one cup of coffee, he may keep his seat for hours and read one newspaper after another. Three of the four corners of Berlin's most important street crossing are occupied by cafes. This is where Unter den Linden and Friedrichstraße meet. On the southwest corner, there is Kranzer's staid old cafe, a very respectable place, where the lower hall is even reserved for non-smokers. On the southeast corner is Café Bauer, known the world over. However, it has seen better days. It has been outdistanced by competitors. On the northeast corner is the Victoria, a new style place, very bright and less staid. There, no room is reserved for non-smokers, for most of the ladies, if they do not themselves smoke, will light the cigars for their escorts. Around the Potsdamer Platz there is a number of cafes. Justis is perhaps the most frequented in Berlin. It is the best liked on account of the trees and terraces in the front. Farther to the west, on Kuhfürstendamm, there are dozens of large cafes. Some of the cafés are meeting places for certain professions and trades. The Admiral's Café, in Friedrichstraße, for instance, is the artist's exchange. All the stage folk and stars of the Tambark meet there every day. Chorus girls, tumblers, ladies of the flying trapeze, contortionists and bareback riders are to be found there, discussing their grievances, denouncing their managers, swapping their diamonds, and recounting former triumphs. Cinema makers come also to pick out a cast for a new film play. There, one can pick out a full cast every minute. Then there is the Café des Westens in Kuhfürstendamm, the old one, where dreamers and poets congregate. It is called also Café Größenwahn, which means that persons suffering from an exaggerated ego are conspicuous by their presence and their long hair. At almost every table one may find a poet who has written a play that is bound to enrich its author and any man of means who will put up the money to build a new theatre in which to produce it. Saxony and Thuringia are proverbial hotbeds of coffee lovers. It is said that in Saxony there are more coffee drinkers to the square inch and more cups to the single coffee bean than anywhere else upon earth. The Saxons like their coffee, but seem to be afraid it may be too strong for them. So, when over their cups, they always make certain they can see bottom before raising the steaming bowl to the lip. Von Liebig's method of making coffee, whereby three-fourths of the quantity to be used is first boiled for ten or fifteen minutes, and the remainder added for a six-minute steeping or infusion, is religiously followed by some housekeepers. Von Liebig advocated coating the bean with sugar. In some families, fats, eggs, and eggshells are used to settle and to clarify the beverage. Coffee in Germany is better cooked, roasted, and more scientifically prepared than in many other European countries. In recent years, during the World War and since, however, there has been an amazing increase in the use of coffee substitutes, so that the German cup of coffee is not the pure delight it was once. Greece Coffee is the most popular and most extensively used non-alcoholic beverage in Greece, as it is throughout the Near East. Its annual per capita consumption there is about two pounds. 
two-thirds of the supply coming via Austria and France, Brazil furnishing direct the bulk of the remaining third. Coffee is given a high or city roast and is used almost entirely in powder form. It is prepared for consumption principally in the Turkish demitasse way. Finely ground coffee is used even in making ordinary table or breakfast coffee. In private houses, the cylindrical brass hand grinders, manufactured in Constantinople, are mostly used. In many of the coffee houses in the villages and country towns throughout Greece and the Levant, a heavy iron pestle, wielded by a strong man, is employed to pulverize the grains in a heavy stone or marble mortar while the poorer homes use a small brass pestle and mortar, also manufactured in Turkey. In his The Greeks of the Present Day, Edmund François Valentin Abot says, The coffee which is drunk in all the Greek houses rather astonishes the travelers who have neither seen Turkey nor Algeria. One is surprised at finding food in a cup in which one expected drink yet you get accustomed to this coffee broth and end by finding it more savory lighter more perfumed and especially more wholesome than the extract of coffee you drink in france then abu gives the recipe of his servant petros who is the first man in athens for coffee the grain is roasted without burning it it is reduced to an impalpable powder either in a mortar or in a very close-grained mill Water is set on the fire till it boils up. It is taken off to throw in a spoonful of coffee and a spoonful of pounded sugar for each cup it is intended to make. It is carefully mixed. The coffee pot is replaced on the fire until the contents seem ready to boil over. It is taken off and set on again. Lastly, it is quickly poured into the cups. Some coffee drinkers have this preparation boiled as many as five times. Petrus makes a rule of not putting his coffee more than three times on the fire. He takes care in filling the cups to divide impartially the colored froth which rises above the coffee pot. It is the kaimaki of the coffee. A cup without kaimaki is disgraced. When the coffee is poured out, you are at liberty to drink it boiling and muddy, or cold and clear. Real amateurs drink it without waiting. Those who allow the sediment to settle down do not do so from contempt, for they afterwards collect it with the little finger and eat it carefully. Thus prepared, coffee may be taken without inconvenience ten times a day. Five cups of French coffee could not be drunk with impunity every day. It is because the coffee of the Turks and the Greeks is a diluted tonic, and ours is a concentrated tonic. I have met at Paris many people who took their coffee without sugar to imitate the Orientals. I think I ought to give them notice, between ourselves, that in the great coffee houses of Athens, sugar is always presented with the coffee. In the cons and second-rate coffee houses, it is served already sugared, and that at Smyrna and Constantinople, it has everywhere been brought to me sugared. Italy in italy coffee is roasted in a wholesale and retail way as well as in the home french german dutch and italian machines are used the full city or italian roast is favored there are cafes as in france and other continental countries and the drink is prepared in the french fashion for restaurants and hotels rapid filtering machines first developed by the french and italians are used in the homes percolators and filtration devices are employed the de Mattia brothers have a process designed to conserve the aroma in roasting. The Italians pay particular attention to the temperature in roasting and in the cooling operation. There is considerable glazing, and many coffee additions are used. Like the French, the Italians make much of café au lait for breakfast. At dinner, the café noir is served. Cafés of the French school are to be found along the Corso in Rome, the Toledo in Naples, in the Galleria Vittorio Emanuele, and the Piazza del Duomo in Milan, and in the arcades surrounding the Piazza San Marco in Venice, where Florian's still flourishes. Netherlands In the Netherlands, too, the French café is a delightful feature of the life of the larger cities. The Dutch roast coffee properly and make it well. 
The service is in individual pots or in demitas on a silver, nickel, or brass tray and accompanied by a miniature pitcher containing just enough cream, usually whipped, a small dish about the size of an individual butter plate holding three squares of sugar and a slender glass of water. This service is universal. The glass of water always goes with the coffee. It is the one sure way for Americans to get a drink of water. To repair to some open-air cafe or indoor coffee house for the after-dinner cup of coffee. One seldom takes his coffee in the place where he has dinner. These cafes are many and some are elaborately designed and furnished. One of the most interesting is the St. Joris at The Hague, furnished in the old Dutch style. The approved way of making coffee in Holland is the French drip method. Norway and Sweden French and German influences mark the roasting, grinding, preparing and serving of coffee in Norway and Sweden. Generally speaking, not so much chicory is used and a great deal of whipped cream is employed. In Norway, the boiling method has many followers. A big, open, copper kettle is used. This is filled with water and the coffee is dumped in and boiled. In the poorer class country homes, the copper kettle is brought to the table and set upon a wooden plate. The coffee is served directly from the kettle in cups. In better class homes, the coffee is poured from the kettle into silver coffee pots in the kitchen and the silver coffee pots are brought to the table. The only thing approaching coffee houses are the coffee rooms, which are to be found in Christiania. These are small one-room affairs in which the plainer sorts of foods, such as porridge, may be purchased with the coffee. They are cheap and are largely frequented by the poorer class of students, who use them as places in which to study while they drink their coffee. In Russia and Switzerland, French and German methods obtain. Russia, however, drinks more tea than coffee, which by the masses is prepared in Turkish fashion, when obtainable. Usually, the coffee is only a cheap substitute. The so-called café à la russe of the aristocracy is strong black coffee flavored with lemon. Another Russian recipe calls for the coffee to be placed in a large punch bowl and covered with a layer of finely chopped apples and pears. Then cognac is poured over the mass and a match applied. Romania and Serbia drink coffee prepared after either the Turkish or the French style, depending on the class of drinker and where it is served. Substitutes are numerous. In Spain and Portugal, the French type of café flourishes as in Italy. In Madrid, some delightful cafés are to be found around the Puerto del Sol, where coffee and chocolate are the favorite drinks. The coffee is made by the drip process and is served in French fashion. Coffee Manners and Customs in North America The introduction of coffee and tea into North America affected a great change in the mealtime beverages of the people. Malt beverages had been succeeded by alcoholic spirits and by cider. These in turn were supplanted by tea and coffee. Canada In Canada we find both French and English influences at work in the preparation and serving of the beverage. Yankee ideas also have entered from across the border. Some years back, about 1910, A. McGill, chief chemist of the Canadian Inland Revenue Department, suggested an improvement upon Baron von Liebig's method, whereby Canadians might obtain an ideal cup of coffee. It was to combine two well-known methods. One was to boil a quantity of ground coffee to get a maximum of body or soluble matter. The other was to percolate a similar quantity to get the needed caffeol. By combining the decoction and the infusion, a finished beverage rich in body and aroma might be had. Most Canadians continue to drink tea, however, although coffee consumption is increasing. Mexico in Mexico, the natives have a custom peculiarly their own. The roasted beans are pounded to a powder in a cloth bag, which is then immersed in a pot of boiling water and milk. The vaquero, however, pours boiling water on the powdered coffee in his drinking cup and sweetens it with a brown sugar stick. Among the upper classes in Mexico, the following interesting method obtains for making coffee. Roast one pound until the beans are brown inside. 
Mix with the roasted coffee one teaspoonful of butter, one of sugar, and a little brandy. Cover with a thick cloth. Cool for one hour, then grind. Boil one quart of water. When boiling, put in the coffee and remove from fire immediately. Let it stand a few hours and strain through a flannel bag and keep in a stone jar until required for use. Then heat quantity required. United States In no country has there been so marked an improvement in coffee making as in the United States. Although in many parts the national beverage is still indifferently prepared, the progress made in recent years has been so great that the friends of coffee are hopeful that before long it may be said truly that coffee making in America is a national honor and no longer the national disgrace that it was in the past. Already in the more progressive homes and in the best hotels and restaurants, the coffee is uniformly good and the service all that it should be. The American breakfast cup is a food beverage because of the additions of milk or cream and sugar. And unlike Europe, this same generous cup serves again as a necessary part of the noonday and evening meals for most people. The important and indispensable part that sugar plays in the makeup of the American cup of coffee was ably set forth by Fred Mason, vice president of the American Sugar Refining Company, when he said, The coffee cup and the sugar bowl are inseparable table companions. Most of us did not realize this until the war came. With its attendant restrictions on everything we did, and we found that the sugar bowl had disappeared from all public eating places. No longer could we make an unlimited number of trips to the sugar bowl to sweeten our coffee, but we had to be content with what was doled out to us with scrupulous care, a quantity so small at times that it gave only a hint of sweetness to our national beverage. Then it was that we really appreciated how indispensable the proper amount of sugar was to a good, savory cup of coffee, and we missed it as much as we would seasoning from certain cooked foods. Secretly we consoled ourselves with the promise that if the day ever came when sugar bowls made their appearance once more, filled temptingly with the sweet granules that were gone but not forgotten, we should put an extra lump or an additional spoonful of sugar into our coffee to help us forget the joyless war days. Since sugar is so necessary to our enjoyment of this popular beverage, it is obvious that a considerable part of all the sugar we consume must find its way into the national coffee cup. The stupendous amount of 40 billion cups of coffee is consumed in this country each year. Taking two teaspoonfuls, or two lumps as a fair average per cup, we find that about 800 million pounds of sugar, almost one-tenth of our total annual consumption, are required to sweeten Uncle Sam's coffee cup. This is specially significant when one considers that, with the single exception of Australia, the United States consumes more sugar per capita than any country on earth. Sugar adds high food value to the stimulative virtues of coffee. The beverage itself stimulates the mental and physical powers, while the sugar it contains is fuel for the body and furnishes it with energy. Sugar is such a concentrated food that the amount used by the average person in two cups of coffee is enough to furnish the system with more energy than could be derived from 40 oysters on the half shell. Since prohibition, the average citizen is drinking 100 more cups of coffee a year than he did in the old days and a good part of the increase is attributed to newly formed habits of drinking coffee between meals at soda fountains in tea and coffee shops at hotels and even in the homes in other words the increase is due to coffee drinking that directly takes the place of malt and spirituous liquors there have come into being the hotel coffee room, the custom of afternoon coffee drinking, and free coffee service in many factories, stores, and offices. In colonial days, must or ale first gave way to tea, and then to coffee as a breakfast beverage. The Boston Tea Party clinched the case for coffee, but in the meantime coffee was more or less of an after-dinner function, or a between-meals drink, as in Europe. 
In Washington's time, dinner was usually served at three o'clock in the afternoon, and at informal dinner parties, the company sat till sunset, then coffee. In the early part of the 19th century, coffee became firmly entrenched as the one great American breakfast beverage, and its security in this position would seem to be unassailable for all time. Today, all classes in the United States begin and end the day with coffee. In the home, it is prepared by boiling, infusion or steeping, percolation and filtration. In the hotels and restaurants, by infusion, percolation and filtration. The best practice favors true percolation, French drip or filtration. Steeping coffee in American homes, an English heirloom, is usually performed in a china or earthenware jug. The ground coffee has boiling water poured upon it until the jug is half full. The infusion is stirred briskly. Next, the jug is filled by pouring in the remainder of the boiling water. The infusion is again stirred, then permitted to settle, and finally is poured through a strainer or filter cloth before serving. When a pumping percolator or a double glass filtration device is used, the water may be cold or boiling at the beginning as the maker prefers. Some wet the coffee with cold water before starting the brewing process. For genuine percolator or drip coffee, French and Austrian china drip pots are mostly employed. The latest filtration devices are described in chapter 34. The Creole or French market coffee, for which New Orleans has long been famous, is made from a concentrated coffee extract prepared in a drip pot. First, the ground coffee has poured over it sufficient boiling water thoroughly to dampen it, after which further additions of boiling water, a tablespoonful at a time, are poured upon it at five-minute intervals. The resulting extract is kept in a tightly corked bottle for making café au lait or café noir as required. A variant of the Creole method is to brown three tablespoonfuls of sugar in a pan to add a cup of water and to allow it to simmer until the sugar is dissolved. To pour this liquid over ground coffee in a drip pot, to add boiling water as required, and to serve black or with cream or hot milk as desired. In New Orleans, coffee is often served at the bedside upon waking as a kind of early breakfast function. The Philadelphia Centennial Exposition of 1876 served to introduce the Vienna Café to America. Fleischmann's Vienna Café and Bakery was a feature of our first international exposition. Afterward, it was transferred to Broadway, New York, where for many years it continued to serve excellent coffee in Vienna style next door to Grace Church. The opportunity is still waiting for the courageous soul who will bring back to our larger cities this Vienna Café or some Americanized form of the Continental or Sidewalk Café, making a specialty of tea, coffee, and chocolate. The old Astor House was famous for its coffee for many years, as was also Dorland's from 1840 to 1922. Members of the family of the late Colonel Roosevelt began to promote a Brazil coffee house enterprise in New York in 1919. It was first called Café Paulista, but it is now known as the Double R Coffee House, or Club of South America, with a Brazil branch in the 40s and an Argentine branch on Lexington Avenue. Coffee is made and served in Brazilian style, that is, full city roast, pulverized grind, filtration made. Service, black or with hot milk. Sandwiches, cakes and crullers are also to be had. One of New York's newest clubs is known as the Coffee House. It is in West 45th Street and has been in existence since December 1915 when it was opened with an informal dinner at which the late Joseph H. Choate, one of the original members, outlined the purpose and policies of the club. The founders of the coffee house were convinced, as the result of the high dues and constantly increasing formality and discipline in the social clubs in New York, that there was need here for a moderate-priced eating and meeting place, which should be run in the simplest possible way and with the least possible expense. At the beginning of its career, the club framed, adopted, and has since lived up to a most informal constitution. No officers, 
no liveries, no tips, no set speeches, no charge accounts, no rules. The membership is made up, for the most part, of painters, writers, sculptors, architects, actors, and members of other professions. Members are expected to pay cash for all orders. There are no proposals of candidates for membership. The club invites to join it those whom it believes to be in sympathy with the ideals of its founders. The method of preparing coffee for individual service in the Waldorf Astoria, New York, which has been adopted by many first-class hotels and restaurants that do not serve urn-made coffee exclusively, is the French drip plus careful attention to all the contributing factors for making coffee in perfection, and is thus described by the hotel's steward. A French china drip coffee pot is used. It is kept in a warm heater, and when the coffee is ordered, this pot is scalded with hot water. A level tablespoonful of coffee, ground to about the consistency of granulated sugar, is put into the upper and percolator part of the coffee pot. Fresh boiling water is then poured through the coffee and allowed to percolate into the lower part of the pot. The secret of success, according to our experience, lies in having the coffee freshly ground and the water as near the boiling point as possible, all during the process. For this reason, the coffee pot should be placed on a gas stove or range. The quantity of coffee can be varied to suit individual taste. We use about 10% more ground coffee for after-dinner cups than we use for breakfast. Our coffee is a mixture of old government Java and Bogota. C. Scotty, chef at the Hotel Ambassador New York, thus describes the method of making coffee in that hostelry. In the first place, it is essential that the coffee be of the finest quality obtainable. Secondly, better results are obtained by using the French filterer or coffee bag. 12 ounces of coffee to 1 gallon of water for breakfast, 16 ounces of coffee to 1 gallon of water for dinner. Boiling water should be poured over the coffee, siphoned, and put back several times. We do not allow the coffee grounds to remain in the urn for more than 15 to 20 minutes at any time. The coffee service at the best hotels is usually in silver pots and pitchers, and includes the freshly made coffee, hot milk or cream, sometimes both, and domino sugar. Within the last year, 1921, many of the leading hotels and some of the big railway systems have adopted the custom of serving free a demitasse of coffee as soon as the guest traveler seats himself at the breakfast table or in the dining car. Small blacks, the waiters call them, or coffee cocktails, according to their fancy. At the Picot Coffee House, 91 Water Street, New York, a noonday restaurant in the heart of the coffee trade, an attempt has been made to introduce something of the old-time coffee house atmosphere. The child's chain of restaurants recently began printing on its menus, in brackets before each item, the number of calories as computed by an expert in nutrition. Coffee with a mixture of milk and cream is credited with 85 calories, a well-known coffee substitute with 70 calories, and tea with 18 calories. The child's chain of 92 restaurants serves 40 million cups of coffee a year, made from 375 tons of ground coffee and figuring an average of 53 cups to the pound. The Thompson chain of 100 restaurants serves 160,000 cups of coffee per day, or more than 58 million cups per year. Coffee Customs in South America Argentine Coffee is very popular as a beverage in Argentina. Café con leche, coffee with milk, in which the proportion of coffee may vary from one-fourth to two-thirds, is the usual Argentine breakfast beverage. A small cup of coffee is generally taken after meals, and it is also consumed to a considerable extent in cafes. Brazil In Brazil, everyone drinks coffee and at all hours. Cafes making a specialty of the beverage and modeled after continental originals are to be found aplenty in Rio de Janeiro, Santos, and other large cities. The custom prevails of roasting the beans high, almost to carbonization, 
grinding them fine and then boiling after the Turkish fashion, percolating in French drip pots, steeping in cold water for several hours, straining and heating the liquid for use as needed, or filtering by means of conical linen sacks suspended from wire rings. The Brazilian loves to frequent the cafes and to sip his coffee at his ease. He is very continental in this respect. The wide open doors and the round top marble tables with their small cups and saucers set around a sugar basin make inviting pictures. The customer pulls toward him one of the cups and immediately a waiter comes and fills it with coffee, the charge for which is about three cents. It is a common thing for a Brazilian to consume one dozen to two dozen cups of black coffee a day. If one pays a social visit, calls upon the President of the Republic, or any lesser official, or on a business acquaintance, it is a signal for an attendant to serve coffee. Café au lait is popular in the morning, but except for this service, milk or cream is never used. In Brazil, as in the Orient, coffee is a symbol of hospitality. In Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay, very much the same customs prevail of making and serving the beverage. Coffee drinking in other countries In Australia and New Zealand, English methods for roasting, grinding, and making coffee are standard. The beverage usually contains 30 to 40 percent chicory. In the bush, the water is boiled in a billy can. Then the powdered coffee is added. And when the liquid comes again to a boil, the coffee is done. In the cities, practically the same method is followed. The general rule in the Antipodes seems to be to let it come to a boil, and then to remove it from the fire. In Cuba, the custom is to grind the coffee fine, to put it in a flannel sack suspended over a receiving vessel, and to pour cold water on it. This is repeated many times until the coffee mass is well saturated. The first drippings are re-poured over the bag. The final result is a highly concentrated extract which serves for making café au lait or café noir as desired. In Martinique, coffee is made after the French fashion. In Panama, French and American methods obtain, as also in the Philippines. End of section 67. Section 68 of All About Coffee this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read to you by J.P. Liao. All About Coffee by Willem Euchers. Chapter 36. Preparation of the Universal Beverage. The Evolution of Grinding and Brewing Methods. Coffee was first a food, then a wine, a medicine, a devotional refreshment, a confection, and finally a beverage. Brewing by boiling, infusion, percolation, and filtration. Coffee making in Europe in the 19th century. Early coffee making in the United States. Latest developments in better coffee making. Various aspects of scientific coffee brewing. Advice to coffee lovers on how to buy coffee and how to make it in perfection. The coffee drink has had a curious evolution. It began not as a drink, but as a food ration. Its first use as a drink was a kind of wine. Civilization knew it first as a medicine, at one stage of its development, before it became generally accepted as a liquid refreshment, the berries found favor as a confection. As a beverage, its use probably dates back about 600 years. The protein and fat content, that is, the food value, of coffee, so far as civilized man is concerned, is an absolute waste. The only constituents that are of value are those that are water-soluble and can be extracted readily with hot water. When coffee is properly made, as by the drip method, either by percolation or filtration, the ground coffee comes in contact with the hot water for only a few minutes. So the major portion of the protein, which is not only practically insoluble, but coagulates on heating, remains in the unused part of the coffee, the grounds. The coffee bean contains a large percentage of protein, 14%. By comparing this figure with 21% of protein in peas, 23% in lentils, 26% in beans, 24% in peanuts, about 11% in wheat flour, and less than 9% in white bread, we learn how much of this valuable food stuff is lost with coffee grounds. Though civilized man, 
excepting the inhabitants of the Ile de Gua off the coast of Brittany, does not use this protein content of coffee. In certain parts of Africa, it has been put to use in a very ingenious and effective manner from time immemorial down to the present day. James Bruce, the Scottish explorer, in his travels to discover the source of the Nile in 1768 to 1773, found that this curious use of the coffee bean had been known for centuries. He brought back accounts and specimens of its use as a food in the shape of balls made of grease mixed with roasted coffee finely ground between stones. Other writers have told how the Gala, a wandering tribe of Africa, and like most wandering tribes, a warlike one, find it necessary to carry concentrated food on their long marches. Before starting on their marauding excursions, each warrior equips himself with a number of food balls. These prototypes of the modern food tablet are about the size of a billiard ball and consist of pulverized coffee held in shape with fat. One ball constitutes one day's ration, and although civilized man might find it impalpable, from the purely psychological standpoint, it is not only a concentrated and efficient food, but it has also the additional advantage of containing a valuable stimulant in the caffeine content which spurs the warrior on to maximum effort. And so, the savage in the African jungle has apparently solved two problems the utilization of coffee's protein, and the production of a concentrated food. Further research shows that perhaps as early as 800 AD, this practice started by crushing the whole ripe berries, beans, and hulls in mortars, mixing them with fats, and rounding them into food balls. Later, the dried berries were so used. The inhabitants of Gua also thrived on a diet that includes roasted coffee beans. About 900, a kind of aromatic wine was made in Africa from the fermented juice of the hulls and pulp of the ripe berries. Payne says that the first coffee drinkers did not think of the roasting, but, impressed by the aroma of the dried beans, they put them in cold water and drank the liquor saturated with their aromatic principles. Crushing the raw beans and hulls and seeping them in water was a later improvement. It appears that boiled coffee, the name is anathema today, was invented about the year 1000 AD. Even then, the beans were not roasted. We read about their use in medicine in the form of a decoction. The dried fruit, beans and hulls, were boiled in stone or clay cauldrons. The custom of using the sun-dried hulls without roasting still exists in Africa, Arabia, and some parts of southern Asia. The natives of Sumatra neglect the fruit of the coffee tree and use the leaves to make a tea-like infusion. Jardin relates that in Guiana, an agreeable tea is made by drying the young buds of the coffee tree and rolling them on a copper plate slightly heated. In Uganda, the natives eat raw berries. From bananas and coffee, they make also a sweet, savory drink, which is called Minghai. About 1200, the practice was common of making a decoction from the dried hulls alone. There followed the discovery that roasting improved the flavor. Even today, this drink is known as Sultan, or Sultana coffee. Café à la Sultan, or Kisha, continues in favor in Arabia. Credit for the invention of this beverage has been wrongfully given by various French writers to Dr. Andry, director of the Facility of Medicine in Paris. Dr. Andry had his own recipe for making Café à la Sultan, which was to boil the coffee hulls for half an hour. This gave a lemon-colored liquid which was drunk with a little sugar. The oriental procedure was to toast the hulls in an earthware pot over a charcoal fire, mixing in with them a small quantity of the silver skins and turning them over until they were slightly parched. The hulls and silver skins, in proportion of four to one, were then thrown into boiling water and well boiled again for at least half an hour. The color of the drink had some resemblance to the best English beer. La Roque assures us, and it required no sweetening, there being no bitterness to correct. This was still the coffee drink of the court of Yemen, and of people of distinction in the Levant. When La Roque and his fellow travelers made their celebrated voyage to Arabia the Happy in 1711-1713, to 1713, 
Sometime in the 13th century, the practice began of roasting the dried beans after the hulling process. This was done first in crude stone and earthenware trays, and later on metal plates, as described in chapter 34. A liquor was made from boiling the whole roasted beans. The next step was to pound the roasted beans to a powder with a mortar and pestle, and the decoction was then made by throwing the powder into boiling water, the drink being swallowed in its entirety, grounds and all. It was a decoction for the next four centuries. When the long-handled Arabian metal boiler made its appearance in the early part of the 16th century, the method of preparation and service had much improved. The Arabs and the Turks had made it a social adjunct, and its use was no longer confined to the physicians and the churchmen. It had become a stimulating refreshment for all the people, and at the same time, the Arabians and the Turks had developed a coffee ceremony for the higher classes, which was quite as wonderful as the tea ceremony of Japan. The common early method of preparation throughout the Levant was to steep the powder in water for a day, to boil the liquor halfway through, to strain it, and to keep it in earthen pots for use as wanted. In the 16th century, the smaller coffee broiler, or ibrik, caused the practice to be more of an instantaneous affair. The coffee was ground, and the powder was dropped into the boiling water to be withdrawn from the fire several times as it boiled up to the rim. While still boiling, cinnamon and cloves are sometimes added before pouring the liquid off into the finjans, or little china cups, to be served with the addition of a drop of essence of amber. Later, the Turks added sugar during the boiling process. From the first simple uncovered ebrick there was developed, about the middle of the 17th century, a larger size covered coffee broiler, the forerunner of the modern combustion brewing and serving pot. This was a copper-plated kettle, Pattern after the oriental ewer with a broad base, bulbous body, and narrow neck. After having poured into it one and a half times as much water as the dish, cup, in which the drink was to be served would hold, the pot was placed on a lively fire. When the water boiled, the powdered coffee was tossed into the pot, and as the liquid boiled up, it was taken from the fire and returned probably a dozen times. Then the pot was placed in hot ashes to permit the grounds to settle. This done, the drink was served. Dufour, describing this process as practiced in Turkey and Arabia, says, One ought not to drink coffee, but suck it in as hot as one can. In order not to be burnt, it is not necessary to place the tongue in the cup, but hold the edge against the tongue with the lips above and below it forcing it so little that the edges do not bear down, and then suck in. That is to say, swallow it sip by sip. If one is so delicate he cannot stand the bitterness, he can temper it with sugar. It is a mistake to stir the coffee in the pot, the grounds being worth nothing. In the Levant, it is only the scum of the people who swallow the grounds. Laroque says, The Arabians... When they take their coffee off the fire, immediately wrap the vessel in a wet cloth, which finds the liquor instantly, makes it cream at the top, and occasion a more pungent steam, which they take great pleasure in snuffing up as the coffee is pouring into the cups. They, like all other nations of the East, drink their coffee without sugar. Some of the Orientals afterward modified the early coffee-making procedure by pouring the boiling water on the powdered coffee in the serving cups. They thus obtained a foaming and perfumed beverage, says Jardin, to which we, the French, could not accustom ourselves because of the powder which remains in suspension. Nevertheless, clarified coffee may be obtained in the Orient. In Mecca, in order to filter it, they strain it through stopples of dried herbs put into the opening of a jar. Sugar seemed to be introduced into coffee in Cairo about 1625. Veselingus records that the coffee drinkers in Cairo's 3,000 coffee houses did begin to put sugar in their coffee to correct the bitterness of it, and that others made sugar plums of the coffee berries. This coffee confection later appeared in Paris, and about the same time in 1700 at Montpellier was introduced a coffee water a sort of rosa fulis of an agreeable scent that has somewhat of the smell of coffee roasted. These novelties, however, were designed to please only the most nice lovers of coffee, 
for ennui and boredom demanded new sensations then as now. Boiling continued to the favorite method of preparing the beverage until well into the 18th century. Meanwhile, we learn from English references that it was the custom to buy the beans of apothecaries, to dry them in an oven, or to roast them in an old pudding dish or frying pan before pounding them to a powder with mortar and pestle, to force the powder through a lawn sieve, and then to boil it with spring water for a quarter of an hour. The following recipe from a rare book published in London, 1662, details the manner of making coffee in the 17th century. Coffee making in 1662. To make the drink that is now much used called coffee. The coffee berries are to be bought at any druggist, about three shillings the pound. Take what quantity you please, and over a charcoal fire, in an old pudding pan or frying pan, keep them always stirring until they be quite black. And when you crack one with your teeth, that is, black within as it is without, yet if you exceed, then you do waste the oil, which only makes the drink, and if less, then will it not deliver its oil, which must make the drink. And if you should continue fire till it be white, it will then make no coffee, but only give you its salt. The berry prepared as above, beaten and forced through a lawn sieve, is then fit for use. Take clean water, and boil one-third of it away, what quantity soever it be, and is fit for use. Take one quart of this prepared water, put in it one ounce of your prepared coffee, and boil it gently one quarter of an hour, and it is fit for your use. Drink one quarter of a pint as hot as you can sip it. In England, about this time, the coffee drink was not infrequently mixed with sugar candy, and even with mustard. In the coffee houses, however, it was usually served black, without sugar or milk. About 1660, Newhoff, the Dutch ambassador to China, was the first to make a trial of coffee with milk in imitation of tea with milk. In 1685, Sir Monin, a celebrated doctor of Grenoble, France, first recommended café au lait as a medicine. He prepared it thus, place on the fire a bowl of milk, when it begins to rise, throw into it a bowl of powdered coffee, a bowl of moist sugar, and let it boil for some time. We read that in 1669, coffee in France was a hot black decoction of muddy grounds thickened with syrup. Angelo Rimbaldi, in his Ambrosia Arabica, thus describes coffee making in Italy and other European countries in 1691. Description of the vase for making the decoction, dose of powder, and of the water necessary and time of boiling it. Two such vessels having a large paunch to reach the fire, two others with long necks and narrow, with a cover to restrain their spirituous and volatile particles, which when thrown off by the heat are easily lost. These vessels are called ebrick in Arabia. They are made of copper, coated with white outside and inside. We who do not possess the art of making them should select an earth, vitreous sulfate of copper, or any other material adapted for kitchenware. It might even be of silver. The quantity of water and powder has no certain rule. By reason of the difference of our nature and tastes, and each one after some experience will use his own judgment to adjust to his desire and liking. Marinita infused two ounces of powder in three liters of water. Codovico, in his voyage to Jerusalem, confirms that he has observed six ounces of the former to twenty liters of the latter, boiled until it was reduced to half the quantity. Ivanut asserts that the Turks, in three cups of water, are contented with a good spoonful of powder. I have observed, however, that in Africa, France, and England, into about six ounces of water, which with them is one cup, a dram of the powder is infused, and this agrees with my taste, but I have wished at times to change the dose. Others put the water into the vase, and when it begins to boil, add the powder, but because it is full of spirit, at the first contact with the heat, it rises and boils over the edge of the vase. Take it away from the fire till the boiling ceases, then put it on the fire again and let it stay a short time boiling with the cover on. Stand it on warm ashes until it settles, after which slowly pour a little of the decoction into an earthen vessel. 
or one of porcelain or of any other kind, as hot as it can be borne, and drink a sip, if it pleases your taste, add a portion of cardamom, cloves, nutmeg, or cinnamon, and dissolve a little sugar in the water. Yet because these substances will alter the taste of this simple, they are not prized by many experts. Modern Arabia, Bassa, Turkey, and the Great Orient, those who are traveling or in the army, infuse the powder in cold water, and then boiling it as directed above, bear witness to its efficacy. All times are opportune to take this salutary drink, beverage. Among the Turks are those who take it even by night, nor is there a business meeting or conversation where coffee is not taken. Among the great, it would be accounted an incivility if with smoke, coffee were not offered, and no one in the day is ashamed to frequent the bazaar where it is sold. When I was in London, the city of three million people, there were taverns for its special use. It is a great stimulant. The sober take it to invigorate the stomach. The scrofulous hated it because they thought it stirred up the bile on an empty stomach, but experience proving the contrary enjoy it as much as others. In 1702, coffee in the American colonies were being used as a refreshment between meals, like spirituous liquors. It is in 1711 that the infusion idea in coffee making appeared in France. It came in a form of a fustian cloth bag which contained the ground coffees in the coffee maker, and the boiling water was poured over it. This was a decided French novelty, but it made its slow headway into England and America, where some people were still boiling the whole roasted beans and drinking the liquor. In England, as early as 1722, there arose a conscientious objector to boiled coffee in the person of Humphrey Broadbent, a coffee merchant who wrote a treatise on the true way of preparing and making coffee in which he condemned the silly practice of making coffee by boiling an ounce of powder in a quart of water then common in the London coffee houses, and urging the infusion method. He favored the following procedure. Put the quantity of powder you intend into your pot, which should be either of stone or silver, being much better than tin or copper, which takes from it much of its flavor and goodness. Then pour boiling hot water upon the foresaid powder and let it stand to infuse five minutes before the fire. This is an excellent way and far exceeds the common one of boiling, but whether you prepare it by boiling or this way, it will sometimes remain thick and troubled after it is made, except you pour in a spoonful or two of cold water, which immediately precipitates the more heavy parts at the bottom and makes it clear enough for drinking. Some make coffee with spring water, but it is not so good as river, or Thames water, because the former makes it hard and distasteful, and other makes it smooth and pleasant, laying soft on the stomach. If you have a desire to make good coffee in your families, I cannot conceive how you can put less than two ounces of powder to a quart, or one ounce to a pint of water. Some put two ounces and a quarter. By 1760, the decoction, or boiling, method in France had been generally replaced by the infusion, or steeping, method. In 1763, Don Martin, a tinsmith of saint Bendit, France, invented a coffee pot, the inside of which was filled by a fine sack put in its entirety, and which had a tap to draw the coffee. Many inventions to make coffee sans ebullition, without boiling, appeared in France about this time. But it was not until the 1800 that de Belois pot, employing the original French drip method, appeared, signaling another step forward in coffee making, percolation, de Belois and Count Rumford. De Belois pot, probably made of iron or tin, afterward of porcelain, and it had served as a model for all the percolation devices that followed it for the next hundred years. It does not seem to have been patented, and not much is known of the inventor. About this period, it was the common practice in England to boil coffee in the good old-fashioned way, and to fine, clarify, it with Isinglass. This moved Count Rumford, Benjamin Thompson, an American-British scientist, then living in Paris, to make a study of scientific coffee making and to produce an improved drip device known as Rumford's Percolator. 
He has been generally credited with the invention of the percolator. But, as pointed out in a previous chapter, this honor seems to be de Beloy's and not Rumford's. Count Rumford embodied his observation and conclusion in a verbose essay entitled Of the Excellent Qualities of Coffee and the Art of Making It in the Pious Perfection, published in London, 1812. In this treatise, he describes and illustrates the Rumford Percolator. Brillet Savaret, the famous French gastronomist who also wrote on coffee in his sixth meditation, said of the de Beloy's pot, I have tried, in the course of time, all methods and of all those which have been suggested to me up to today, 1825, and with a full knowledge of the matter in hand. I prefer de Beloy's method, which consists of pouring the boiling water upon the coffee which has been placed in the vessel of porcelain or silver, pierced with very small holes. I have attempted to make coffee in a broiler at high pressure. I have had, as a result, a coffee full of extracts and bitterness which could scrape the throat of a Cossack. Berlin Severin had something also to say on the subject of grinding coffee his conclusion being that it was better to pound the coffee than to grind it. He preferred M. de Beloy, Archbishop of Paris, who loved good things and was quite an epicure, and says that Napoleon showed him deference and respect. This may have been Jean-Baptiste de Beloy, who, according to Didot, was born in 1709 and died in 1808, and, it is though likely, was the inventor of the de Beloy pot. Count Rumford was born in Woburn, Massachusetts in 1753. He was apprenticed to a shopkeeper in Salem in 1766. He became an object of distrust among the friends of the cause of American freedom, and on the evacuation of Boston by the royal troops in 1776, he was elected by Governor Wentworth of New Hampshire to carry dispatches to England. He left England in 1802 and resided in France from 1804 until his death in 1814. In 1772, he had married, or rather, as he put it, he was married by a wealthy widow, the daughter of a highly respectable minister and one of the first settlers at Rumford, now called Concord, New Hampshire. It was from this town that he took his title of Rumford when he was created a Count of the Holy Roman Empire in 1791. His first wife having died, he married in Paris the wealthy widow of the celebrated chemist, Lavoisier, and with her he lived an extremely uncomfortable life until they agreed to separate. In his essay on coffee and coffee making, Count Rumford gives us a good pen picture of the preparation of the beverage in England at the beginning of the 19th century. He says, Coffee is first roasted in an iron pan, or in a hollow cylinder, made of sheet iron, over a brisk fire. And when, from the color of the grain, and the particular fragrance which it acquires in this process, it is judged to be sufficiently roasted. It is taken from the fire and suffered to cool. When cold, it is pounded in a mortar, or ground in a hand mill to a coarse powder, and preserved for use. Formerly, the ground coffee being put into a coffee pot with a sufficient quantity of water, the coffee pot was put over the fire, and after the water had been made to boil a certain time, the coffee pot was removed from the fire, and the grounds having time to settle or have been bind down with isinglass. The clear liquid was poured off and immediately served in cups. Count Rumford thought it was a mistake to agitate the coffee powder in the brewing process, and in this, he agreed with de Beloy. His improvement on the latter's pot is described in chapter 34. He was a coffee connoisseur, and as such was one of the first to advocate the use of cream as well as sugar for making an ideal cup of the beverage. He refers, though not by name, to de Beloy's percolation method and says, its usefulness is now universally acknowledged. A few definitions. Just here, in order to assure a better understanding of the subject, it may be well to clear up sundry misconceptions regarding the words percolation, filtration, decoction, infusion, etc. by the simple expedient of definition. A decoction is a liquid produced by boiling a substance until its soluble properties are extracted. 
thus the coffee drink was first a decoction and a decoction is what one gets today when coffee is boiled in the good old-fashioned way as mother used to make it infusion is a process of steeping extraction without boiling it is extraction accomplished at any temperature below boiling and is a general classification of procedure capable of subdivision as generally and correctly applied it is the operation wherein hot water is merely poured upon ground coffee loose in a pot or in a container resting on the bottom of the pot in the strictest sense of the term an infusion is also produced by percolation and filtration when the water is not boiling in contact with the coffee percolation means dripping through fine apertures in china or metal as in de Bolloy's french drip pot filtration means dripping through a porous substance usually cloth or paper percolation and filtration are practically synonyms although a shade of distinction in their meaning has arisen so that often the latter is considered as a step logically succeeding the former accomplishing extraction of a material by permitting a liquid to pass slowly through it is in fact percolation whereas filtration of the resultant extraction is effected by interposing in its path some medium which will remove solid or semi-solid material from it coffee making practice has in itself so applied these terms that each is considered a complete process percolation is thus applied when the infusion is removed from the grounds immediately by dripping through the fine perforations in the china or metal of which the device is constructed true percolation is not produced in the pumping percolators in which the heated water is elevated and sprayed over the ground coffee held in a metal basket in the upper part of the pot the liquor being recirculated until a satisfactory degree of extraction has been reached rather the process is midway between decoction and effusion for the weak liquor is boiled during the operation in order to furnish sufficient steam to cause the pumping action filtration is accomplished when the ground coffee is retained by cloth or paper generally supported by some portion of the brewing device and extraction affected by pouring water on the top of the mass permitting the liquid to percolate through the filtering medium retaining the grounds patents and devices from the beginning the french devoted more attention than any other people to coffee brewing the first french patent on a coffee maker was granted in 1802 to denobe henri and rauch for a pharmacological chemical coffee making device by infusion in 1802 charles wyatt obtained a patent in london on an apparatus for distilling coffee the first french patent on an improved coffee drip pot for making coffee by filtration without boiling was granted to Adro in 1806. Strictly speaking, this was not a filtration device, as it was fitted with a tin composition strainer, or grid. It was very like Count Rumford's percolator announced six years later, as will be seen by comparing the two in chapter 34. In 1815, Sunet invented in France his cafetier Sunet, another device to make coffee without boiling about the year eighteen seventeen the coffee began appeared in england it was simply a squat earthenware pot with an upper movable strainer part made of tin after the french drip pot pattern later models employed a cloth bag suspended from the rim of the pot it was said to have been invented by a mr began and dr murray of dictionary frame seems to have been convinced of this gentleman's existence although others have doubted it and thought the name was of dutch origin the article having been first made for holland it has been suggested that in all probability the name came from the dutch word bechen to trickle or run down one thing is certain coffee begins came originally from france so that if there was a mr begin he merely introduced them into england the coffee begin with which americans are most familiar is a pot containing a flannel bag or a cylindrical wire strainer to hold the ground coffee through which the boiling water is poured the marion harlan pot was an improved metal coffee begin the triumph coffee filter was a cloth bag device which made any coffee pot a begin in eighteen nineteen maurice 
a Paris tinsmith invented a double drip reversible coffee pot. The device had two movable filters and was placed bottom up on the fire until the water boiled when it was inverted to let the coffee filter or drip through. In 1819, Lawrence was granted a French patent on the original hump percolator device in which the water was raised by steam pressure and dripped over the ground coffee. In 1820, Godet, another Paris tinsmith, invented a filtration device that employed a cloth strainer. In 1822, Louis Bernard Rebel was granted an English patent on a coffee-making device in which the usual French drip process was reversed by the use of steam pressure to force the boiling water upward through the coffee mass. Caisseneuve of Paris was granted a patent on a similar device in France in 1824. In 1825, the first coffee pot patent in the United States was granted to Louis Martelli on a machine to condense the steam and essential oils and return them to the infusion. In 1827, the first really practicable pumping percolator, as we understand the meaning today, was invented by Jacques-Auguste Gondé, a manufacturer of plated jewelry in Paris. The boiling water was raised through a tube in the handle and sprayed over the ground coffee suspended in a filter basket, but could not be returned for a further spraying. In 1827, Nicolas Félix Durant, a manufacturer of chalon sur main was granted a French patent on a percolator employing, for the first time, an inner tube to raise the boiling water for spraying over the ground coffee. In 1839, James Vardy and Maurice Plateau was granted an English patent on a kind of urn percolator, or filter, employing the vacuum process of coffee making, the upper vessel being made of glass. By this time, the pumping percolator, working by steam pressure and by partial vacuum, was in general use in France, England, and Germany, and then began the movement toward the next stage in coffee making, filtration. About this time, 1840, Robert Napier, 1790 to 1876, the Scottish marine engineer of the celebrated Clyde shipbuilding firm of Robert Napier and Sons, invented a vacuum coffee machine to make coffee by distillation and filtration. The device was never patented, but 30 years later, it was being made in the works of Thomas Smith and Son, Elkington and Co. LTD successors, under the direction of Mr. Napier, the aged inventor. The device consists of a silver globe, brewer siphon, and strainer, as illustrated. It operates as follows. A half cup full of water is put into the globe and the gas fume is lighted. The dry coffee is put into the receiver, which is then filled up with boiling water. This will at once become agitated and will continue so for a few minutes. When it becomes still, the gas flame is turned down and the clear coffee is siphoned over into the globe through the siphon tube, on the end of which, as it rests in the coffee liquid, there is a metal strainer covered with a filter cloth. The Napierian coffee machine has enjoyed great popularity in England. The principle has in later years been incorporated in the Napier List steam coffee machine for use in hotels, ships, restaurants, etc. Steam is used as a source of heat, but does not mix with the coffee. List's patent is for an improvement on the Napierian system and was granted in 1891. It is related that shortly before he died, old Mr. Napier, at the termination of a dispute in Smith & Co.'s factory at Glasgow, where the device was being made under his instruction, said to old Mr. Smith, You may be a guild silversmith, but I'm a better engineer. In 1841, William Ward Andrews was granted an English patent on an improved pot employing a pump to force the boiling water through the ground coffee while contained in a perforated cylinder screwed to the bottom of the pot. In 1842, the first French patent on a glass coffee-making device was granted to Madame Vassieux of Léon. Following this, 
There were numerous patents issued in France and England on double glass globe coffee making devices. They were first known as double glass balloons, and most of them employed metal strainers. After this, there were many percolator patents in France, England, and the United States, some of which were improved forms of the original drip method of the De La Boy device. Others were the type of machine which came to be known as percolators because they employed the principle of raising the heated water and spraying it over the ground coffee in continuous fashion. The story is told in chronological order in the chapter on the evolution of coffee apparatus, so it is not necessary to repeat it here. Numerous filtration devices also were produced abroad and in the United States. Among the percolators, those of Manning, Bowman, and Co., and of Landers, Ferre, and Clark, became well known here. In the filtration field, the following attained considerable distinction. Harvey Rickers' half-minute pot employed a cotton sack with reinforced bottom, introduced about 1881. The Kinhee pot of 1990. Gouchois' private estate coffee maker, using Japanese filter paper, introduced in 1905. Finley Acker's percolator, introduced the same year, which also employed a filter paper between two cylinders having side perforations. The Triculator, 1908. King's percolator, using filter paper, in 1912. And the Make Right, 1911, with its adaptation as presented in the True Brew Pot of 1920. The Make Right was the invention of Edward Abern, New York, and comprised two telescoping open wire frames, or baskets, with a flat piece of muslin between them. In the true brew pot, the same idea was employed, except that the wire frames was so constructed as to furnish four drip points to afford better distribution on the ground coffee and to lessen the time of filtration. There was also a porcelain top, to house and to raise the filtration device above the brew with an opening through which the boiling water could be poured without exposing the ground coffee. Among the later developments of the genuine percolator principle that have attracted attention in this country, mention should be made of the phalanx coffee maker and the gelt pot. In 1914 to 1916, there was a revival of interest in the United States in the double glass globe method of making coffee, introduced into France as double glass balloons in the first half of the 19th century. American ingenuity produced several clever adaptations and several notable filter improvements. Advertising developed a great demand for glass percolators, as they were first called, but although five attained considerable prominence, only two survived and, at this writing, are still being manufactured. Both are double glass globe filters employing a spirit lamp, gas, or electricity as heating agents. Within the last few years, it has become the fashion to obtain patents in the United States on the art of brewing coffee or the art of making coffee. Instances are the patents issued to Miser, Kalkin, and Muller. In the Kalkin patent, the phalanx device illustrated at the top of this page, the art consists in controlling the flow of the boiling water by means of the number and spacing of the holes in the water spreader so as to restrict the volume and the speed, to effect a quick initial extraction, and then, by means of a new spacing of holes in the infuser, retarding the drip to attain a prolonged extraction of the tannin and other elements of slow extraction and combining the liquid obtained during the initial and subsequent stages of the brew for attaining a balanced liquid extract. Muller's art the apparatus is described in chapter 34 
consisted in so supplying and supporting the ground coffee in an urn that is never again subjected to the decoction after having been exposed to the air and steam following the first application of the water. In 1920, William G. Goldworthy, San Francisco, was granted a United States patent on a process for preparing the beans for making the beverage. The process consisted of grinding the raw, dried beans, then packing the ground product in non-combustible and non-soluble porous containers, which are securely closed to keep them unimpaired while the contained coffee is being roasted, and, after cooling, sealing them with gelatin. To brew, container and contents were dropped in a cup of hot water. This brief review of the evolution of coffee brews show that coffee making started with boiling and next became an infusion. After that, the best practice became divided between simple percolation and filtration, which have continued to the present time. Boiling has also continued to find advocates in every country, even in the United States, where it seems to die hard, no matter how much is done to discredit it. Percolation devices are subdivided into the simple drip pots and the continuous percolation machines as represented by numerous complicated and high-priced contrivances on the market. Gradually, however, true coffee lovers are realizing that the best results are to be obtained through simple percolation or simple filtration. There are good arguments for both methods. End of section 68. Read to you by J.P. Liao, Vancouver, Canada, October 26, 2022. Section 69 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read to you by J.P. Liao. All About Coffee by William Euchers Coffee Making in Europe in the 19th Century England We have noted Count Rumford's efforts to reform coffee making in England in the early parts of the 19th century. Many other scientific men joined the movement. Along with them was Professor Donovan, who, in the Dublin Philosophical Journal for May 1826, told of his experiments to ascertain the best methods for extracting all the virtues inherent in the berry. The Penny Magazine, for June 14, 1834, after deploring the straw-colored fluid commonly introduced under the misnomer of coffee in England, thus digests Professor Donovan's findings. Mr. Donovan found that what we shall call the medicinal quality of coffee resides in it independent of its aromatic flavor, that it is possible to obtain the exhilarating effect of the beverage without gratifying the palate and, on the other hand, that all the aromatic quality may be enjoyed without its producing any effect upon the animal economy. His object was to combine the two. The roasting of coffee is requisite for the production of both these qualities, but to secure them in their full degree, it is necessary to conduct the process with some skill. The first thing to be done is to expose the raw coffee to the heat of a gentle fire in an open vessel, stirring it continually until it assumes a yellowish color. It should then be roughly broken, a thing very easily done, so that each berry is divided into about four or five pieces, when it must be put into the roasting apparatus. This, as most commonly used, is made up of sheet iron, and is of a cylindrical shape. It no doubt answers the purpose well, and this by no means a costly machine, but coffee may be very well roasted in a common iron or earthenware pot, the main circumstances to be observed being the degree to which the process is carried and the prevention of partial burning by constant stirring. One of the requisites for having good coffee is that it shall have been recently roasted. Coffee should be ground very fine for use, and only at the moment when it is wanted or the aromatic flavor will come in some measure be lost. To extract all its good qualities, the powder requires two separate and somewhat opposing modes of treatment, but which do not offer any difficulty when explained. On the one hand, 
the fine flavor would be lost by boiling, while, on the other, it is necessary to subject the coffee to that degree of heat in order to extract its medicinal quality. The mode of processing, which, after many experiments, Mr. Donovan found to be the most simple and efficacious for attaining both these ends, was the following. The whole water to be used must be divided into two equal parts. One half must be put first to the coffee cold, and this must be placed over the fire until it just comes to a boil, when it must be immediately removed. Allowing it then to subside for a few moments, the liquid must be poured off as clear as it will run. The remaining half of the water, which during this time should have been on the fire, must be added at a boiling point to the grounds and placed on the fire, where it must be kept boiling for about three minutes. This will extract the medicinal virtue, and if then the liquid be allowed again to subside, and the clear fluid be added to the first portion, the preparation will be found to combine all the good properties of the berry in as great perfection as they can be obtained. If any fining ingredients is used, it should be mixed with the powder at the beginning of the process. Several kinds of apparatus, some of them very ingenious in their construction, have been proposed for preparing coffee, but they are all made upon the principle of extracting only the aromatic flavor. While Professor Donovan's suggestions not only enable us to accomplish that desired object, but super add the less obvious but equally essential matter of extracting and making our own all the medicinal virtues. When Webster and Parks published their Encyclopedia of Domestic Economy, London, 1844, they gave the following as the most usual method of making coffee in England. Put fresh ground coffee into a coffee pot with a sufficient quantity of water and set this on the fire until it boils for a minute or two. Then remove it from the fire, pour out a cupful, which is to be returned into the coffee pot to throw down the grounds that may be floating, repeat this, and let the coffee pot stand near the fire, but not on too hot a place, until the grounds have subsided to the bottom. In a few minutes, the coffee will be clear without any other preparation, and may be poured into cups. In this manner, with good materials in sufficient quantity and proper care, excellent coffee may be made. The most valuable part of the coffee is soon extracted, and it is certain that long boiling dissipates the fine aroma and flavor. Some make it a rule not to suffer the coffee to boil, but only to bring it just to the boiling point. But it is said by Mr. Donovan that it requires boiling for a little time to extract the whole of the bitter, in which he conceives much of the exhilarating qualities of the coffee reside. This work also had the following to say on the clearing of coffee, which was then a much mooted question. The clearing of coffee is a circumstance demanding particular attention. After the heaviest parts of the grounds have settled, there are still fine particles suspended for some time, and if the coffee be poured off before these have subsided, the liquor is deficient in that transparency which is one test of its perfection. For coffee not well cleared has always an unpleasant bitter taste. In general, the coffee becomes clear by simply remaining quiet for a few minutes, as we have stated. But those who are anxious to have it as clear as possible employ some artificial means of assisting the clearing. The addition of a little isinglass, hartshorn shavings, skins of eels or soles, white of eggs, eggshells, etc., has been recommended for clearing, but it is evident that these substances, to produce their effect, which is upon the same principle as the finding of beer or wine, should be dissolved previously, for if put in without, it would require so much time to dissolve that the flavor of the coffee would vanish. Coffee-making devices of this period in England, in addition to the Rumford type of percolator and the popular coffee bacon, included Evans' machine provided with a tin air float, to which was attached a filter bag containing the coffee. Jones's apparatus, a pumping percolator, Parker's steam fountain coffee maker, which forced the hot water upward through the ground coffee, Patlow's patent filter, previously mentioned, 
a single vacuum glass percolator in combination with an urn, brains, vacuum, or pneumatic filter employing a muslin linen or chamois leather filter and an exhausting pump designed for kitchen use, and Palmer's and Beert's pneumatic filtering machine of similar construction. Cold infusions were common, the practice being to let them stand overnight to be filtered in the morning and only heated, not boiled. Coffee grinding for these various types of coffee makers was performed by iron mills, the portable box mill being most favored for family use. It consisted of a square box either of mahogany or iron japanned, containing in the interior a hollow cone of steel with sharp grooves on the inside. Into this fits a conical shape of hardened iron or steel having spiral grooves cut upon its surface and capable of being turned round by a handle. There was a drawer to receive the finely ground coffee. Larger wall mills employed the same grinding mechanism. In 1855, Dr. John Dorian wrote in his Table Traits, with regard to the making of coffee, there is no doubt that the Turkish method of pounding the coffee in a mortar is indefinitely superior to grinding it in a mill, as with us. But after either method, the process recommended by M. Sawyer may be advantageously adopted, namely, put two ounces of ground coffee into a stewpan, which set upon the fire, stirring the coffee round with a spoon until quite hot, then pour over a pint of boiling water. Cover over closely for five minutes. Pass it through a cloth. Warm again and serve. From observations by G. W. Poor, M. D., London, 1883, we are given a glimpse of coffee making in England in the latter part of the 19th century. He said, Those who wish to enjoy really good coffee must have it fresh roasted. On the continent, in every well-regulated household, the daily supply of coffee is roasted every morning. In England, this is rarely done. If roasted coffee has to be kept, it must be kept in an airtight vessel. In France, coffee used to be kept in a wrapper of waxed leather, which was always closely tied over the contained coffee. In this way, the coffee was kept from contact with any air. The Viennese say that coffee should be kept in a glass bottle closed with a bung and that coffee should on no account be kept in a tin canister. The coffee having been roasted, it has to be reduced to a coarse powder before the infusion is made. The grinding and the powdering of coffee should be done just before it is wanted. For if the whole coffee seeds quickly lose their aroma, how much more quickly will the aroma be dissipated from coffee, which has been reduced to a fine powder? Nothing need to be said in the matter of coffee mills. They are common enough, varied enough, and cheap enough to suit all tastes. To ensure a really good cup of coffee, attention must be given to the following points. 1. Be sure that the coffee is good in quality, freshly roasted and freshly ground. 2. Use sufficient coffee. I have made some experiments on this point, and I have come to the conclusions that one ounce of coffee to a pint of water makes poor coffee. One and a half ounces of coffee to a pint of water makes fairly good coffee. Two ounces of coffee to a pint of water makes excellent coffee. Three, as to the form of coffee pot, I have nothing to say. The varieties of coffee machines are very numerous and many of them are useless encumbrances. At the best, they cannot be regarded as absolutely necessary. The Brazilians insist that coffee pots should on no account be made of metal, but that porcelain or earthenware is alone permissible. I have been in the habit of late of having my coffee made in a common jug provided with a strainer, and I believe there's nothing better. 4. Warm the jug, put the coffee into it, boil the water, and pour the boiling water on the coffee and the thing is done. 5. Coffee must not be boiled or at most it must be allowed just to come to a boil, as Cook says. If violent ebullition takes place, the aroma of the coffee is dissipated, and the beverage is spoiled. The most economical way of making coffee is to put the coffee into a jug and pour cold water upon it. This should be done some hours before the coffee is wanted, overnight for instance.
If the coffee be required for breakfast, the light particles of coffee will imbib the water and fall to the bottom of the jug in course of time. When the coffee is to be used, stand the jug in a saucepan of water or a bain-marie and place the outer vessel over the fire until the water contained in it boils. The coffee in this way is gentle, brought to the boiling point without violent ebullition, and we get the maximum extract without any cost of aroma. Always make your coffee strong. Café au lait is much better if made with one-fourth strong coffee and three-fourths milk. Then, if made half and half with a weaker coffee, this is evident. It is a mistake to assume that coffee cannot be made without a great deal of costly and cumbersome apparatus. The Continent Rossignon has given us a general view of coffee making on the continent of Europe in the middle of the 19th century. He says, Formerly, small bags of bays were used to percolate coffee. The water was poured on the coffee. And when they were new, the coffee percolated through them was pretty good. But when they had been used a few times, they became greasy, and it was very difficult to clean them by any means. The greasy bays altered the quality of the coffee. And in spite of all efforts to keep it clean, the coffee had a tarnished appearance, very disagreeable to the view. Very few persons use them at present. The apparatus most in use for the percolation of coffee is a tin coffee cup composed of two parts. The upper part has a filter or sieve on which the coffee powder is placed and through which the filtered coffee must pass. Boiling water is poured on the coffee. The liquor, which percolates, falls in the second part. Then the upper part is removed and the coffee is ready as a beverage. There are many systems of coffee pots. One of the best is the Russian one, which consists of a receptacle composed of two parts resembling two halves of an egg screwed together. One part contains the hot water and the other the ground coffee. In the center, there is a filter. Turning the pot upside down, the percolation takes place very slowly and no aroma is lost. The tin plate, which is generally used to make the coffee pot, has many drawbacks. One of them is the dissolution of iron, which takes place after it has been used for a short time. The quality of coffee as a beverage depends principally on the degree of heat of the water. Experience has shown that a medium class of coffee prepared at a moderate heat gives a very good liquor, while excellent coffee on which boiling water has been poured did not give a very good liquor. Therefore, Instead of pouring boiling water at 100 degrees Celsius in a porcelain or silver coffee pot, those who desire to make a perfect coffee must use water heated from 60 to 75 degrees Celsius. Three well-known makes of large coffee urns. France. Also about the middle of the 19th century, the French naturalist Du Jour thus describes one manner of making coffee in France. Let the powder be poured into the coffee pot filled with boiling water. In the proportion of the two ounces and a half to two pounds, or two English pints of water. Let the mixture be stirred with a spoon, and the coffee pot be soon taken off the fire, but suffered to remain closely shut for about at least two hours on the warm ashes of a wood fire. During the infusion of the liquor should be several times agitated by a coffee frother or something of the same kind, and finally left for about a quarter of an hour to settle. Café au lait was not made by boiling coffee and milk together, as milk was not proper to extract the coffee. The coffee was first made as a café noir, only stronger, as much of this coffee was poured in the cup was required, and the cup was then filled with boiled milk. Café à la crème was made by adding boiled cream to strong, clear coffee and heating them together. In France, during the latter part of the 19th century, coffee was roasted over charcoal fires in earthenware dishes or saucepans, stirred with a spatula or wooden spoon, or in small cylinder or globular roasters of iron. Gas roasting was also practiced. When roasted in large batches, the beans were cooled in wicker baskets, tossed into the air. 
the grinding was preferably done in mortars or in box mills of pyramid shape with receiving drawers and was not too fine. The usual method of making coffee in France among the better classes at this time was by means of improving de la Boy drip devices, double glass vacuum filters, pumping percolators, double circulation devices, the Russian egg-shaped pots, and the Viennese machines. The last named were metal pumping percolators with glass tops, usually swung between the uprights of a carrying arrangement the base of which held a spirit lamp. Among the numerous French machines which became well-known were Pierre Paris glass filter, a gros steam cloth filter machine, and Malin's percolator apparatus. Both designed for barracks and ships, where previously the coffee had been brewed in soup kettles. Boulon Muller's steam percolator, Laurent's whistling coffee pot, a steam percolator, which announced when the coffee was ready. Ed Loisel's rapid filter, a hydrostatic percolator, and those pots to which Maurice, Lamar, Grandet, Grippel, and Grandet gave their names. In 1892, the French Minister of War detected that, in the army roasting and grinding operations, the coffee shaft should no longer be thrown away as it had been found that it was rich in caffeine and aroma constituents. Coffee à la minute, which appeared in France in the 19th century, was made by decoction or infusion through a funnel pierced with holes and covered inside with blotting paper or a woolen strainer cloth. This system, says Jardin, suggested the economical coffee pot. A popular German drip coffee maker of the late 19th century employs a plug in the spout which provides air pressure to hold back the infusion until the plug is removed. Pierre Joseph Bushaus, physician of the King of Poland in 1787, made a business of supplying roasted coffee in small packets, each sufficient for one cup. He built up quite a trade until one day he was caught substituting roasted rye for coffee. This was the Bushaus method of making coffee, much practiced by the lower class because he was looked upon as an authority. Boil the water in a coffee pot. When it boils, draw it from the fire long enough to add one ounce of coffee powder to a pound of water. Stir with a spoon. Return it to the fire, and when it boils, move it back somewhat from the heat and let it simmer for eight minutes. Clarify with sugar or deer horn powder. Section 70 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read to you by J.P. Leo. All About Coffee by William Eukers. Early Coffee Making in the United States. The coffee drink reached the colonies, first as a beverage for the well-to-do about 1668 when introduced to the general public through the coffee houses about 1700 it was first sipped from small dishes as in england and no one inquired too closely as to how it was made when half a century later it had displaced beer and tea for breakfast its correct making became a matter of polite inquiry it was not until well into the 19th century that there was any suggestion of scientific interest and not until within the last decade was any real chemical analysis of brewed coffee undertaken with a view to producing a scientific cup of the beverage. At first, owing to the great distances and difficulties surrounding communication between the colonies, news of improvements in coffee makers, coffee making traveled slowly, and the coffee customs brought from Europe by the early settlers became habits that were not easily changed. Some of the worst have clung on ignoring the march of improvement, and seemed as firmly entrenched in suburban and rural communities today as they were 200 years ago. Indeed, despite the fact that the United States have been the largest consumer of coffee among the nations for nearly half a century, it is only within the last 10 years that coffee properly prepared could be obtained outside the principal cities. Even today, the average consumer is sadly in need of education in correct coffee brewing. It would be an excellent idea if all the coffee propaganda funds could be concentrated on a study of this one phase 
of the coffee question for several years and the recommendations published in such fashion as firmly to fix in the minds of the rising generation a knowledge of correct coffee brewing the facts of the case are that generally speaking coffee is still prepared in slovian fashion in the average american home however with the good work done in recent years by organized trade effort to correct this abuse of our national beverage signs are plentiful that the time is not far distant when a lasting reformation in coffee making will have been accomplished in colonial times the coffee drink was mostly a decoction esther singleton tells us that in new amsterdam coffee was boiled in a copper pot lined with tin and drunk as hot as possible with sugar or honey and spices sometimes a pint of fresh milk was brought to the boiling point and then as much drawn tincture of coffee was added or the coffee was put in cold water with the milk and both were boiled together and drunk rich people mixed cloves cinnamon or sugar with ambergris in the coffee ground cardamom seeds were also used to flavor the decoction in the early days of new england the whole beans were frequently boiled for hours with not only pleasant results in forming either food or drink in new orleans the ground coffee was put into a tin or pewter coffee dripper and the infusion was made by slowly pouring the boiling water over it after the french fashion the coffee was not considered good unless it actually stained the cup this method still obtains among the old creole families boiling coarsely pounded coffee for fifteen minutes to half an hour was common practice in the colonies before eighteen hundred in the early part of the nineteenth century the best practice was to roast the coffee in an iron cylinder that stood before the hearth fire it was either turned by a handle or wound up like a jack to go by itself the grinding was done in a lap or wall mill and among the best known makes were kendrick's wilson's wolf's john luther's george m w vandergriefs and charles parker's best quality to make coffee without boiling the cookery books of the period advised the housewife to obtain a biggin the best of which is what in france is called a guillette in eighteen forty four the kitchen directory and american housewife's advice on the subject of coffee making was the following coffee should be put in an iron pot and dried near a moderate fire for several hours before roasting in pot or over hot coals and stirring constantly it is sufficiently roasted when biting one of the lightest colored kernels if brittle the whole is done a coffee roaster is better than an open pot use a tablespoonful ground to a pint of boiling water boil in a tin pot twenty to twenty five minutes if boiled longer it would not taste fresh and lively let stand four or five minutes to settle pour off grounds into a coffee pot or urn put fish skin or ice in glass size of a nine pence in pot when pour on to boil or else the white and shell of half an egg to a couple of quarts of coffee french coffee is made in a german filter the water is turned on boiling hot and one-third more coffee is needed more than when boiled in the common way in eighteen fifty six the ladies home magazine now the ladies home journal printed the following which fairly sums up the coffee-making custom of that period coffee if you would have its best flavor should be roasted at home but not in an open pan for this permits a large amount of aroma to escape the roaster should be a closed sphere or cylinder the aroma upon which the good taste of the coffee depends is only developed in the berry by the roasting process which also is necessary to diminish its toughness and fit it for grinding while roasting coffee loses from fifteen to twenty five per cent of its weight and gains from thirty to fifty per cent in bulk more depends on the proper roasting than upon the quality of the coffee itself one or two scorched or burned berries will materially injure the flavor of several cupfuls even a slight overheating diminishes the good taste the best mode of roasting where it is done at home is to dry the coffee first in an open vessel until its color is slightly changed 
This allows the moisture to escape. Then cover it closely and scorch it, keeping up a constant agitation so that no portion of a kernel may be unequally heated. Too low and too slow a heat dries it up without producing the full aromatic flavor, while too great heat dissipates the oily matter and leaves only bitter charred kernels. It should be heated so as to acquire a uniform deep cinnamon color and an oily appearance, but never a deep dark brown color. It then should be taken from the fire and kept closely covered until cold and further until used. While unroasted coffee improves by age, the roasted berries will very generally lose their aroma if not covered very closely. The ground stuff kept on sale in barrels or boxes or in papers is not worthy the name of coffee. Coffee should not be ground until just before using. If ground overnight, it should be covered, or what is quite as well, put into the broiler and covered with water. The water not only retains the valuable oil and other aromatic elements, but also prepares it by soaking for immediate boiling in the morning. If the coffee pot, the Old Dominion, of course, for in a common broiler, this process would ruin the coffee by wasting the aroma. Be set on the range or stove or near the fire so as to be kept hot all night preparatory to boiling in the morning. The beverage will be found in the morning, rich, mellow, and of a most delicious flavor. Coffee used at supper time should be placed on or near the fire immediately after dinner and kept hot or simmering, not boiling, all the afternoon. Try this method if you wish coffee in perfection. Wood's Improved Coffee Roaster is acknowledged to be the best article of the kind now in use. This patent coffee roaster has been improved by the introduction of a triangular flange inside of each of the hemispheres, as seen in the cut. These flanges, as the roaster is turned, catch the coffee and throw it from the inner surface, thus ensuring a perfect uniformity in the burning. The Woods Roaster, 1849, and the Old Dominion Coffee Pot, 1856, have been referred to in Chapter 34. From the Encyclopedia of Practical Cookery, we learn some more about the customs prevailing among the first cooks in the country in roasting and making coffee in the United States about the middle of the 19th century. For example, roasting coffee beans. Put the beans in the roaster. Set this before a moderate fire and turn slowly until the coffee takes a good brown color. For this, it should require about 25 minutes. Open the cover to see when it is done. If browned, transfer it to an earthen jar. Cover it tightly and use when needed. Or a more simple plan, and even more effectual, is to take a tin baking dish. Butter well the bottom, put the coffee in it, and set it in a moderate oven until the beans take a strong golden color. 20 minutes sufficing for this. Toss them frequently with a wooden spoon as they are cooking. Another plan is to put it in a small frying pan, one one pound of raw coffee beans and set the pan on the fire, stirring and shaking occasionally until the beans are yellow. Then cover the frying pan and shake the coffee about till it is a dark brown. Move the pan off the fire Keep the cover on, and when the beans are a little cool, break an egg over them and stir them until they are all well coated with the egg. Then store the coffee in tins or jars with tight-fitting lids and grind it as wanted for use. Coffee should always be bought in the bean and ground as required. Otherwise, it is liable to extensive adulteration with chicory or suckery. Some persons like the addition. But the epicure who is really fond of coffee would not admit of its introduction. Making breakfast coffee. Allow one tablespoon of coffee to each person. The coffee, when ground, should be measured. Put into the coffee pot and boiling water poured over it in the proportion of three-fourths pint to each tablespoon of coffee. And the pot put on the fire. The instant it boils, take the pot off, uncover it, and let it stand a minute or two. Then cover it again. Put it back on the fire, and let it boil up again. 
Take it from the fire and let it stand for five minutes to settle. It is then ready to pour. This work recommended as among the latest and best devices for coffee making. All those manufactured or sold in this country by Adams and Son, the English Coffee Biggin, General Hutchinson's Coffee Pot and Urn, combining de Bolois and Rumford's ideas, El Brun's Cafetiere for making coffee by distillation and by steam pressure, passing it directly into the cup, a Vienna coffee making machine, and a Russian coffee reversible pot called the Potsdam. Among the two score of coffee recipes for making various kinds of extracts, ices, candies, cakes, etc., flavored with coffee, there is a curious one for coffee beer. The invention of a Frenchman named Bluhart. The ingredients and quantities in a thousand parts are strong coffee, 300, rum, 300, syrup thickened with gum, Senegal, 65, alcoholic extract of orange peel, 10, and water, 325. It does not appear to have reached any important degree of popularity, adds the editor. In 1861, Gaudi's Ladies Book and Magazine noted with approval the growing custom of hotel and restaurant guests to order coffee instead of wines or spirits with their dinners. On the subject of how to make a cup of coffee, it had this to say. Which is the best way of making coffee? In this, particular notions differ. For example, the Turks do not trouble themselves to take off the bitterness by sugar, nor do they seek to disguise the flavor by milk, as is our custom. But they add each dish a drop of the essence of amber, or put a couple of cloves in it, during the process of preparation. Such flavoring would not, we opine, agree with Western tastes. If a cup of the very best coffee prepared in the highest perfection and boiling hot, be placed on the table in the middle of a room and suffered to cool, it will, in cooling, fill the room with its fragrance. But, becoming cold, it would lose much of its flavor. Being again heated, its taste and flavor will still be further impaired, and heated a third time, it will be found vapid and nauseous. The aroma diffused through the room proved that the coffee has been deprived of its most volatile parts, and hence of its agreeableness and virtue. By pouring boiling water on the coffee and surrounding the containing vessel with boiling water, the finer qualities of the coffee will be preserved. Boiling coffee in a coffee pot is neither economical or judicious, so much of the aroma being wasted by this method. Count Rumford, by no mean authority, states that one pound of good mocha, when roasted and ground, will make 56 cups of the very best coffee, but it must be ground finely, or the surface of the particles only be acted upon by the hot water, and much of the essence will be left in the grounds. In the East, coffee is said to arouse, exhilarate, and keep awake, allaying hunger and giving the weary renewed strength and vigor while it imparts a feeling of comfort and repose. The Arabians, when they take their coffee off the fire, wrap the vessel in a wet cloth, which finds the liquor instantly, and make it cream at the top. There is one great essential to be observed, namely that coffee should not be ground before it is required for use, as in a powdered state its finer qualities evaporate. We pass over the usual modes of making coffee as being familiar to every lady who presides over every household, and content ourselves with the most modern and approved Parisian methods, though we may add that a common recipe for good coffee is two ounces of coffee and one quart of water. Filter or boil 10 minutes and leave to clear 10 minutes. The French make an extremely strong coffee. For breakfast, they drink one third of the infusion and two thirds of hot milk. The café noir used after dinner is the very essence of the berry. Only a small cup is taken, sweetened with white sugar or sugar candy, and sometimes a little vieux de vie is poured over the sugar and a spoon held above the surface, and set on fire. Or after it, a very small glass of liqueur, called the chasse café, is immediately drunk. But the best method, prevalent in France, for making coffee, and the infusion may be strong or otherwise as taste may direct, 
is to make a large coffee pot with an upper receptacle made to fit closed into it, the bottom of which is perforated with small holes containing in its interior two movable metal strainers, over the second of which the powder is to be placed, and immediately under the third. Upon this upper strainer pour boiling water and continue to do so gently until it bubbles up through the strainer. Then shut the cover of the machine closed down. Place it near the fire, and so soon as the water has drained through the coffee, repeat the operation until the whole intended quantity be passed. No findings are required. Thus, all the fragrance of its perfume will be retained with all the balsamic and stimulating powers of its essence. This is a true Parisian mode, and voila, a cup of excellent coffee. This article is most interesting in that it shows the revolt against boiling coffee had started in the United States. Also, that the importance of fine grinding was being recognized and emphasized by the leaders of the best thought of the nation. Probably the first scientific inquiry into the subject of coffee roasting and brewing in the United States was that detailed by August T. Dawson and Charles M. Wetherill, Ph.D., M.D., in the Journal of the Franklin Institute for July and August, 1855. The following is a digest. There are two classes of beverages, one, alcoholic, and two, nitrogenized. Nitrogenized foods are effective to place the substance of the different organs of the body wasted away by the process of vitality. Coffee is one of these. Besides the tannin, the coffee berry contains two substances, one, the nitrogenized quality, caffeine, which is about 1% and is not altered in roasting, and the other, a volatile oil, which is developed in roasting and which gives the coffee its flavor. Dr. Julius Lehman, Liebig's Analysis 87, 205, says that coffee retards the waste tissues of the body and diminishes the amount of food necessary to preserve life. This effect is due to the oil. Much of the nutritive portion of coffee is lost by European methods of making. Good coffee is very rare. These experiments were made to ascertain whether a potable coffee could not be offered to the public at as low a price as the raw or roasted now is. In order to be successful, we needed to extract a larger portion of the nutritive substance than is extracted in the household. The experiment have proven vain. As a result of our experiments with different ways of roasting and brewing coffee, we have found the following plan to be most convenient and the best. The coffee will taste the same every time and will taste good. If a good berry be properly roasted and the infusion be of the proper strength, good coffee must result. A mocha berry should be selected and roasted seven or eight pounds at a time in a cylindrical drum. After roasting, it should be placed in a stone jar with a mouth 3 inches in diameter. The jar should be closed airtight. This will furnish 2 cups of coffee daily for 6 months. A quart should be taken from the jar at a time and ground. The ground coffee should be kept in covered glass jars. The best coffee pot was found to be the common biggin having an upper compartment with a perforated bottom upon which to place the coffee. To make one cup of this infusion, place half an ounce of ground coffee in the upper compartment and six fluid ounces of water into the bottom. Put the bacon over a gas lamp. After three minutes, the water will boil. Then steam appears. Take the bacon from the fire, pour the water into a cup, and hence immediately into the top of the bacon where it will extract the berry by replacement. Here follows an experiment. This experiment shows that loss of weight is no criterion that coffee is properly roasted. Neither is the color by itself, nor the temperature, nor the time. Next, we experimented to ascertain whether the aroma developed by roasting coffee and which is lost might not be collected and added to the coffee at pleasure. An attempt was made to derive the volatile oils from roasting coffee by steam and make a dried extract of the residual coffee to which the oils were to be later added. Two attempts were made and both failed. 
It appears that but a small quantity of the aroma is lost in roasting and that is mixed with bad smelling vapors from which it is impossible to free it. Then we tried to make a potable coffee by making an aqueous extraction of raw coffee, evaporating to dryness and roasting the residue. Here follows the experiment. This also was unsuccessful. The great trouble here is a dark shiny residue, which, while tasteless, is very disagreeable to look at. In the preparation of coffee by boiling, two and a half times as much matter is extracted as by bacon. The proper method of roasting coffee is as follows. It should be placed in a cylinder and turned constantly over a bright fire. When white smoke begins to appear, the contents should be closely watched. Keep testing the grains. As soon as a grain breaks easily at a slight blow, at which time the color will be a light chestnut brown, the coffee is done. Cool it by lifting some up and dropping it back with a tin cup. If it be left to cool in a heap, there is a greater chance of over-roasting. Keeping the coffee only in airtight vessels. Measure the infusions, a half ounce of coffee to six ounces of water per cup. All extracts of coffee are worthless. Most of them are composed of burned sugar, chicory, carrots, etc. In 1883, an authority of that day, Francis B. Thurber, in his book, Coffee from Plantation to Cup, which he dedicated to the railroad restaurant man at Poughkeepsie because he served an ideal cup of coffee, came out strongly for the good old boiling method with eggs shells included. This was the Thurber recipe. Grind moderately fine a large cup or small bowl of coffee. Break into it one egg with shell. Mix well, adding enough cold water to thoroughly wet the grounds. Upon this, pour one pint of boiling water. Let it boil slowly for 10 to 15 minutes, according to the variety of coffee used and the fineness to which it is ground. Let it stand three minutes to settle, then pour through a fine wire sieve into a warm coffee pot. This will make enough for four persons. At table, first put the sugar into the cup, then fill half full of boiling milk, add your coffee, and you have a delicious beverage that will be a revolution to many poor mortals who have an indistinct remembrance of and an intense longing for an ideal cup of coffee. If cream can be procured, so much the better. And in that case, boiling water can be added either in the pot or cup to make up for the space occupied by the milk as above, where condensed milk will be found a good substitution for cream. In 1886, however, Jabez Byrne, who knew something about the practical making of the beverage as well as the roasting and grinding operations, said, have boiling water handy. Take a clean dry pot and put in the ground coffee. Place on fire to warm pot and coffee. Pour on sufficient boiling water, not more than two-thirds full. As soon as the water boils, add a little cold water and remove from fire. To extract the greatest virtue of coffee, grind it fine and pour scalding water over it. John Cotton Dana of the New York Public Library says he remembers how in his old home in Woodstock, Vermont, they had always in the attic a big stone jar of green coffee. This was sacred to the great feast days, Thanksgiving, Christmas, etc. Just before those anniversaries, the jar was brought forward and the proper amount of coffee was taken out and roasted in a flat sheet iron pan on the top of the stove being stirred constantly and watched with great care, as my memory seems to say that this was not constantly done, says Mr. Dana. It would seem that, even then, my father, who kept the general store in the village, brought roasted coffee in Boston or New York. At the close of the century, there were still many advocates of boiling coffee, but although the coffee trade was not quite ready to declare its absolute independence in this direction, there were many leaders who boldly proclaimed their freedom from the old prejudice. Arthur Gray, 
in his Over the Black Coffee as late as 1902, quoted, the largest coffee importing house in the United States as advocating the use of eggs and eggshells and boiling the mixture for 10 minutes. End of section 70. Read to you by J.P. Liao, Vancouver, Canada, November 7, 2022. Section 71 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Latest Developments in Better Coffee Making Better Coffee Making by Cooperative Trade Effort got its initial stimulus at the 1912 Convention of the National Coffee Roasters Association. As a result of discussions at that meeting and thereafter, a better coffee-making committee was created for investigation and research. The Coffee Trade's Declaration of Independence in the matter of boiled coffee was made at the 1913 Convention of the National Coffee Roasters Association, when, after hearing the report of the Better Coffee-Making Committee, presented by Edward Aborn of New York, it adopted a resolution saying that the recommendations met with its approval and ordering that they be printed and circulated. The work done by the committee included the first chemical analysis of brewed coffee on record, a study of grindings, and a comparison of the results of four brewing methods. Its conclusions and recommendations were embodied in a booklet published by the National Coffee Roasters Association entitled From Tree to Cup with Coffee, and were as follows. Roasting The roaster, or coffee chef, is the only cook necessary to a good cup of coffee. He sends it to the consumer a completely cooked product. In the roasting process, the berries swell up by the liberation of gases within their substance. The aromatic oils contained in the cells are sufficiently developed or cooked and made ready for instantaneous solution with boiling water when the cells are thoroughly opened by grinding. The roasting principles of different green coffees vary. Trained study and a nice science in timing the roast and manipulating the fire is necessary to a perfect development of aroma and flavor. The drinking quality is largely dependent upon the experienced knowledge of the coffee roaster and his scientific methods and modern machinery, by which the coffee is not only roasted, but cleaned, milled, and completely manufactured to a high point of perfection. In their National Association work, the wholesale roasters are giving the public new facts and valuable information from scientific researches, investigations, etc. Grinding The roasted berry is constructed of fibrous tissues formed into tiny cells visible only under the microscope, which are the packages wherein are stored the whole value of coffee. The aromatic oils. Like cutting open an orange, the grinding of coffee is the opening of surrounding tissue and pulp and the finer it is cut, the more easily are the juices released. The fibrous tissue itself is waste material, yielding, by boiling or too long percolations, a coffee-colored liquid which is fibrous and twangy in taste, has no aromatic character, and contains undesirable elements. The true strength and flavor of roasted coffee is ground out, not boiled out. The finer coffee is ground, the more thoroughly are the cells opened, the surfaces multiplied, and the aromatic oils made ready for separation from their husks. Hence it follows that coarse ground coffee is unopened coffee, coffee thrown away. The finer the grind, the better and greater the yield. With pulverized coffee, fine as cornmeal, the fully realized aromatic oils are instantaneously soluble with boiling water. In ground coffee, the oils are standing in open packages, escaping into the air and absorbing moisture, etc., necessitating quick use or confinement in airproof and moisture-proof protection. Brewing From scientific researches by the National Coffee and Roasters Association, including the first chemical analysis on record of brewed coffee produced by various brewing methods, the fundamental principles of coffee making have been clearly established. These principles are simple, and when once understood, 
equip any person to intelligently judge the merits and effects of the various coffee-making devices on the market. They constitute the law of coffee brewing and may be stated as follows. Correct brewing is not cooking. It is a process of extraction of the already cooked aromatic oils from the surrounding fibrous tissue, which has no drinkable value. Boiling or stewing cooks in the fiber, which should be wholly discarded as dregs, and damages the flavor and purity of the liquid. Boiling coffee and water together is ruin and waste. The aromatic oils, constituting the whole true flavor, are extracted instantly by boiling water when the cells are thoroughly opened by fine grinding. The undesirable elements, being less quickly soluble, are left in the grounds in a quick contact of water and coffee. The coarser the grind, the less accessible are the oils to the water, thus the inability to get out the strength from coffee not finely enough ground. Too long contact of water and coffee causes twang and bitterness, and the finer the grind, the less the contact should be. The infusion, when brewed, is injured by being boiled or overheated. It is also damaged by being chilled, which breaks the fusion of oils and water. It should be served immediately or kept hot as in a double boiler. Tests show that water under the boiling point, 212 degrees, is inefficient for coffee brewing and does not extract the aromatic oils. Used under this temperature, it is a sure cause of weak and insipid flavor. The effort to make up this deficiency by longer contact of coffee and water, or repeated pouring through, results in no extraction of the oils, but draws out undesirable elements, such as coffee tannin, which is soluble in water at any temperature, and is governed by the time of contact. Coffee tannin, which is not the commercial tannic acid, is eliminated to practically nothing in the quick brewing methods. The chemical analysis of brewed coffee shows the following. Percolator method. Fine granular, 5 minutes steeping. Coffee tannin per cup, 2.90 grains. Boiling method. Medium granular. Coffee tannin per cup, 2.35 grains. Steeping method. Medium granular. Coffee tannin per cup, 2.31 grains. Filtration or drip method pulverized. Coffee tannin per cup, 0.29 grains. Brewing is the final manufacturing process of coffee. All previous perfection is dependent upon it. Like food products which lose nutritive value by bad cooking, coffee loses its best values by wrong brewing. Brewed by the very simple, correct methods, it is an unfailingly clear, fragrant, taste-charming beverage, universally loved and scientifically approved. The committee made a further report in 1914, and some of the findings were subsequently published in an association booklet called The Coffee Book, used in connection with the second National Coffee Week campaign in 1915. In it were these. Grinding Definitions Powdered, like flour. Pulverized, like not coarser than fine corn meal. Very fine and fine, like from corn meal to fine granulated sugar. Medium, like coarse granulated sugar. Also, the committee emphasized its previous findings, particularly this one. Filter bags should be kept in cold water when not in use. Drying causes decomposition. Keeps sweet if kept wet. Use muslin for filter bag and pulverized granulation. The association brought out this same year, on recommendation of the committee, its home coffee mill, an ideal and standard coffee mill for home use. It was a wall mill equipped with a glass front metal hopper and employing a ratchet spring lock nut and double action grinders. The mill was later improved with an all-glass hopper and a tumbler bracket. More than 20,000 of these mills have been sold. At the suggestion of the author, the efficiency of nine different coffee-making devices, including boiling and drip pots, pumping percolators, cloth and paper filters, 
was investigated in the laboratories of the Mellon Institute of Industrial Research of the University of Pittsburgh in 1915, and Dr. Raymond F. Bacon submitted a report that showed that the boiling method produced the highest percentage of caffetanic acid and caffeine, the French drip process the lowest. The investigation disclosed also a more palatable brew at 195 degrees to 200 degrees Fahrenheit than at the boiling point. Another notable contribution to the science of coffee brewing was made by the Home Economics Laboratories of the University of Kansas in 1916. The experiments extended over one year. They showed that strength and color in coffee brews are independent of blend and price and are most fully obtained by pulverized granulation, which was found to be the most efficient, that the consumer pays for flavor and that filtration yielded the best brew. The French drip, or true percolator, did not figure in these experiments. At the 1915 convention of the National Coffee Roasters Association, Mr. Aborn reported that 4,000 copies of the committee's findings on grinding and brewing had been given away and the facts were further circulated in two million booklets issued during two years. He told of tests which showed that while there might be reasons of commercial expediency for packing ground coffee, it could not be defended as a quality principle. Also that plate grinders produced a more efficient drawing granulation than roller grinders, and that the idea that the steel cop process eliminates dirt was an absurdity as the finest ground coffee is not dirt, but coffee in its most efficient drawing condition. He added, I have paid no attention to chafe removal in these tests, as the uselessness of such removal has been repeatedly shown up. The reference here was to his 1914 and 1913 reports, in which it was stated that removing the chafe in the steel cut process does not remove any of the tannin. And for this purpose, the steel cut process is wholly futile and a wasteful and unnecessary tax upon cost, and that the removal of the chafe appreciably affects the flavor and depreciates the cup value. This report repeated previous findings against the pumping percolator as producing an inefficient brew and being a very faulty utensil. Mr. Aborn concluded his report by saying, The old time boiling method has fewer and fewer defenders and holds its own only as a superstition. I therefore pass it over as a discarded issue. It is but repetition of former reports for me to say that pulverized granulation is the most efficient granulation, that it assures the highest quality of brew and the lowest proportion of coffee to a given strength, that it is the most saving and most satisfying grinding for all to use, that it, the coffee, must be fresh ground, that the filtration method is the most correct in fundamental principles, and that used with a muslin bag, it assures the consumer coffee of the purest, finest flavored quality, highest health value, and sure economy. The campaign of education was continued during 1916, producing encouraging results among schools, colleges, the medical fraternity, newspapers, with the trade and the consumer. It marked the first big constructive work combining the practical and scientific phases of grinding and brewing methods. In his report at the 1916 Convention of the National Coffee Roasters Association, Mr. Aborn reviewed the four years' work and pointed out what had been accomplished. He told of a new booklet to be called The True Book on Coffee Grinding and Brewing and an educational exhibit box for schools about to be issued. Due to opposition, which developed from trade interests that were putting out steel cut and other grinds of coffee not favored by the committee, and also because many members thought the association should not exploit any particular method of grinding or brewing, it was decided to make no further publication of the coffee grinding and brewing conclusions of the committee until they had been confirmed by laboratory research. Boiling and filtration tests in the mountains of the Yellowstone Park by W. H. Aborn in 1916 showed that the limit of coffee brewing was reached at an altitude of 9,000 feet. At the 1916 meeting, Dr. Floyd W. Robeson of the Detroit Testing Laboratories read a notable paper entitled, What Do We Know About Coffee?, which hailed coffee as a food product, warned the roasters to be aware of half-facts, and to urge the importance of a research laboratory. 
It was published and given distribution by the association. The educational exhibit box showing samples of coffee from plantation to cup, including five different grinds, was issued in 1917 and sold for one dollar. The Better Coffee Making Committee also published in this year a booklet entitled Coffee Grinding and Brewing, in which it summarized its work to date and presented its special plea for cotton cloth filters as the ideal coffee making device. This booklet aroused considerable discussion, particularly between those who favored the paper filter and those who, with Mr. Aborn, believed cotton cloth, such as muslin, to be the most efficient strainer. Cotton, argued Mr. Aborn, is an ideal sanitary strainer because it contains no chemical or questionable manufacturing element. It was pointed out by Dr. Floyd W. Robeson that while cotton cloth, such as muslin, does give a fairly clear coffee, it is not so clear as by the methods where a filter paper is used. He said, Both methods have serious objectionable features. The muslin bag, particularly, is decidedly unsanitary, especially when used in restaurants and hotels. It is rarely kept clean, and one who has frequented restaurants and many hotel kitchens knows that it lends itself to very unclean and unsightly methods of handling. The food inspector has to check this up perhaps as often as any one feature about a restaurant. The objection to the filter paper is not at all on the ground of sanitation. It is ideal in this respect. The claim is made, and at least in part substantiated, that it does hold back valuable features of the brew. There are many points about the filter that have not been considered at all. Mr. Calkin believes that the very best type of filter is a bed of coffee itself, and I must say this has the sanction of good laboratory experience. I.D. Richheimer, attacking the cotton cloth filter, said, It is a known fact that the fats in coffee are very dense and represent 12 to 15 percent of the coffee weight. These fats, due to the simplest chemical action of contact with air, moisture, and continued heat, Begin a fermentation in the completed beverage. In the cloth filtering process, due to the rapid passage of water through grounds almost as quickly as poured, the largest percentage of fats is carried into the beverage. Fat, being lighter than water, rises to the top of water if given a certain amount of time during the brewing process. Were there no fats, which ferment, in coffee there would be no need for placing cloth filtering material under water, as suggested to keep them from becoming sour. In the booklet referred to, Mr. Aborn expressed himself as follows on the filtration method. The filtration method is not new, but well tried, thoroughly proven, and long used, though often incorrectly. It is the method followed, more or less correctly, by all of the first-class hotels in the world. It is controlled by no patent or proprietary device, and requires a most inexpensive equipment. For a perfect result, it but demands an accurate adherence to simple but vital principles. Deviations from these fundamentals, though apparently slight, cause failure. When they, and the necessary exact following of them, are clearly understood, any person, even a small child, can brew coffee with unvarying success. The first point to consider in filtration is the dimensions of the filter bag, or container of the ground coffee, in relation to the quantity of coffee used and the granulation of same. If the filter be a muslin bag, free on all sides, the filtering surface is considerable and permits the necessary quick passage of water through the grounds, provided the bag is of a wide enough diameter as to prevent too great a depth of grounds through which the water cannot quickly penetrate. The error of too narrow a filter is a common one. It causes a delayed filtration, which means undesirably long contact of water and coffee, and also the cooling of the liquid, which, in a correct, undelayed filtration, is smoking hot at completion. The bag should also not be too long or be allowed to hang or soak in the liquid. A filter bag set tightly into a pot against its sides, thus surrounded with impenetrable walls, is greatly reduced in filtering surface, and the filtration is thereby slackened. The filter material should not be too coarse in texture, like cheesecloth, or too heavy and impenetrable, like very heavy muslin. 
a moderate weight muslin, not too light, is efficient. The degree of granulation also, of course, affects the rate of flow. The coarser the grind, the faster the flow, which permits a larger quantity of coffee to a given diameter of filter bag. A most frequent fault in the use of the filtration method is the failure to understand the fine degree of grinding necessary to the best results. When the grind is not sufficiently fine, the extraction is, of course, weak. A fine grind, like fine cornmeal, is essential. It does not retard the flow if the filter is of right dimensions. A powdered grind, like flour, is so fine that it is apt to mat itself into a resisting floor. Many users of the filtration method pour the liquid through more than once. This gains some added color, but adds undesirable element, depreciates flavor, and is especially inadvisable when the grind is sufficiently fine. One pouring only is recommended for the best results. The chinaware, or glazed earthenware pot, sometimes called the French drip pot, with a chinaware or earthenware sieve container for the grounds at the top through which the water is poured, being free of all metal, is inviting in purity and in hygienic merit. Together with the filter bag, it is subject to the above remarks on dimensions. A chinaware sieve cannot be made as fine as a metal sieve, and cannot, of course, hold very fine granulation, as can cotton cloth. More coffee for a given strength is therefore required. The upper container should be wide enough for a given quantity of coffee, as to allow an unretarded flow, and the more openings the strainer contains, the better. In any drip, filtration, or percolating method, the stirring of the grounds causes an overcontact of water and coffee and results in an overdrawn liqueur of injured flavor. If the water does not pass through the grounds readily, the fault is as above indicated and cannot be corrected by stirring or agitation. Many complaints of bitter taste are traced to this error in the use of the filtration method. It is not necessary to pour on the water in driblets. The water may be poured slowly, but the grounds should be kept well covered. The weight of the water helps the flow downward through the grounds. Care should be taken to keep up the temperature of the water. Set the kettle back on the stove when not pouring. If the water is measured, use a small heated vessel, which fill and empty quickly without allowing the water to cool. In 1917, the Tea and Coffee Trade Journal made a comparative coffee brewing test with a regulation coffee pot for boiling, a pumping percolator, a double glass filtration device, a cloth filter device, and a paper filter device. The cup tests were made by E. M. Frankel, Ph.D., and William B. Harris, coffee expert, United States Department of Agriculture. The brews were judged for color, flavor, palatability, smoothness, body, richness, and aroma. The test showed that the paper filtration device produced the most superior brew. The cloth filter, glass filter, percolator, and boiling pot followed in the order named. At the 1917 convention of the National Coffee Roasters Association, John E. King of Detroit announced that laboratory research, which he had had conducted for him, showed that the finer the grind, the greater the loss of aroma, and so he had selected a grind containing 90% of very fine coffee and 10% of a coarser nature, which seemed to retain the aroma. He subsequently secured a United States patent for this grind. Mr. King announced also at this meeting that his investigations showed there was more than a strong likelihood that the much-discussed caffetanic acid did not exist in coffee, that it most probably was a mixture of chlorogenic and cafolic acids. The World War operated to interfere with the coffee roaster's plans for a research bureau. And in the meantime, the Brazil planters, in 1919, started their million-dollar advertising campaign in the United States cooperating with a joint committee representing the green and roasted coffee interests. In the following year, June 1920, this committee arranged with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to start scientific research work on coffee. The literature of the Roasters Better Coffee Making Committee 
being turned over to it, and the Institute began to test the results of the committee's work by purely analytical methods. The World War operated to interfere with the coffee roasters' plans for a research bureau. And in the meantime, the Brazil planters, in 1919, started their million-dollar advertising campaign in the United States, cooperating with a joint committee representing the green and roasted coffee interests. In the following year, June 1920, this committee arranged with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to start scientific research work on coffee. The literature of the Roasters Better Coffee Making Committee being turned over to it, and the Institute began to test the results of the committee's work by purely analytical methods. The first report on the research work at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology was made by Professor S. C. Prescott to the Joint Coffee Trade Publicity Committee in April 1921. The committee gave out a statement saying that Professor Prescott's report stated that caffeine, the most characteristic principle of coffee, is, in the moderate quantities consumed by the average coffee drinker, a safe stimulant without harmful after effects. There was no publication of experimental results, but the announced findings were, in the main, a confirmation of the results of previous workers, particularly of Hollingworth, with whose statement that caffeine, when taken with food in moderate amount, is not in the least deleterious. The report was quoted as being in entire agreement. At the annual convention of the National Coffee Roasters Association, November 2, 1921, Professor Prescott made a further report in which he stated that investigations on coffee brewing had disclosed that coffee made with water between 185 degrees and 200 degrees was to be preferred to coffee made with the water at actual boiling temperature, 212 degrees, that the chemical action was far less vigorous, and that the resulting infusion retained all the fine flavors and was freer from certain bitter or astringent flavors than that made at the higher temperature. Professor Prescott announced also that the best materials for coffee-making utensils were glass, including agate ware, vitrified ware, porcelain, etc., aluminum, nickel or silver plate, copper, and tin plate, in the order named. The Joint Coffee Trade Publicity Committee's booklet on coffee and coffee making, issued in 1921, was very guarded in its observations on grinding and brewing. It avoided all controversial points, but it did go so far as to say on the general subject of brewing, Chemists have analyzed the coffee bean and told us that the only part of it which should go into our coffee cups for drinking is an aromatic oil. This aromatic element is extracted most efficiently only by fresh boiling water. The practice of soaking the grounds in cold water, therefore, is to be condemned. It is a mistake also to let the water and the grounds boil together after the real coffee flavor is once extracted. This extraction takes place very quickly, especially when the coffee is ground fine. The coarser the granulation, the longer it is necessary to let the grounds remain in contact with boiling water. Remember that flavor, the only flavor worth having, is extracted by the short contact of boiling water and coffee grounds, and that after this flavor is extracted, the coffee grounds become valueless dregs. The report contained also the following helpful generalities on coffee service and the various methods of brewing in more or less common use in the United States in 1921. Although the above rules are absolutely fundamental to good coffee making, their importance is so little appreciated that in some households the lifeless grounds from the breakfast coffee are left in the pot and re-steeped for the next meal, with the addition of a small quantity of fresh coffee. Used coffee grounds are of no more value in coffee making than ashes are in kindling a fire. After the coffee is brewed, the true coffee flavor, now extracted from the bean, should be guarded carefully. When the brewed liquid is left on the fire or overheated, this flavor is cooked away and the whole character of the beverage is changed. It is just as fatal to let the brew grow cold. If possible, coffee should be served as soon as it is made. If service is delayed, it should be kept hot, but not overheated. For this purpose, careful cooks prefer a double boiler over a slow fire. 
The cups should be warm beforehand, and the same is true of a serving pot, if one is used. Brewed coffee, once injured by cooling, cannot be restored by reheating. Unsatisfactory results in coffee brewing frequently can be traced to a lack of care in keeping utensils clean. The fact that the coffee pot is used only for coffee making is no excuse for setting it away with a hasty rinse. Coffee making utensils should be cleansed after each using with scrupulous care. If a percolator is used, pay special attention to the small tube through which the hot water rises to spray over the grounds. This should be scrubbed with a wire handled brush that comes for the purpose. In cleansing drip or filter bags, use cool water. Hot water cooks in the coffee stains. After the bag is rinsed, keep it submerged in cool water until time to use it again. Never let it dry. This treatment protects the cloth from the germs in the air which cause souring. New filter bags should be washed before using to remove the starch or sizing. Drip or filter coffee. The principle behind this method is the quick contact of water at full boiling point with coffee ground as fine as it is practical to use. The filtering medium may be of cloth or paper or perforated chinaware or metal. The fineness of the grind should be regulated by the nature of the filtering medium, the grains being large enough not to slip through the perforations. The amount of ground coffee to use may vary from a heaping teaspoonful to a rounded tablespoonful for each cup of coffee desired depending upon the granulation, the kind of apparatus used, and individual taste. A general rule is the finer the grind, the smaller the amount of dry coffee required. The most satisfactory grind for a cloth drip bag has the consistency of powdered sugar and shows a slight grit when rubbed between thumb and finger. Unbleached muslin makes the best bag for this granulation. For dripping coffee, reduced to a powder as fine as flour or confectioner's sugar, use a bag of Canton flannel with the fuzzy side in. Powdered coffee, however, requires careful manipulation and cannot be recommended for everyday household use. Put the ground coffee in the bag or sieve, bring fresh water to a full boil, and pour it through the coffee at a steady, gradual rate of flow. If a cloth drip bag is used with a very finely ground coffee, one pouring should be enough. No special potter device is necessary. The liquid coffee may be dripped into any handy vessel or directly into the cups. Dripping into the coffee cups, however, is not to be recommended unless the dripper is moved from cup to cup so that no one cup will get more than its share of the first flow, which is the strongest and best. The brew is complete when it drips from the grounds, and further cooking or heating up injures the quality. Therefore, since it is not necessary to put the brew over the fire, it is possible to make use of the hygienic advantages of a glassware, porcelain, or earthenware serving pot. Boiled or Steeped Coffee For boiling or steeping, use a medium grind. The recipe is a rounded tablespoonful for each cup of coffee desired, or, as some cooks prefer to remember it, a tablespoonful for each cup and one for the pot. Put the dry coffee in the pot and pour over it fresh water, briskly boiling. Steep for five minutes or longer, according to taste, over a low fire. Settle with a dash of cold water or strain through muslin or cheesecloth and serve at once. Percolated coffee. Use a rounded tablespoonful of medium fine ground coffee to each cupful of water. The water may be poured into the percolator cold or at the boiling point. In the latter case, percolation begins at once. Let the water percolate over the grounds for 5 or 10 minutes, depending upon the intensity of the heat and the flavor desired. End of Section 71 Read by Dave Michaels, Escondido, California, April 22, 2022